Lord of the Mysteries 2, Audiobook, Part 8 Chapter 176, Property After bidding farewell to Franca, Lumian led Louis and Sarkota back to the café and settled himself into Baron Brignese's usual spot. Already awaiting him was René, the manager of Sal de Ball Breeze. In his forties, René had a gaunt face, leaving one to wonder if he was overworked or simply born that way. His light yellow hairline was receding in a manner similar to the people from Lowen. Despite being an executive directly appointed by Gardner Martin, the boss of the Savoy mob, René treated Lumian with utmost respect and wore an ingratiating smile. Monsieur Seal, would you care to learn more about the dance hall? Very well. Lumian reached out to take the stack of reports from René and perused them with unwavering focus. Standing behind him, Louis and Sarkota couldn't help but feel like they hardly knew their leader at all once more. Lumian, a young man hailing from the countryside, possessed an understanding of complex financial statements that was far beyond their comprehension. They would have been left feeling dizzy and yearning for sleep had they been tasked with such a feat can this man both fight and possess a cultured mind? Lewis diverted his gaze from the reports, which seemed to possess some kind of supernatural effect. René seized the opportunity to acquaint Lumian with the workings of Sal de Ball Breeze. On weekdays, we earn a daily income ranging from 1,200 to 1,800 Verldor. On weekends, that figure can reach as high as 5,000 Verldor. Typically, it hovers around 4,000. Last year, our total income amounted to 645,425 Verldor and 37 Kopit. This year, there has been a slight increase based on current trends, but nothing significant. We require 12 bouncers, 4 bartenders, 6 waiters, 3 chefs, 6 kitchen helpers, 3 handymen, 3 dishwashers, 4 cleaners, 1 waiter supervisor, 3 finance staff, 3 alcohol and food procurers, and a carriage driver. Their average annual salary is 1,000 Verldor. We also provide them with complimentary lunch and dinner, which costs us a total of 53,000 Verldor. As the manager, my annual salary, along with the year-end dividend, amounts to about 7,000 Verldor. As per our agreement with Red Boots, each dancer receives a base salary of 1 Verldor per day. When they strike a deal with a guest, we take 30%. Transactions usually occur in the rooms on the upper two floors of the dance hall. If they wish to leave, they must settle the fee with the bouncer or the waiter supervisor at the door in advance. Wine, champagne, beer, brandy, sugar alcohol, absinthe, and various flavors of soda, along with ice and other ingredients, cost us approximately 120,000 Verldor per year. We've already purchased this establishment, so there's no additional rent to be paid. When coupled with expenses for horse care, venue maintenance, gas, tap water, singers, and the band, our annual costs sum up to around 230,000 Verldor. Out of the remaining 310,000 Verldor, the boss will claim 100,000 Verldor. We'll also need 100,000 Verldor to establish a favorable relationship with the officers at the police headquarters. Monsieur Seal, you're left with approximately 110,000 Verldor. This needs to cover your personal expenses, firearm and ammunition supplies, rewards for your subordinates, as well as compensation for the victims and the injured. Sadly, the income of the people in the market district isn't particularly high, otherwise, we could generate more revenue from alcohol and beverages. Inwardly, he couldn't help but let out a sigh. A mob leader with a profitable enterprise certainly rakes in substantial wealth. According to newspapers, magazines, and the information collected by his sister Aurora, the annual salary of a minister in Intis amounted to a mere 100,000 Verldor. Although the government provided free housing, basic household items, silverware, and two private carriages, expenses for personal servants and banquets fell on their own pockets. Of course, Lumian had to reward his subordinates on occasion and allocate funds for compensations and ammunition in case of conflicts. However, there was no need for extravagant living, hiring servants, or hosting lavish banquets. All in all, he earned a sum similar to that of a minister. 
the only difference was that ministers didn't rely solely on their public salaries for income. On the other hand, laborers received an annual salary of around 700 vril d'or, while maids earned approximately 480 vril d'or. Construction workers fare only slightly better, with an annual salary of 1,000 vril d'or. Skilled workers brought in a meager 2,500 vril d'or per year, while senior engineers ranged between 10,000 and 20,000 vril d'or annually. Indeed, the shortcut to wealth is written within the laws themselves. No wonder Brignais couldn't bear to let go of this dance hall. Lumian recollected a comment his sister had made. By saving money and taking care of his subordinates, preventing them from recklessly rushing into battles, he had enough left over each year to purchase a sequence six potion formula and even the corresponding primary ingredients. Once Rene finished speaking, Lumian nodded and posed a question, why provide the dancers with a base salary? It wasn't that he was reluctant to part with the funds, but rather out of curiosity. The dancers under our Savoy mob are under the control of Red Boots. She insists on a base salary, allowing the dancers to opt out of additional jobs. If they wish to earn less, they earn less. If they choose to starve, they starve, Renee explained. Apart from Red Boots' as dancers, there are also women who are controlled by figures from the usury business. In the past, Baron Brignais had authority over them all, so there wasn't any conflict. How should we coordinate matters now? Thoughts raced through Lomian's mind, leading him to notice the resemblances between Franca and his sister Aurora. Could it be because they are part of the same secret organization? However, if it were Aurora, she would have approached it differently. She would have organized protests among the dancers, established an underground school to educate them, and sought alternative paths. If it were me, what would I do? After pondering for a moment, Lumian raised his gaze and addressed Rene, Louis, and the others. For now, let us maintain the current state of affairs. Rene, assist me in dealing with the police officers during this period. Once I acquaint myself better with our surroundings, I shall engage in fruitful discussions with them. After altering the passwords of the two mechanical safes and informing manager René of one as per the established protocol, Lumian made his way back to Aubert's Du Coq door before lunchtime. He proceeded directly to the fifth floor and rapped on Charlie's door. Charlie, who was enjoying a light beer with a nibble of baguette, caught sight of Seal as soon as he opened the door. He exclaimed happily, where have you been these past couple of days? You didn't even show up at the bar for a drink. Lumian inquired, there's a job opportunity. Would you be interested? What kind of job? Charlie worriedly contemplated his diminishing savings and the bleak prospects of finding new employment. With a smile, Lumian responded, how about working as a waiter at Sal de Ball Breeze? You don't have to join the Savoy mob. You'll earn 70 vril d'or per month. You can keep the tips but be aware that folks in the market district aren't inclined to tip unless you become a woman and are willing to engage with them intimately. Yes, there are also female patrons who seek out waiters for such purposes. You're experienced in that domain, so there's no need for further elaboration. Sal de Ball Breeze? Charlie's eyes widened. Have you already gained Baron Brignese's trust? To be able to arrange for someone to work as a waiter at Sal de Ball Breeze without joining the Savoy mob. Lumian simply maintained his smile. I don't need Baron Brignese's approval. Sal de Ball Breeze is now under me. Ha! Huh. Charlie questioned his own hearing. Lumian clarified, still smiling, after I eliminated Hammer 8, the Savoy mob's leader handed over Sal de Ball Breeze to me. Is that so? Charlie had an epiphany before blurting out in astonishment, you took down Hammer 8 as well? Lumian nodded. Don't disclose this to anyone. I fear the police might come knocking. Dot. Charlie was at a loss for words. After a few seconds, he mumbled, perhaps those poison spur mob fellows should pay a visit to the nearby cathedral and pray, see if their luck can change. Ever since you arrived in the market district, their leaders have been dropping like flies. I can't fathom how they must be feeling now. Great idea, Lumian commended. 
If the leaders of the poison spur mob had the audacity to pray in the eternal blazing sun or the cathedral of the god of steam and machinery, the mob would cease to exist. Of course, Lumian didn't want them to act so foolishly before Louis Lund visited again. Charlie pondered for a moment and responded, All right, I'll head over to Sal de Ball Breeze in the afternoon. Who should I ask for? Ha, ah, I rarely get to visit the dance hall because I'm always short on cash. Now I can go there every day. Just find manager René and let him know you're a tenant at Aubert's Du Cope door, Lumian replied simply, his gaze shifting to the side. There were two cleaning ladies nearby. One of them appeared to be in her early fifties, but upon closer inspection, one would think she was only in her forties. She had originally possessed flaxen-colored hair, but she now wore a vibrant blonde wig and had applied eyeshadow and makeup. This concealed her fine wrinkles to some extent, but couldn't entirely hide her weariness. Who are they? Lumian inquired of Charlie. Charlie clicked his tongue and explained, Don't you know? Our penny-pinching landlord has changed his ways. He no longer hires someone to clean just once a week. Now he's opted to have two cleaning ladies work every morning. Tell me, tell me, isn't this a miraculous turn of events? It's only slightly less fortunate than my own stroke of luck back then. Lumian, having just finished perusing Sal de Balbreeze's financial statements, immediately considered the salary of a cleaning lady. Around 70 to 80 verl d'or per month. However, that was for full time work. This kind of half day job would cost at most 45 verl d'or. Two cleaning ladies working half a day wouldn't exceed 100 verl d'or per month. Hiring someone for regular cleaning once a week costs 18 verl d'or each time. And Monsieur I've promised to increase it to twice a week. In other words, it'll cost 150 verl d'or per month. How is this generous? It's simply meticulous budgeting. Lumian scoffed. He suspected that if it weren't for the fact that a cleaning lady couldn't finish the entire motel in half a day, no one would take on such a job. Monsieur Ive definitely wouldn't hire two. Is that so? Charlie scratched his head. His computational abilities couldn't keep up with Lumian's rapid deductions. As the two cleaning ladies entered a vacant room to rid it of bedbugs, Lumian subtly gestured in their direction with his chin. Why is one of them wearing a wig and eyeshadow? What kind of cleaning lady does that? Charlie lowered his voice and said, I asked about that. Her name is Elodie. She claims to have been a theater actress and says she's used to dollying herself up like that. And she continues to do so to this day. No one knows if she's telling the truth. When I worked as an attendant at Hotel du Signe Blanc, I heard from the kitchen staff that when aging prostitutes are scorned, their only option is to take on tasks like dishwashing and cleaning. Lumian recollected Elodie's appearance and surmised that she must have been quite a beauty in her youth. Whether she had been a theater actress or a woman of the streets had no bearing on her current role as a cleaning lady. After bidding farewell to Charlie, Lumian made his way to the restaurant on the first floor for a quick meal before taking a public carriage to Avenue du Boulevard. He intended to inform Mr. K that the mission had been successfully accomplished. Chapter 177 Proselytizing Before stepping onto the public carriage, Lumian made a special effort to spend six licks on purchasing a copy of the Psychic magazine disguising himself as someone attending a gathering of mysticism enthusiasts at 19 Rue Shear. He worried that Gardner Martin, the boss of the Savoy mob, might secretly tail him to ascertain if something was amiss. While he could employ some anti-tracking methods to try and shake off potential pursuers, wouldn't that raise more suspicion? In comparison, it would be more convincing to pose as a naive country bumpkin who had recently arrived in Trier and stumbled upon the Beyonder path. Such an individual would naturally crave knowledge about mysticism, leading to the purchase of psychic and other magazines. Occasionally attending various gatherings of mysticism enthusiasts would solidify the facade. In truth, this tale held some merit. The only hitch was that Mr. K, the organizer of the mysticism enthusiast gathering, had a secret organization backing him. If Gardner Martin's men had indeed delved into their investigation, 
Lu Mian would let them confront Mr. K and witness the clash of strengths. As the prankster king of Kordu, Lu Mian always relished witnessing a spectacle unfold. When the time arrived, he would adjust his choices based on the outcome of the battle. In any case, his overall direction would remain unchanged. He would follow the instructions of Madame Magician and infiltrate the secret organization behind Mr. K. Inside the carriage, Lumian flipped through Psychic. The current issue focused on the theme of secret deeds. Contrary to Lumian's initial instinctive interpretation, the term deed in the context of secret deeds did not refer to an actual deed but rather denoted compatibility. It represented a method of merging one's mind with a specific hidden entity, enabling the acquisition of corresponding mental experiences and a certain amount of mystical knowledge. Psychic's editorials stressed that this act was exceedingly perilous. Unless one could verify the trustworthiness and absence of malice in the subject of the secret deed, attempting it was strongly discouraged. It would lead to dire and severe consequences, including but not limited to mental illness, possession by evil spirits, loss of rationality, sudden death, and alterations in personality. Ah, now it makes sense. Lumian immediately grasped some of the contents of Aurora's grimoire. Initially, he had struggled to comprehend those passages, viewing them through the lens of a contract. However, with a change in perspective, he now roughly understood their meaning. Lumian lowered his gaze to the psychic magazine in his hand and silently commended it, saying, It's more useful than I anticipated. I had thought it was all concocted to deceive enthusiasts of mysticism. Yes, although there are numerous errors in common sense that suggest it wasn't written by someone who truly ventured into the beyonder world and conducted extensive research, their explanations of certain concepts are rather advanced. They come close to the correct answer, and some even enlighten me. Amidst his praise, he muttered, considering that Mr. K resides beneath the headquarters of Psychic, could there truly be beyonders among the editorial staff and contributing authors of these mysticism magazines? Did they intentionally write an accurate article first and then deliberately alter many concepts and common knowledge to something incorrect? As these thoughts raced through his mind, Lumian inwardly hissed. From this vantage point, the editors of this issue aren't instructing the correct secret deed ritual. Instead, they are cautioning those who attempt secret deeds without discretion. No, it's not merely without discretion. It's more plausible that it was purposefully guided by someone with malicious intentions. At that moment, Lumian revisited Psychic, no longer focusing on the specific words. He even sensed that it was brimming with warnings written in blood-red ink, cease. Refrain from engaging in any further secret deed rituals. The mysterious world is truly fraught with peril. Lumian closed his eyes and sighed deeply, touched by emotions. The longer he immersed himself in the field of mysticism, the more he comprehended his sister's helplessness and struggle. He closed Psychic, a magazine two licks cheaper than the average, and directed his gaze out of the carriage window. Upon reaching Rue Sheeran Avenue du Boulevard, Lumian executed his customary anti-tracking measures, showcasing his hunter instincts. He then entered Psychic's headquarters and knocked on the door of room 103 using the distinctive pattern of three long, two short, and one long knock. As before, he was led to the basement and encountered Mr. K. Mr. K still wore a voluminous black robe with an oversized hood, rendering his face concealed within shadows. Seated in the crimson back chair, he gazed at Lumian for a few seconds before speaking in a low, raspy voice, What brings you here this time? Mr. K, I have fulfilled the mission you assigned me and have become a leader in the Savoy mob of the Market District. I now oversee Sal de Ball Breeze and Aubert's Du Coke Door, Lumian said with a smile. Mr. K offered a slight nod. Excellent. I like your way of doing things. What you must do next is earn Gardner Martin's trust and secure his genuine recognition. This time, Mr. K omitted the words reward or mission. Instead, he issued a direct command, treating Lumian as if he were already his subordinate. Earning the boss's trust? Lumian was momentarily taken aback, followed by intense bewilderment and unease. He recalled vividly that when Mr. K assigned the mission, he hadn't specified joining the Savoy mob. He had used the word any. 
Yet now, the subsequent task was to be truly acknowledged by the boss of the Savoy mob. If I hadn't chosen Baron Brignais and chosen other mob, what kind of mission would Mr. K have assigned me today? Or was he utterly convinced that I would join the Savoy mob? What makes him so certain? Thoughts swirled in Lumian's mind, reminding him of recent events Baron Brignais dispatched me to handle a leader from the Poison Spur mob after I eliminated the pervert and obtained the canister of sedatives, putting it to good use. Isn't this too much of a coincidence? There are other similar occurrences. Every so often, I sense someone's gaze upon me from the shadows nearby, yet I perceive nothing. Could all of this have been orchestrated by Mr. K? If I had not chosen the Savoy mob, would I have been arranged to join the Savoy mob following a series of incidents? The more Lumian pondered, the more a sense of dread overcame him. When Lumian looked at Mr. K again, the notion of treating him as a cash cow vanished from his mind. Perhaps, apart from Madame Magician and a few others, this might be the most powerful beyonder he had ever encountered. Unknowingly, it compelled him to comply with the other party's desires. As these thoughts raced through his mind, Lumian lowered his head and said, Yes, Mr. K. He assumed the demeanor of a subordinate. Meanwhile, he couldn't help but think of Red Boots Franca. This member of the secret organization, the Curly Haired Baboons Research Society, possessed both a background and strength, yet she aspired to become the mistress of a mob boss. Clearly, she harbored ulterior motives. Is her objective also to get close to Gardner Martin? Is she involved in something significant or a crucial secret? Lumian attempted to make an educated guess. Mr. K nodded in satisfaction. I'm pleased to see you know your place. Don't worry, I won't be stingy with the rewards. Have you not prayed in any cathedral recently? He changed the subject. I'm a wanted criminal. Lumian recalled Madame Magician's warning and retorted angrily, Besides, those deities won't save us at all. Mr. K chuckled. It's not that they won't, but they can't. Their power cannot envelop all believers and assist everyone during times of calamity. There are numerous reasons, but to put it succinctly, there is only one, weakness is an inherent sin. Are you curious about the Lord I believe in? He embodies the truth of this world. He is supreme. His divine grace flows abundantly like the sea. He created everything and shall annihilate everything. He is power incarnate, as are we. Observing Lumian's silence, Mr. K didn't press further. You need not answer me now. Ponder carefully during this period. Reflect on who can save us and offer protection in this increasingly perilous and deranged world. Once you have affirmed your faith in him, you will genuinely become one of us. It won't be long before your strength significantly improves. I shall consider it deeply, Lumian replied in a hushed tone. Mr. K then inquired, is there anything else? Having adjusted his mindset, Lumian asked, with the intention of not missing out on anything by asking, in the course of fulfilling the mission, if I encounter danger, may I employ your finger? How should I utilize it? Mr. K nodded and responded, just take it out. In other words, it could be employed. If I use it, how should I deal with the threat from Susanna Mattis in the future? Lumian probed further. Mr. K fell silent for a few seconds. After you employ that finger, return to me here. I shall provide you with another one. Indeed, your fingers are consumables. Lumian pondered for a moment and said, I sold Hammer 8's Beyonder characteristic to Gardner Martin for 18,000 Verldor. I wish to purchase a sealed artifact that can enhance my mystical abilities or aid me in better disguising myself. Do you have any such items here, Mr. K? Mr. K didn't offer an immediate response, as if he were contemplating a suitable candidate. After a while, he said to Lumian, come here and make your selection on Saturday night. Lumian beamed. Thank you, Mr. K. It felt reassuring to have the support of an organization, even if he was only an unofficial member. After arriving at Le Marquet du Cartier du Gentleman, Lumian carefully stowed Mr. K's finger in room 207 of Aubert's du Coq door. His next destination was Salle de Balbrise, where he intended to locate an unoccupied room. 
there, he would summon the messenger of Madame Magician to relay the progress of his mission. Lumian hoped to receive valuable feedback from her, particularly regarding how Mr. K had permitted these events to unfold with an uncanny degree of coincidence. Chapter 178 The Messenger's Response Evening, Avenue du Marquet, Sal de Ball Breeze. Lumian made his way to the entrance. Just as he reached the door, he was greeted by two mobsters standing guard. Good evening, boss. Lumian, still donned in a crisp white shirt, a black vest, and rolled up cuffs, acknowledged them with a smile and a nod. Louis and Sarkota had been eagerly awaiting the return of their new leader. Spotting Lumian entering the dance hall, they swiftly abandoned their positions at the bar counter and forced smiles on their faces. Boss, why don't you let us accompany you? It's not safe to be unprotected like this. Lewis expressed his loyalty with concern. Lumian chuckled in amusement and replied, You too? Protecting me? I worry that if anything were to happen, you both would end up beaten to a pulp. I'd have to compensate your loved ones. Lewis smiled sheepishly. I know you're formidable, boss, and you can handle Hammer 8 and Wolf Margot on your own. But isn't there a saying that goes, two fists can't fight four hands? Besides, we all carry guns, and our aim isn't too shabby. Two fists can't fight four hands? Lumian thought to himself. Wasn't that something Emperor Roselle once said? When did it become a saying? Aurora had always suspected that many vulgarities originated from Emperor Roselle, but nobody had ever confirmed it. Lumian glanced at Louis, who appeared tough but had a submissive demeanor, and Sarkota, with his curly brown hair and full lips. He nodded slightly and responded, When I instruct you to follow, you may do so. When I don't, keep an eye on the dance hall. If anyone dares to cause trouble, shoot them. Right, where can I find a shooting range? There's one in the basement of the dance hall, Lewis pointed downwards, indicating his feet. The other leaders also come there to practice their shooting skills, but they have to bring their own ammunition. Excellent. Lumian nodded in satisfaction. He urgently needed to improve his marksmanship, as he lacked effective long-range attacks. Lewis asked again, Boss, the environment at Aubert's du Coke door is dreadful. Are you planning to relocate to the dance hall? There are several rooms on the second floor for you to choose from. Or do you intend to stay in the temporary rest area previously used by Baron Brignais? Lewis displayed his willingness, recognizing that both he and Sarkota had once been trusted aides of Baron Brignais. If they failed to earn the trust of the new leader, they might be relegated to mere bouncers at the entrance. Their status would plummet, and they would be at the mercy of the members of the Savoy mob, with whom they had never gotten along. Not only would their income suffer, but they would also face significant bullying. Lumian pondered for a moment before responding, Show me the rooms. This location was ideal for the ritual to summon Madame Magician's messenger. Lumian had no plans to check out of Aubert's Duke Coke door anytime soon. His strategy involved selecting a room on the second floor of Salle de Ball Breeze and room 207 of Aubert's Duke Coke door as his nightly resting places after dismissing Louis and Sarkota. This increased his chances of being attacked under the cover of darkness. Occasionally, he would also consider his rented safe house on Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Lumian sensed that the poison spur mob wouldn't let him off easily. He had eliminated three leaders consecutively and had deliberately provoked them. Once the authorities let their guard down a little, the likelihood of retaliation would be high. Lumian was confident that the other side had been provoked, as his potion had been further digested. In another month or two, he might even consider advancing to Pyromaniac. Lumian didn't worry too much about being secretly attacked by Black Scorpion Roger and the other leaders of the Poison Spur mob. With Mr. K's finger, he stood a good chance of defending himself, even against Susanna Mattis, who was equivalent to a Sequence 5 Beyonder, let alone Black Scorpion Roger and the others who had not yet become sours. Upon reaching the second floor, Lumian made his way through the cafe and entered the corridor. After scanning the area, he pointed to a room closer to his office and declared, I'll take this one. 
The room boasted classical furniture, a four-piece set of dark red velvet, and a cushion recliner. Boss, should we replace these fabric items with new ones? Lewis ingratiatingly inquired. Sarkota, ever quiet in comparison, stood by his side. No need, Lumian replied, finding an excuse. He then assigned his two bodyguards to watch over the door leading from the cafe to the second-floor corridor. Locking the door, he settled himself at a wide wooden table near the window to write a letter to Madame Magician. In the letter, he emphasized that he had completed Mr. K's mission and earned his trust, even undergoing proselytization. He mentioned the opportunity to join the secret organization supporting Mr. K and inquired about the necessity of praying to Mr. K's lord, as well as the potential consequences of being monitored by that entity. Finally, he highlighted his recent actions and expressed his unease over certain coincidences. Once he neatly folded the letter, Lumian arranged the altar and conjured a wall of spirituality. With the summoning ritual completed, he fixed his gaze upon the blue flame of the candle and waited in the chilling and eerie environment. Before long, a doll-like figure, the size of an arm, materialized above the fire. Clad in a delicate golden dress, the figure surveyed the area with unfocused, light blue eyes. Raising its right hand, it delicately pinched its petite, pale white nose. It stinks. It stinks. This place isn't as clean as the last one. Isn't this place supposed to be clean? Lumian exclaimed, scanning his surroundings in surprise. There are no bed bugs, and it's just been cleaned. The messenger continued to wrinkle its nose, its voice ethereal and illusory as it spoke. There are old bones buried beneath the ground. They're foul, putrid, and repulsive. With those words, the blonde doll snatched the letter and vanished instantly. Clearly, it had no intention of staying a moment longer. Old bones underground? Lumian repeated the messenger's words, perplexed. He remembered that Sal de Ball Breeze had been erected upon a cemetery belonging to a cathedral and the bodies and ashes had been relocated to the catacombs. Even after the Savoy mob had acquired the building, there remained an eerie atmosphere. Concerned that some bones might have been left behind deep beneath the ground, they had commissioned a spherical statue crafted from white skulls and placed it at the entrance, accompanied by an engraved inscription. The messenger's reaction hinted that there truly were ancient remains interred underground. When the cathedral had moved the remains and ashes from the original cemetery to the catacombs, they likely hadn't intentionally left anything behind, unless they had failed to discover it or were unaware. Could it be that there is a hidden tomb beneath the original cemetery, dating back to the fourth epoch? Is that why the messenger reacted so strongly? Well, for now, let's set aside the matter of the old bones underground. After all, nothing untoward has occurred at Sal de Ball Breeze throughout these years. It's highly unlikely that anything would go awry the moment I set foot here, right? Lumian mused, concluding the ritual and tidying up the altar. He settled into the cushion recliner, gently rocking back and forth, awaiting Madame Magician's response. Time passed, and the sky darkened completely. Lumian contemplated whether he should have Lewis and the others bring dinner to his room or indulge in it at the cafe or the bar counter. Suddenly, a stack of papers fell from above, landing on his lap. This time, the doll messenger didn't even reveal itself, clearly displaying its profound aversion to the overall environment of Sal de Ball Breeze. In the future, I'll summon it at Aubert's Du Coke door or that safe house. Lumian unfolded the letter and read it attentively. Excellent job. It seems you have gained Mr. K's admiration and initial approval. From now on, simply follow his instructions. When the need arises, I will inform you of the true objective in advance. You can pretend to believe in the entity mentioned by Mr. K. After all, you already bear traces of two entities. Adding another one won't be an issue. I'm just concerned it might get a bit crowded. Ha <laughs> ha. The previous statement was a jest. The real solution is as follows, you can feign belief, but whenever you meet Mr. K and engage in prayer, beseech my lord for the protection of an angel. You should have learned the corresponding ritualistic magic, correct? If not, consult your sister's grimoires. 
usually, refrain from invoking the honorific name of that individual, even if the order has been disrupted. Unless you are certain you have received the angel's protection. I understand that the more one tries to suppress certain memories, the more they tend to resurface. During your next therapy session, you can attempt seeking assistance from your psychiatrist. In other words, you must postpone the matter of becoming a false believer until after the upcoming treatment. As for coincidences, they often have multiple factors intertwined in various things. Firstly, the corruption sealed within your body stems from an entity known as inevitability. Clearly, inevitability is linked to fate. It will subtly disrupt your destiny, leading you to encounter specific individuals and events that you are destined to come across. Secondly, it is highly likely that Mr. K has made arrangements to station someone in the shadows, observing you when providing the mob leaders with subtle psychological cues. This leads me to suspect that he is either a Sequence 6 hypnotist or a Sequence 5 dreamwalker from the spectator path. However, based on your earlier description, he also possesses the powers of a notary. Therefore, there is a strong possibility that he is a shepherd. Shepherds are Sequence 5 Beyonders from the Secret Suppliant Path, and they serve the entity in whom Mr. K believes. Shepherds can graze upon the souls and characteristics of other Beyonders, enabling them to wield their abilities. This renders every Shepherd incredibly formidable, standing at the pinnacle of mid-sequence Beyonders. Thirdly, this stems from the Law of Convergence and my previous hypothesis of repulsion. Trust me. I won't be surprised that you will encounter more believers of evil gods, hunters, and demonesses in a short span of time. Stay diligent, Seven of Wands. Shepherd? That sounds incredibly powerful. I have already encountered another hunter and two demonesses. Lumian ignited Madame Magician's response by channeling his spirituality. Chapter 179 Feast as Lumian gazed at the smoldering remnants of the paper, memories of Mr. K's relentless pressure flooded his mind. So a shepherd's essence lies in grazing. They graze upon the souls and characteristics of other beyonders or beyonder creatures to harness their abilities. Thus, a seasoned shepherd is truly unparalleled. They excel in close combat, long-range attacks, and a multitude of mystical techniques. In fact, a contractee is somewhat like a simplified version of a shepherd. Each contract is limited to a single ability. When one sequence is low, the number of contracts is severely restricted. At most, it might reach five, but often it doesn't exceed three. If one fails to choose their abilities wisely, they may struggle to defeat an ordinary person armed with a gun. It's not comparable to a shepherd's power, where grazing bestows all abilities, undiminished. Of course, at the level of the Padre, signing 10 or 20 contracts becomes a different experience. Furthermore, contracts often target beings from the spirit world with a wide array of peculiar abilities. Beyonders encountering them for the first time will find it challenging to adapt. The more Lumian pondered, the more dread Mr. K instilled in him. Suppressing his thoughts, Lumian stood up and let out an inward sigh. No wonder Madame Magician believes Mr. K can withstand Susanna Mattis, an evil spirit. Leaving the room, Lumian approached Louis and Sarkota with composure and uttered, Have the kitchen prepare dinner. Boss, what would you like to eat? Louis inquired before Sarkota could speak. Lumian couldn't recall the menu at Sal de Ball Breeze's attached cafe. He pondered for a moment and replied, Bring me a set meal. Join me. All right. Louis signaled Sarkota to inform the cafe attendant. Lumian settled at Baron Brignese's favor table and picked up the day's newspaper. The Trier Gazette adorned the top, followed by the Reformer Daily, People's Voice, Action News, Intus Daily, Friends of the People, and other prominent newspapers. Lumian couldn't resist turning his head, a hint of amusement in his voice as he asked Louis, Is that what Brignese typically reads? A mobster concerned about national affairs? Lewis glanced at Sarkota on the other side and replied with a smile, he doesn't read such things. He only insists that we avoid offending reporters and newspapers. If possible, we should subscribe to influential newspapers. 
Occasionally, he'll spend money to place advertisements for Sal de Ball Breeze, boasting of the presence of captivating dancers here. He usually reads the three newspapers and magazines at the bottom, avoiding conflicts with newspapers and reporters. That makes sense. If the Trier Gazette publishes news of a significant mob presence in the market district, the Savoy mob would be doomed the next day. Those old men still value their reputation. Lumian gained a bit more understanding. He then retrieved the newspapers and magazines from the bottom. Isn't this more interesting than the Reformer Daily in Action News? Lumian picked up Novel Weekly and delved into the latest serialized story. Casually, he inquired, where do the funds and advertising fees for these newspapers come from? Lewis pondered for a moment, beads of cold sweat forming on his forehead, but he couldn't provide an answer. Just then, Sarkota chimed in, it's deducted from the 100,000 verl door we set aside for cultivating ties with the police. Lumian nodded approvingly, satisfied that it wouldn't hinder his gains as the new leader of the Savoy mob. Before long, the cafe attendant arrived with their food. Onion minced pigeon, smoked rock crab, hot bamboo chicken pie, stewed mutton brain, stewed veal slices, grilled oysters with vanilla, two salads, scarlet cheese, grilled almond sauce, a glass of red, white, and blue liqueur, and a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon. The fragrant aromas mingled together, wafting into Lumian's nostrils and causing his mouth to water even more. Just as expected from Trier. Even an ordinary cafe set meal offers such a variety of dishes. If this were Lowen, I'd be limited to choosing between pan-fried steak or stewed peas with tender mutton. Lumian, being a pure intision, mockingly compared Lowen's cuisine based on his impressions from various newspapers, magazines, and folk jokes. He lifted the glass of tricolor liqueur and took a sip, then pointed to the armchairs on either side of the table, saying, let's eat together. Lewis bowed slightly and replied with a smile, Boss, we'll take turns eating after you finish. Lumian didn't insist and savored his first feast since arriving in Trier, and it was on the house. It had to be said that the chefs at Sal de Ball Breeze were truly skilled. Lumian nodded repeatedly as he enjoyed his meal. Among the dishes, he found the mutton brain most delightful. Skillfully infused with several spices, the fishy and gamey flavors of the brain were cleverly balanced, leaving behind a delicate texture akin to roselle tofu, accompanied by a rich and enticing fragrance. He finished the glass of red, white, and blue liqueur and one-third of the bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon. Then, he gestured for Louis and Sarkota to take their turns. Lumian picked up Novel Weekly and Ghostface magazines, ready to delve into their contents. In the pages of Ghost Face, Lumian's eyes fell upon a familiar name, Duvar. The proprietor of the restaurant renowned for inventing Duvar's broth had amassed a fortune and relocated to Cartier de la Maison d'Opera. An intriguing anecdote caught Lumian's attention within the Ghost Face pages, Duvar's infatuation with Pearl, a stage actress from Lowen and a trier courtesan, had cost him a fortune. The tale recounted a banquet held at Pearl's private residence, where she lay naked on an enormous silver platter, served by attendants, in the presence of over a dozen guests. This shattered Duvar's heart. He had even attempted suicide to no avail. Lumian couldn't decide whether to sigh at the Triarian's tendency to exaggerate or to jest at the Loanese for not being as conservative as they seemed. It appeared that the latter adapted swiftly in Intis, or perhaps he should mock Duvar for his unblemished innocence despite being a Triarian in his forties. At times, Lumian couldn't help but wonder if these behaviors stemmed from the influence of a beyonder's nature or if the followers of the malevolent god couldn't rein in their impulses. Naturally, had it not been for the shared inclinations among the Triarians and the fact that many things posed no issues, these individuals would have been exposed long ago. After Lewis and Sarkota had finished their meal, Lumian led them down to the first floor. The dance hall buzzed with activity in the evening. Jenna stood upon the wooden stage, her voice carrying a melodious tune accompanied by the band. Couples below embraced one another, twirling around the floor. Lumian cast a fleeting glance at the scene before redirecting his gaze and striding toward the exit. Boss, where are we headed? Lewis inquired. Lumian chuckled. 
Am I the boss or are you? Do I need to report my whereabouts to you? Lewis's expression froze. He glanced at the silent Sarkota and suddenly felt that emulating his composure wasn't a bad idea. I, I'm merely concerned about our next course of action, he asserted. As Lumian made his way out of the dance hall, amidst greetings from the bouncers, he smiled and replied, I will inform you when there is a need for you to know. He returned to Aubert's du coke door but veered away from room 207, where he had intended to retrieve Mr. K's finger and his revolver. Instead, he ventured into the underground bar. Before Lumian could assess the situation, Charlie's voice reached his ears, brimming with enthusiasm. Have you heard the news? Seal now goes by the nickname Lion Seal. Little Minx Jenna came up with it. Have you laid eyes on her? I doubt you've ever seen a woman as stunning as her. She possesses an alluring figure and a face that could bewitch anyone. When she sings, everyone yearns to abandon their faith for her. And she took a liking to Seal and invited him to dance. They were inseparable, grinding each other. Oh, the dance hall was dimly lit. You can well imagine what transpired, Dot. Lumian suddenly felt like he had become the protagonist of a news story in Ghost Face. Lewis and Sarkota, standing behind him, felt both embarrassed and concerned for their boss. They were embarrassed that the person at the small round table might be boasting on their boss's behalf. They were worried that if it were true, their boss would be making Red Boots Franca cockled. In that case, they would be in serious trouble. Franca not only held considerable power but was also the mistress of their big boss. Charlie, holding a beer, caught sight of Lumian, and his smile froze. He hopped off the small round table and approached Lumian, coughing before speaking. Hey, Seal, would you mind if I shared some details about your romantic entanglement? Instead of answering, Lumian asked, How did you find out? Charlie grinned. Many people know, it spread from the Sal de Gristmill. In other words, the Poison Spur mob is aware that I danced with Jenna twice before assassinating Hammer 8? That's true. I only disguised myself back then, without even changing my hair color. I even provoked those around me. In hindsight, coupled with Hammer 8's demise, they will surely recognize me. As Red Boots' mistress, Jenna may also become a target for their vengeance. There's no need to be overly concerned, though. She is protected by Red Boots. As a seasoned beyonder and a formidable demoness, Franca won't be careless in such matters. Lumian nodded, understanding the situation. He smiled at Charlie and said, feel free to share. The more the news spread, the more it would attract Red Boots' attention, deterring any potential reprisal from the Poison Spur mob. Lumian asked Charlie, why didn't you go to Sal de Ball Breeze? Charlie forced a smile and replied, the manager, Renee, wants me to start officially tomorrow. He offered me 80 verl d'or per month. As they conversed, Lumian noticed his neighbor sitting at the bar counter. The abject author Gabriel. He still sported disheveled, greasy brown hair, large black framed glasses, a faded linen shirt, and black dungarees. Lumian bid farewell to Charlie and approached Gabriel, asking, what's the matter? Gabriel, sipping on a glass of light green absinthe, glanced at him and smiled bitterly. My script was rejected. Those managers didn't even bother reading it. I've submitted it to dozens of theaters, but no one is willing to give it a chance. Dozens of theaters. Lumian's heart stirred as he casually inquired, Did you send your script to Theater Delancey and Cage a Pigeons in our market district? Yes, Gabriel sighed. Their manager turned me down too. He mentioned that they write their own scripts or commission custom ones. Lumian took a seat and asked, who is their manager? Chapter 180, Lazy Gabriel took a sip of absinthe and spoke, my Meyer. He's a theater manager with big ambitions. He aims to make Theater Delancey and Cage a Pigeons the most renowned theater in Trier. His ultimate goal is to be awarded the prestigious Intus Legion of Honor Medal. The Intus Legion of Honor Medal originated during the time of Emperor Roselle when he was still a consul. It was created to replace the nobility system of the old royal family. 
However, when Roselle declared himself Caesar, the medal was abolished, and titles like dukes, counts, barons, and knights were reintroduced. Later, when the Intus Republic was established, the Legion of Honor medal was reinstated. It was given to both military personnel and civilians who made remarkable contributions to the Republic. It wasn't limited to the military but included individuals from various industries. It was the highest honor in the current Intus Republic and being a recipient equated to being a knight from the past. In the past, painters, authors, actors, journalists, and sculptors had been honored with the Intus Legion of Honor Medal, serving as inspirations for future generations. In the stories he crafted in his dream, he deceived the villagers of Cordu by claiming that Aurora was headed to Trier to receive the Legion of Honor Medal. It wasn't entirely implausible. If Aurora could become Intus's renowned force wall and the best-selling author on the northern continent, gaining recognition from L'Institut de Intus for her artistic achievements, she might have a genuine chance at obtaining the Legion of Honor medal. Lumian chuckled and remarked, if a person lacks dreams, they're no different from salted fish. He found Maipu Meyer, the theater manager, to be quite ordinary. This led him to believe that the issues with Theater de Lancy and Cage a Pigeons extended beyond the majority of the people. There were only a few individuals closely associated with the landlord of Aubert's du Coke d'Or, Monsieur Ive, who were peculiar. After conversing with Gabriel for a while, Lumine guided Louis and Sarkota to the second floor and asked them to wait outside room 207. He closed the door behind him, took off his holster from under his left armpit, and stashed away the bullet bag. Then, he put on a dark jacket. Without delay, Lumian retrieved Mr. K's finger from beneath the pillow and slipped it into his right pocket. As for fallen mercury, the dagger from Hedzi, the awakening gas, and the unidentified liquid, he always carried them with him. However, the bayonet served no immediate purpose, so he left it in a drawer of the wooden table. Once he completed these actions, Lumian bent down and retrieved a brown suitcase from under the bed. He carefully placed Aurora's grimoires inside. Given his altered identity and the increased hostility from the poison spur mob, he felt the need to secure these grimoires in a safer and more secluded location, the rented safe house on Rue de Blouse's Blanches. To Lumian, these items held precious clues and knowledge left behind by Aurora. They also possessed an irreplaceable sentimental value that required protection. As for his daily studies, he would pre-copy a portion of the material and leave it at Aubert's du coke door or salle de ball breeze. Once he mastered it and ensured there were no issues, he would copy a few more pages at the safe house. After turning down Louis's offer to assist with his luggage, Lumian made his way back to salle de ball breeze and entered a room near the office. He retrieved the grimoire he had been perusing recently and laid it out on the desk. Taking hold of a dark red fountain pen, he commenced copying its contents onto a thick stack of white paper. As he transcribed, Lumian found the task dreadfully dull. Ideas on how to avoid the monotony began to creep into his mind. Soon enough, an idea struck him. Why not summon that rabbit-shaped creature from the spirit world, the one who had previously written the report for him, and have it copy his notebook? Though that creature was dim-witted and lacking in intellect, it proved obedient. It possessed a remarkable speed for copying and could imitate the original handwriting. In that case, all I need to do is provide spirituality while I indulge in reading newspapers and magazines, waiting for my homework to be completed. No, not homework. Rather, copying notes. Lumian pondered momentarily before setting his fountain pen down and preparing for the summoning ritual. Back in Cordu, upon finishing his sister's daily assignments, Lumian often contemplated ways to slack off. He had been teaching Raimund, Ava, and the others to comprehend words, hoping they could assist him with his homework as they improved. Alas, the disparity in knowledge between them was too vast. It couldn't be bridged without several years of effort. Before long, Lumian arranged the altar, consecrated the ritual silver dagger, and erected a wall of spirituality. As the fragrance of citrus and lavender wafted through the air, he gazed at the candle flame's yellow hue and uttered an ancient Hermes, I. In the next second, Lumian switched to Hermes. I summon in my name, spirit wandering in the void, 
a friendly creature that can be communicated with, weakling who can write in Tishin. The candle flame swiftly transformed into a deep shade of green, expanding to the size of a human head. Completing the remaining incantation, Lumian witnessed the emergence of a translucent and hazy figure from within the candle flame. Standing at nearly 1.9 meters tall, it possessed the head of an ox atop a human body, garbed in brown fur clothing. Not the rabbit. That's right. There must be numerous spirit world creatures that fit the description of my summoning incantation. The one who responds to the summons is entirely random. Lumian experienced a mix of disappointment and anticipation as he pointed toward the grimoire. Copy it for me. The ethereal minotaur nodded faintly. All right. Without delay, it seated itself, picked up the dark red fountain pen, and commenced copying Aurora's grimoire. Not bad at all, much more intelligent than that silly rabbit. Lumian thought, his delight evident. Just as he was about to settle into the recliner and peruse the newspapers and magazines, an unsettling feeling washed over him. Isn't the minotaur too slow? More than ten seconds have passed, and it hasn't even copied a word. No, in fact, it had only written two letters. Can you work any faster? Lumian probed. This is already my fastest pace, the Minotaur responded truthfully. Dot. Lumian was at a loss for words. It was even worse than the silly rabbit. That creature, at the very least, functioned like a mystical typewriter. It could complete a full page of copying in less than a minute. Lumian unconsciously considered ending the ritual and dismissing the Minotaur before summoning another spirit world creature. However, knowing that the subsequent ones were likely to be equally peculiar, he abandoned the idea in weariness. By the time the summoning ritual naturally came to an end, the Minotaur had managed to copy only half a page. Lumian rubbed his temples and made up his mind to do it himself. After transcribing three pages, he heard a knock on the door. What's the matter? Lumian closed his notebook, set aside his fountain pen, and walked toward the door. It was Lewis outside. In his rugged guise, he lowered his voice and said, Boss, Giant Simon is here. What could he want? Lumian recalled that Giant Simon was a leader of the Savoy mob, overseeing a number of dance halls and bars on Rue du Rossignol. He was suspected to be a beyonder of the warrior pathway, with a high likelihood of being a sequence eight beyonder. Lewis simply shook his head. I don't know. Lumian inquired. What did he discuss with Brignes last time? It didn't seem pleasant. Lewis elaborated, Giant Simon has always held a grudge against the Baron because he controls Sal de Ball Breeze. He instinctively used the term Baron. Observing that Lumian didn't take offense, Lewis continued, Sal de Ball Breeze's profits surpass those of all his dance halls and bars combined. He even has a casino in his bar. The last time he approached the Baron, he hoped that the Baron would prevent some of the more attractive dancers from coming here and instead have them transferred to Rue du Rossignol. The Baron replied, Red Boots is in charge of assigning the dancers. I have no objections if you discuss it with her. The prices on Rue du Rossignol are very low. Beautiful dancers are reluctant to work there. Lumian recollected Charlie mentioning that one could find inexpensive pussies on Rue du Rossignol for as little as 52 copet which amounted to just half of Earl d'Or. On the other hand, at Sal de Ball Breeze, if the dancers encountered generous patrons, they could charge up to ten Verl d'Or. Typically, they fetched anywhere between three to five Verl d'Or. This was despite the relatively low income in the market district. If it were Rue de la Murale in the Red Princess district, an above-average looking woman would cost dozens of Verl d'Or. Is Giant Simon envious of my control over Sal de Ball Breeze? Lumian nodded subtly, his brows furrowing in puzzlement, and he asked, There's something I find rather perplexing. Why are Sal de Ball Breeze's profits so substantial? Lewis grinned. Most of our alcohol comes from Rat Cristo. It's tax free and incredibly cheap. Moreover, we don't have to pay any rent. Rat Cristo, who is in charge of the smuggling business, Lumian grasped the general reasoning behind it. He exited the room, strolled along the corridor, and entered the café. 
Giant Simon, still clad in a snub black formal suit, had his light yellow hair tightly plastered to his scalp. He set his wide-brimmed round hat on the table and positioned himself by the window, puffing on a cigarette. The mobsters trailing behind him dispersed, engaging in an intense standoff with Sarkota and the others at Sal de Ball Breeze from a distance. Spotting Lumian approaching, Simon crushed the cigarette in his hand and put on a feigned wide smile. Well, well, Seal, you've already gained the boss's approval and managed to get to run Sal de Ball Breeze. Why didn't you treat us brothers to a drink? As Simon spoke, he strode toward Lumian. At over 1.9 meters in height, Lumian, who was already standing at 1.8 meters, appeared rather short. Lumian gazed up at Simon's prominent nose and pockmarked face, returning the smile. I have some sort of social phobia, so I couldn't bring myself to invite you guys. Hey, you're quite tall. Just as one would expect from a giant. You're even taller than Hammer 8. His words conveyed a message of maintaining their respective territories. If you don't provoke me, I won't provoke you. Otherwise, I'm capable of killing you, just like the Sequence 8 warrior, Hammer 8. Giant Simon didn't comprehend the meaning behind the first sentence, but he discerned the provocation in the latter. His face darkened as a result, simultaneously dispelling his disdain for Lion Seal. This wasn't merely a brawny man. Smiles and pleasantries wouldn't get him far. Simon gestured toward the table where Baron Brignes often sat. I need to discuss something with you. Chapter 181 The Loyal Seal Lumian settled back into his seat, taking a casual stance. His gaze locked onto Giant Simon as he inquired, And what's the matter? Giant Simons cast his light blue eyes over Louis and Sarkota standing behind Lumian. Aren't they Brignaz's men? Why would you allow them to tail you? If it were me, I'd put them to work as bouncers. Louis and Sarkota exchanged anxious glances when Simon hit the nail on the head. Lumian wanted to applaud, grateful that Simon had provided him with an opportunity to win their trust. However, he couldn't entirely trust Louis and Sarkota. He had no desire to become a mobster, but he didn't want to be shot in the back, riddled with bullets someday. Lumian smirked once again. What do you mean Brignaz's men? I used to work under Brignaz. We're all members of the Savoy mob, loyal to the boss. As long as I remain faithful, there's no need to worry about them turning against me. Louis and Sarkota nodded repeatedly, impressed by Seal's broad-mindedness and demeanor. That's right. Baron Brignes changed our status in the Savoy mob and gave us a lot of trust, but we're still members of the Savoy mob. Betraying the boss is out of the question. And it was the boss who commanded us to follow Seal and obey his orders. Simon choked on Lumian's words. After a few seconds, he finally said, You may be loyal to the boss, but others might not be. Brignaz is ambitious. You find Brignaz unloyal to the boss? Hidden Blade. Ah. Uh. Red Boots Franca mentioned that Brignaz hasn't been obedient lately. Lumian suddenly felt pity for Gardner Martin the boss of the Savoy mob. His most capable subordinates lacked loyalty, and his favorite mistress had ulterior motives. The newcomer he had recently promoted turned out to be a spy from another organization. Realizing he couldn't shake off Louis and Sarkota, two thugs who often accompanied Baron Brignes and had knowledge of various matters, Simon steered the conversation back on track. I came here to discuss the dancer's basic salary. Fucking damn it. Why the bloody hell do we have to give those sluts money every day, even when they don't have a single customer? Franca is overbearing. Just because she's the boss's mistress, she convinced him to agree to such an unreasonable demand. We're mobsters, not a charity. By steam, when I handed money to those women, I felt like a bloody priest. That's fine by me. I only need to give them a few licks each day. But it's one verdor a day for Sal de Ball Breeze. The textile workers in Cartier du Jardin Botanique earn only 1.5 verdor a day, and they work from morning till night. No wonder Franca's beautiful dancers refuse to work on Rue du Rossignol. The prices there are low, and the base salary is meager. 
Why are you cursing like Franca and Jenna? Can vulgarities be contagious? Aurora seemed to curse in the same manner during her occasional bouts of madness. Lumian deliberately ignored Lewis's suggestion and asked with a smile, What's your plan? Simon's fury remained etched on his face. You, me, and Black, we'll go to the boss together. We must make him change his mind and reign in Franca. Which of the other mobs pays their dancers a base salary? Is he trying to take advantage of my recent takeover of Sal de Ball Breeze? Is he inciting me to rebel against the boss? Heh <laughs> heh, as Aurora once said, the early worm gets eaten by birds, and ravens who stick their necks out get shot. Lumian raised his hands, cracking his knuckles with a sly smile. It's pointless. Franca is the boss's mistress. The boss will undoubtedly heed her. If you want him to change his mind, there's only one way, become the boss yourself. Is this something you should say in front of so many people? Louis, Sarkota, and the others behind Lumian were so terrified that they almost covered their leader's mouth. Giant Simon also appeared taken aback. What nonsense are you spouting? Most of his thugs trembled with fear. What I mean is. Lumian suddenly seized the table's edge and flung it at Giant Simon. Clang! The table crashed to the ground, and the cups upon it shattered into shards. Giant Simon had already retreated two steps, his expression darkening. His subordinates instinctively reached for their revolvers. He looked at Lumian and demanded, What do you want? Lumian stood behind the upturned wooden table, seething with anger. You wretched dog's hit, does the boss mean anything to you? How dare you plot a mutiny in secret, attempting to force him to change his orders? Do you truly aspire to be the boss? The boss's commands must be carried out, whether they're good or bad. If there's an issue, you can address it with the boss privately, but you cannot conspire with others to coerce him. The question exposed Giant Simon's true intentions, leaving him unable to explode in anger or continue inciting seal. He spat out his words. Damn it, is there something wrong with your brain? When did I say I wanted to force the boss? I merely suggested that everyone should approach the boss and explain that providing a dancer with a base salary is unreasonable. It places a heavy burden on us. With that, Giant Simon waved his hand wearing an expression that conveyed difficulty in communicating with Seal. He turned and departed, his subordinates trailing after him, descending the staircase. Observing their departure, Lumian inwardly chuckled. Thank you so much. Tomorrow, no, tonight, the boss will come to know how loyal I am. Lumian had stumbled upon an opportunity to earn Gardner Martin's trust, and he seized it without hesitation. Putting on a show, he simulated an angry exhale, restraining his emotions. Pointing at the mess on the floor, he commanded Lewis and the others, clean this up. Just as Lumian finished speaking, a figure emerged from the shadows near the staircase. It was Jenna, having finished her performance in the dance hall. Jenna wasn't wearing a revealing outfit today. Her rose-colored dress, supported by a petticoat, made her resemble an upside-down flower. Her brownish-yellow hair was tied in a simple bun at the back, with some loose strands cascading gently. The dark circles around her blue eyes were less pronounced, lending her a touch of elegance. A mole adorned the middle of her left cheek. This symbolized elegance. Observing Jenna, Lumian couldn't help but chuckle. Do the folks in the market district appreciate this style? He was referring to Jenna's less provocative attire. Jenna smiled smugly. It works surprisingly well from time to time. Franca mentioned that sometimes, the more unattainable something appears to men, the more they desire it. Fuck, I can't quite fathom that mentality. What's the matter? Lumian glanced at the waiters tidying up and found another table to sit at. Jenna took a seat opposite him and smiled. I'm here to discuss the singing fee for next week. Previously, it was ten songs per night, for Verl Dor, and a third of the money thrown onto the stage. Lately, it seems I've become more popular than in the past few months. Lumian pondered for a moment before responding. Has the Poison Spur mob grown suspicious of you, making it difficult for you to perform at their dance halls? Fuck, that infuriates me. 
couldn't you have disguised yourself better? You were identified so easily, and it ended up implicating me. Jenna replied indignantly. A mischievous grin played at the corners of Lumian's mouth. Starting from today, you will still perform ten songs per night, but the fee will be increased to ten Vroldor. You can keep two-thirds of the money thrown onto the stage. Louis, who stood behind Lumian, felt a pang of sorrow. Although Little Minx didn't sing here every night, she frequented the place several times a week. This change would result in Sal de Ball Breeze earning 2,000 Vroldor less annually. However, it seemed that Little Minx had played a significant role in the assassination of Hammer 8, the mob leader. As a consequence, she had lost the opportunity to perform in Poison Spur Mob's territory, amounting to a loss of over 1,000 Vroldor per year. Jenna appeared quite content. Receiving 10 Vroldor for 10 songs and keeping two-thirds of the money thrown on stage was the most generous treatment in the underground singer industry. She smiled and said, I can only come for three days next week, from Friday to Sunday night. Seeking opportunities at dance halls in other districts? Lumian inquired casually. Jenna shook her head. No, I don't have that much time to bloody sing. I have other things to attend to. Isn't being an underground singer your profession? Lumian inquired curiously. This is just a part-time gig. Jenna emphasized with a smirk. My main job is being the shared mistress of Lion Seal and Red Boots Franca. Lewis's legs nearly buckled at the jest. In his mind, Franca was a possessive woman. She had taught a lesson to any man who dared to snatch Little Minx away from her. If the boss truly became involved with Little Minx, he would undoubtedly face Red Boots' fury. This fellow has other identities? Lumian's thoughts raced as he asked thoughtfully, Is Jenna your real name or an alias? Part-time underground singers often adopted an alias to avoid impacting their other occupations. Jenna's lips curled up, and she blinked before replying, What do you think, Monsieur Seal? She deliberately emphasized the name Seal, implying that he, too, used an alias. With that, Jenna rose from her seat, leaned across the wooden table, and whispered into Lumian's ear, After hearing your conversation with Giant Simon, I have a sincere suggestion. The less loyal someone is, the more they boast about their loyalty. Your performance went a bit overboard, he. Jenna straightened up, wearing an air of pride, and confidently walked toward the staircase. Finally, it was her turn to educate Seal. Is that so? Lumian pondered as he watched Jenna's departing figure. Aren't you wearing perfume today? Jenna turned around, her expression brimming with delight as she inquired, so you didn't notice me ascending the stairs? Chapter 182, Truth Serum What do you think, Madam Jenna? Lumian grinned, throwing Jenna's own words back at her. Damn it! Jenna exclaimed, raising her hand in frustration before turning around with a scowl and storming back downstairs. Lumian pondered for a few moments, tapping the table in front of him. He turned to Louis and Sarkota and said, Bring me a glass of fennel absinthe. Being the protector of Sal de Ball Breeze had its perks, and his meals here were on the house. As he remembered that he had to hand over most of the dance hall's profits to the boss and bribe the police, Lumian felt less inclined to be frugal. No matter how difficult things became, he couldn't let himself suffer. He had to do his utmost to make the boss suffer instead. Lumian drank two glasses of the bitter, mind-altering light green liquid and remained at Sal de Ball Breeze until nearly midnight. Standing up, he turned to Louis and Sarkota and declared, I'm going to bed. Wait until the dance hall closes before you head home. If anyone causes trouble, throw them out. If you can't handle them alone, gather everyone and be bold enough to take action. Don't worry, I'll take responsibility if anything goes wrong. What he left unsaid was, if I can't handle the responsibility, I'll leave it for the boss to worry about. Sal de Ball Breeze stayed open until 2 a.m. every day, usually opening between 10.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. Yes, boss, Sarkota and Lewis replied in unison. Upon returning to his bedroom, Lumian lingered for another 15 minutes before grabbing the brown suitcase containing Aurora's grimoires. 
he squeezed out of the window and smoothly landed on the ground from the second floor. He walked through the shadows, turning from Avenue du Marquet into Rue de Blouse's Blanches, and entered the safe house he had rented previously. After hiding the grimoires and releasing some sulfur to repel the bugs, Lumian left the room and turned into an alley behind Rue de Blouse's Blanches. He planned to take a detour to Aubert's du Cope door, where he would spend the night. After walking a dozen steps, he noticed a pile of trash beside a barricade. Scavengers and cleaners wouldn't come until the next morning to clean it up. At that moment, it had become a haven for rats, cockroaches, flies, and stray dogs. Seeing the rats and stray dogs, Lumian suddenly remembered something. Among the three metal canisters he had acquired from the perverted Hedzi, one remained unidentified. I might as well give it a try. Lumian nodded to himself imperceptibly. Relying on his exceptional skills, lightning-fast reflexes, nimble movements, and keen observation, he swiftly stepped on a rat with grayish-black fur. He crouched down, retrieved the slightly heavy metal canister, and poured some odorless, colorless liquid into the prey's mouth. The rat let out a quick squeak, but aside from that, nothing out of the ordinary happened. Considering the pervert's methods, I thought it might be an aphrodisiac, but it doesn't seem like it. That makes sense. That pervert possesses beyonder powers that stimulate desire. He wouldn't need an additional canister with the same effect. Lumian lifted his right foot, watching as the rat scurried back to its companions. It joined the swarm while emitting continuous squeaks, but it didn't do anything else. Suddenly, a voice as clear as crystal rang out from behind him. What are you up to? Lumian whirled around and beheld Red Boots Franca emerging from the shadows at the far end of the alley. She still sported her trademark red boots, off-white breeches, and a black and white checkered blouse. Her flaxen hair was neatly tied up. Why are you here? Lumian was about to inquire, but he promptly recalled that Franca resided at three Rue de Blouse's Blanches. He could only respond honestly, conducting an experiment. What kind of experiment? Franca approached with curiosity. Her eyes, resembling sparkling lakes, surveyed the rats before she let out a chuckle. Has your sister taught you to experiment on rats? Are you referring to laboratory rats? Lumian found it easy to converse with Franca. Many words required no further explanation. He then said, Didn't Jenna inform you that after I disposed of the pervert, I obtained three metal canisters? One contained gas that could render people unconscious. I depleted it when I eliminated Hammer 8. The second canister contained an accompanying gaseous stimulant, and there's still a fair amount left. The third canister holds a liquid. I'm unsure of its properties. Hence, I experimented on these rats. Understanding dawned on Franca's face. So, it's a leftover from that pervert. She then asked with anticipation, could it be an aphrodisiac? Why do you share my thoughts, madam? Lumian gestured towards the squeaking rat, finding amusement in the situation. It doesn't seem so. You appear somewhat disappointed? Franca didn't conceal her feelings and let out a sigh. Indeed. If it were truly an aphrodisiac, how intriguing it would be. If it were indeed an aphrodisiac, what would you want to use it for? Lumian suddenly harbored suspicions that Franca intended to do something to Jenna. Franca glanced at him. Damn it, are you accusing me in your mind? Do you think I have no moral boundaries? I hope it's an aphrodisiac. My main curiosity lies in experiencing its effects and effectiveness. I would consume some myself and have Gardner try it as well. If his mistress's desire, they can partake too. Do you understand the pleasures of flirtation and amusement? Dot. Lumian was momentarily at a loss for words. After a few seconds, he responded, You triarians certainly excel at games. I'm not a triarian, Franca retorted, but I concur with your statement. She turned her gaze towards the metal canister in Lumian's grasp. Shall I assist you in discovering its properties? Aren't you concerned about the dangers? Lumian was somewhat taken aback. It remained uncertain whether this vial of liquid was a slow-acting poison or a vessel for curses. Franca chuckled and replied, 
you truly need to supplement your knowledge of mysticism. I intend to employ divination. Witches possess considerable divinatory abilities. Aurora's grimoires made no mention of it. They solely documented the witch's potion, which causes gender transformation. It speculates that every witch excels in spells. Yes, those proficient in spells shouldn't be lacking in divination. Lumian handed the liquid-filled canister to Franca. Franca walked to the edge of the alley and halted behind a five-story building. She extended her right hand and traced it back and forth on the dim glass window. Simultaneously, she softly recited something in Hermes. Even with Lumian's acute hearing, he could only catch a few words. Spirituality. Inquiry. Answer. A few seconds later, the glass window darkened and deepened, as though it led to an enigmatic, unknown world. Franca stepped back, raised the metal canister, and spoke in Intus, what is the purpose of the liquid inside? From the depths of the glass window, an aged voice responded, induces an urge to confess. Franca nodded, expressed gratitude, and concluded the divination. As the glass window returned to its original state, she turned to Lumian and stated, it appears to be a concoction akin to a truth serum. Truth serum? Lumian inquired. Aurora had never mentioned such a term. Franca casually explained, it's a serum that compels people to speak the truth. Once their desire to spill their secrets is triggered, along with the interrogator's questioning, although there may be a fair amount of nonsense, it becomes exceedingly challenging to lie. What they utter should stem from their innermost desires. Confiding their desires. Similar to the pervert's other abilities, involving diverse human yearnings. As expected of a boon from the mother tree of desire. This could prove quite useful for a beyonder like me, who lacks proficiency in spirit communication and divination. Lumian retrieved the metal canister from Franca. Franca glanced around and queried with a smile, why did you choose Rue de Blouse's Blanches for the experiment? Shouldn't your activities be centered around Avenue du Marquet and Rue Anarchy? Lumian withheld nothing. I rented a safe house here to safeguard my sister's grimoires. I fear they may be damaged if I am targeted. Very cautious, Franca nodded approvingly. Your sister is fortunate to have a brother like you. I used to have a brother too. He was conceited, enjoyed flaunting his skills, and lacked practicality. I yearned to teach him a lesson every day. She trailed off midway, her gaze falling upon her red boots. Used to have. Does that imply he is no longer present? Lumian keenly sensed Franca's unspoken meaning and promptly understood the reason behind her sudden despondency. After a few seconds, Franca's smile returned. Your sister must trust you too. Otherwise, she wouldn't have revealed our organization to you. Although we never explicitly mentioned keeping the research society a secret from our families, hardly anyone ever discloses it. After all, Franca fell silent once more, her smile taking on a bitter tinge. After all, what? Lumian was perplexed, but he refrained from asking. Instead, he simply elaborated on Aurora's rationale. We were caught in a calamity back then, unsure of who would survive and who would perish. That's why my sister divulged some secrets to me, hoping they would prove useful in the future. Understood. Franca nodded, regaining her composure. She smiled and remarked, I thought you came to Rue de Blouse's Blanches in search of me, eager to learn about mysticism. It's too late now. Lumian was already feeling weary. Franca clicked her tongue and chuckled. I won't do anything to you. It's too. Too mad and shameful to engage in such activities with someone who knows my true gender. Is that so? I was afraid that once you got accustomed to it, the shame would only heighten your excitement. Lumian suspected that Franca, who could be swayed by the notion of life is short, why not give it a try, would engage in more unforeseen endeavors. After bidding farewell to the demoness, he returned to Aubert's du Coke door. Nothing eventful occurred in Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman until Thursday. At 8 p.m., Lumian arrived at 19, Rue Chiron Avenue du Boulevard and met Mr. K in the basement. 
Mr. K gestured towards the three assistants holding silver trays behind him and stated, there are a total of three mystical items, each priced between 15,000 Vroldor and 20,000. Make your selection. Chapter 183, Three Items Upon entering the basement, Lumian's eyes immediately fell upon three silver plates holding the items. There was an unassuming white glove, a pair of gold-rimmed glasses with a tea-colored tint, and a shiny golden button. Observing Lumian's interest in the mystical objects, Mr. K, seated in a red armchair, introduced them in a low, raspy voice, that glove is circus. It grants you some weak but peculiar mystical abilities. It can conjure a gust of wind, create fog, and use bursts of light to mess with your target's vision. By touching them, you can freeze your enemies. You can also open most doors without a key. It can even guide you through solid walls. These techniques suit your need for mysticism, but remember, carrying it will make you lose your way more often. And sometimes, getting lost brings misfortune. Price is 18,000 Vroldor. Sounds like the Sequence 8 Trick Master of the Apprentice Pathway mentioned in Aurora's Grimoires. Although the powers aren't formidable if used as support alongside traps or my close combat skills and revolver shots, they can yield miraculous results. Lumian found solace in the positive effects of the circus glove, compensating for his lack of mysticism and helplessness in certain situations. However, the negative effects were dire. For hunters who relied on tracking and pathfinding, losing their way frequently meant losing their strengths entirely. Misfortune could strike at any moment, even without wearing the glove. Merely having it in his pocket would affect Lumian. Mr. K shifted his attention to the brown, gold-rimmed glasses and addressed Lumian. Do you remember the painting from the gathering? Painting? Lumian's mind immediately conjured the image of the dizzying oil painting. The painting, reputedly created by a beyonder before his demise, boasted vibrant colors, a peculiar pattern, and a hallucinatory scene. It seemed as if the artist had descended into madness before his death. I do. Lumian nodded. Mr. K continued, after the painting's owner passed away, his beyonder attributes together with a strange power fused into his glasses, creating a unique mystical item. It allows the wearer to perceive things invisible to the naked eye. Occasionally, one can glimpse the truth of this world to some extent. Aurora's cautionary words echoed in Lumian's mind, don't see what you shouldn't see, don't listen to what you shouldn't hear. Internally, Lumian couldn't help but criticize, isn't this pair of glasses doing the exact opposite? It's like a weapon of self-destruction. These items seem to have nothing to do with my two needs. Mr. K glanced at Lumian, his voice still low and raspy in the confined basement. By perceiving the world from a different perspective and witnessing the once invisible, the wearer will be seized by an uncontrollable urge to paint. Each painting produced will possess supernatural effects. For instance, a painting of an ocean will make onlookers feel as if they're drowning. In a similar vein, if you apply various cosmetics to your face instead of painting on canvas, you can achieve an excellent disguise. Anyone scrutinizing your face will be convinced that it's your true appearance, albeit temporarily. Remember, once you've painted a new face, avoid looking in the mirror. Otherwise, you'll believe it to be your real self. Slowly but surely, your body and mind will transform until you become an entirely different person. Much like this, you can't sustain that newfound countenance indefinitely. After a span of three hours or more, your sense of self will gradually succumb to its influence until you wholeheartedly believe that you are one and the same. Upon analyzing the possible beyonder domain of the mystical item, Lumian couldn't help but speculate, it sounds akin to the hypnosis and suggestions of the psychiatrist pathway, but it differs greatly in other aspects. Considering the demise of the painter, could it be a power or aura left behind by an evil god? Mr. K fixed his gaze on the brown glasses. You can probably surmise its negative effects. Seeing what should remain unseen and perceiving the truth of the world without adequate protection exposes you to unknown dangers. Perhaps, one day, you may meet a peculiar death like the painter, leaving behind an enigmatic painting. The price is 15,000 Vroldor. Corresponding to a Sequence 9 lawyer? 
the crucial aspect lies in the peculiar power associated with it. Yes, it doesn't fully reflect a lawyer's abilities. Aurora's grimoires describe lawyers as masters of eloquence and reasoning, adept at uncovering loopholes and rules and exploiting their opponents' weaknesses. They create an advantageous atmosphere to achieve ultimate victory. They can influence judgment, thoughts, and conclusions through their words, actions, and established processes. Additionally, they excel at utilizing the power of order. Lumian mentally reviewed the relevant mystical knowledge. However, he remained uncertain about the lawyer trait, particularly how to harness the power of order. Aurora lacked knowledge in that regard as well. In essence, the brown gold rimmed glasses fulfilled Lumian's need for better disguises. They also provided mystical means that required preparation but were less troublesome than the alms monks' elaborate rituals. The only issue was its perilous nature. Lumian contemplated, but didn't reach a final decision. He awaited Mr. K's introduction of the golden button. Before long, Mr. K's raspy voice resounded again. It's called Flare. It originated from a deceased light suppliant. It grants additional buffs such as courage and strength through singing. It enables you to sense the presence of undead creatures and evil entities. You can also employ spells and rituals from the Sun Domain, making it highly effective against undead souls and similar targets. After wearing it, you'll feel compelled to sing. Darkness and cold become unbearable, and you'll yearn for sunlight and warmth. If you haven't removed it after half an hour, you'll become a devoted follower of the eternal blazing sun, earnestly praising the sun. The price is 20,000 Verldor. If it can resolve my issue of resisting the undead, the negative effects are bearable. The problem lies in the limited viable targets. Lumian pondered deeply, torn between which item to choose. His rationale suggested opting for flare or circus, yet he couldn't make a decisive choice. The brown gold rimmed glasses catered to both of his needs and were his preferred option. By wearing them solely before disguising himself and creating paintings with supernatural effects in a safe environment, he could effectively evade most of the negative consequences. Thus, he would avoid witnessing things he shouldn't and the so called truth of the world. In essence, it wasn't an item that needed constant donning. Lumian could choose the opportune moment to utilize it. This way, he could proactively construct a spiritual barrier, screening out anomalies, similar to when he performed the summoning dance. Considering his seal, the coincidences of inevitability, and the occasional summoning dance, Lumian didn't believe an additional trait would worsen matters. I want those glasses. Mr. K appeared taken aback by Lumian's choice. After a few seconds, he queried, Are you certain? I'm certain. Lumian produced a small cloth bag brimming with banknotes and meticulously counted out 15,000 Verldor. Mr. K refrained from further persuasion, emitting a raspy chuckle. You're even crazier than I presumed. There was a hint of admiration in his tone. Instructing the attendant to accept the 15,000 Verldor and hand over the brown glasses to Lumian, Mr. K nodded and remarked, You can give them a test run here. It's safe enough. Lumian caressed the frame and discovered that the seemingly metallic material had an odd rubbery texture. I'll dub you the mystery prying glasses. Lumian pondered, recalling his sister's beyond her pathway. In the ensuing moment, he placed the brown gold rimmed glasses on the bridge of his nose. Almost instantly, he beheld a multitude of scenes from various angles. The mottled ceiling, bloodstains in the corners, Mr. K's back that should have been out of sight and the attendant's station in the corridor. Lumian also caught sight of a blot of darkness, a silhouette, a gaze emanating from an unknown source, and a visage concealed within the shadows. Beneath the hood lay black, feathery hair, delicate features, sunken eyes, dark orbs, and ageless skin, only visible from below. Is that Mr. K's face? Lumian experienced a sudden revelation. Images from different perspectives flooded his mind, leaving him feeling lightheaded. His state of mind grew increasingly abnormal, and an insatiable urge to capture everything overcame him. Hastily, Lumian removed the mystery prying glasses, and his vision reverted to normal. Yet, the compulsion to draw lingered within him. 
exhaling deeply, he declared, it's tolerable. Mr. K offered a brief warning, try to employ it in familiar and secure situations. After bidding farewell to Mr. K and departing the psychic's headquarters, Lumian boarded a carriage back to Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman. En route, as he passed through Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative, a thought struck him. I must gather some canvases, brushes, and paints. Even though my skills are limited to sketching and not particularly exceptional, the quality of the painting shouldn't influence the attached supernatural effects. Perhaps, the more distorted and grotesque it appears, the better the outcome. Fifteen minutes later, Lumian alighted from the carriage ahead of schedule and located a shop specializing in oil painting supplies. Upon hearing the price, he couldn't help but inquire, what? 160 Verl d'Or? A single canvas costs 160 Verl d'Or? Chapter 184 Painting when Lumian stepped back into the Aubert's du Coke door, his mind was still filled with the exorbitant cost of painting supplies. Among his colleagues at the Salle de Ball Breeze, Charlie's monthly salary as a waiter was considered decent. However, it would take him two months of foregoing food and drink just to afford a single roll of canvas. Lumian couldn't help but view painters as a destitute lot. How could they ever afford canvases, brushes, paints, wooden frames, human models, and all the other expenses that came with their craft. Perhaps they relied on financial support from their families just to get by. Shaking off these thoughts, Lumian closed the door behind him and carefully placed a stack of items on the wooden table. Eventually, he resigned himself to the fact that he couldn't afford proper canvases. Instead, he settled for the cheapest brushes, paints, paper, and other necessities. The truth was, Lumian didn't aspire to be a painter or have his work displayed in an exhibition. He simply needed a medium to imbue the supernatural power, obtained from the mystery prying glasses. The quality of the paint, the possibility of cracking, the fading over time, or even his painting skills were all inconsequential matters. And so, Lumian spent a total of 30 Verl d'Or, acquiring his modest supplies. Mixing a palette of vibrant colors and unfurling a flexible sheet of white paper, Lumian prepared himself for the ritual ahead. With the sanctified silver dagger in hand, he crafted a wall of spirituality within room 207. His intention was to explore what he could draw and observe the effects it would yield. Based on the reaction of Madame Magician's messenger at Aubert's du Coke door, Lumian surmised that there was nothing particularly abnormal about this place. The only notable issue seemed to be the abundance of bedbugs. Susanna Mattis' predicament most likely had its origins in Theodore Delancey and Cage a pigeons or perhaps even an underground cavern. Taking a slow breath, Lumian retrieved the brown glasses with golden rims and carefully placed them upon the bridge of his nose. In an instant, the world around him seemed to spin, as if he had plummeted from the sky into the depths of the earth. During this disorienting journey, Lumian beheld the inverted motel with its occupants moving about in a similar fashion, an underground bar, roots of trees and soil extending beneath the surface, rats lurking in the corners, and vermin scurrying about. Deeper and deeper he fell, enduring the nauseating sensation of weightlessness. And then, he caught sight of an immense network of brownish-green roots stretching in all directions, reaching into the distance and vanishing into the void. Ugh. Lumian nearly expelled the contents of his stomach. The remnants of his unfinished dinner rose to his throat, threatening to escape. Swiftly, he removed the mystery prying glasses and fought the urge to vomit. Fueled by an insatiable desire to draw, Lumian picked up a paintbrush, dipped it into the paint, and began sketching upon the blank canvas. Unbeknownst to him, his spirituality infused the brush with an increasing vigor. After a few minutes, Lumian halted his strokes and gazed upon his creation. What in the world have I drawn? The question echoed in his mind. Upon careful observation, he managed to discern the subject of his artwork, a triangular house with a grayish-blue hue, its roof adorned with green trees, and rain resembling mud. Lumian stared at the painting for a moment and suddenly felt an itching sensation on the back of his hand. Unable to resist, he scratched it, only to witness his skin turning red and swollen, accompanied by an all-over itchiness. 
Could this be the beyonder influence of the painting? Lumian's heart stirred as he looked away, attempting to soothe the irritation through the friction of his clothes. But his efforts were in vain, and he couldn't help but scratch a few more times. As he averted his gaze from the childlike graffiti of an oil painting, the itching gradually subsided and eventually vanished. The urge to paint had vanished as well. He turned around and contemplated the details. I have to stare at the painting for at least three seconds before my body itches. It's challenging to use it in battle. I can't just stick it on my face, can I? If I use it as a trap, it might have some utility. I wonder if there are any paintings that can be used without drawing the target's attention. After careful consideration, Lumian resolved to make another attempt. He donned the mystery prying glasses once more, and the experience was nearly identical. However, this time he also glimpsed deep darkness and shadowy figures moving within it. Amidst the waves of nausea, Lumian removed his brown gold-rimmed glasses, retrieved a fresh sheet of paper, and took up a paintbrush. This time, he didn't surrender to impulsive strokes but instead focused on visualizing what he desired and endeavored to bring the drawing closer to the image in his mind. With this approach, Lumian crafted a golden red sun, surrounded by a vibrant circle of colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. As he finished, room 207 suddenly warmed, and the chill in the air dissipated. It seems to have a simple exorcism effect. Lumian wasn't entirely certain. He sat on the edge of the bed, carefully observing the changes. Over time, the warmth, which initially evoked restlessness and unease, began to fade. Lumian attempted to fold the painting, keeping its back facing outward. The warmth promptly vanished, and the loss of spiritual essence within the painting slowed to a barely noticeable pace. I should be able to preserve it for about two months. When unfurled, it can only be used for three days at most. Yes, this is akin to an alternative method of creating beyonder weapons. Lumian estimated, recalling his previous experiences. Drawing two paintings in quick succession had placed a considerable burden on his spirituality. After taking a short break, Lumian proceeded with his third experiment. This time, he switched to using makeup-related painting tools. Putting on the mystery prying glasses once again, he braced himself for the sensation of spiraling into the depths. In the midst of it, Lumian caught sight of several indistinct figures lurking in the shadows. Removing the mystical item, he began smearing various substances on his face, carefully tracing lines with the aid of the glass window, which was illuminated by the light of the carbide lamp. Similar to his previous attempt, Lumian made an effort to maintain control over his makeup, but occasionally, his instincts took over. Reflecting on the mirror, he saw his appearance becoming worn and haggard. His eyebrows appeared disheveled, his cheekbones slightly more pronounced, and his lips a touch fuller. It felt as if he were looking at a stranger. Hastily averting his gaze, he drew the curtain to conceal the result of his painting. Having packed away the itchiness and sun paintings along with the various tools, Lumian decided it was time to venture out and verify the effects. As he made his way to Sal de Ball Breeze, he noticed Jenna engaging in flamboyant gestures while singing at the top of her lungs, and Charlie, who had just delivered some drinks to the outskirts of the dance floor. The thugs paid no attention to Lumian, and none of them addressed him as their boss. Feeling a sense of relief, Lumian walked over to Charlie's side, gave his shoulder a friendly pat, and smiled. Good evening. Charlie, clad in a white shirt and black vest, turned around, returning the smile as he asked, Good evening, monsieur. Would you like something to drink? Deliberately, Lumian inquired, Don't you recognize me? Caught off guard, Charlie's eyes widened, and for a few seconds, he gazed at the distant gas wall lamp. Suddenly, a smile spread across his face, and he exclaimed in astonishment, It's you. Praise the sun. How long has it been since we last met? Just wait a moment. I'll come to you as soon as I'm not so busy. Charlie pointed towards the bar counter and bid Lumian farewell. This kid's acting skills are quite impressive, Lumian chuckled with satisfaction. He didn't even recognize his own boss, me. Shifting his gaze, Lumian approached Jenna's stage, P. 
patiently waiting for her to finish singing a song filled with vulgar lyrics. As soon as Jenna finished collecting the copper and silver coins from the stage and descended, Lumian eagerly greeted her and exclaimed, You sang magnificently. Can I treat you to a drink? Jenna immediately put on a cautious expression. Ever since the incident with that perverted headsy, she couldn't afford to be careless around any audience member who approached her. She worried about encountering another unpleasant situation. For a few seconds, she examined Lumian's face and forced a smile to conceal her weariness. I must preserve my voice for my next song. Help me out by having another drink. With a wink, Jenna approached the two mobsters guarding the stage, seeking their assistance. The mobsters didn't dare offend Showy Diva, who was rumored to be their boss and Red Boots lover. Stepping forward, they positioned themselves between Lumian and Jenna. Seizing the opportunity, Jenna made her way to the lounge near the bar counter. Before leaving, she glanced at Lumian's hair color and scrutinized his face intently for a moment. She muttered to herself, Bloody hell, is this some sort of fashion trend now? Lumian happily averted his gaze and turned toward the staircase leading to the cafe. The two vigilant mobsters guarding the area stopped him. Very dutiful. Lumian smiled and replied, just going for a cup of coffee. After observing Lumian closely for a few seconds, the two mobsters stepped aside. Entering the cafe and noticing that Lewis and Sarkota had nothing to do, Lumian made his way to the washroom. He didn't dare look at himself in the mirror. Instead, he splashed tap water on his face and rubbed it a few times, gradually removing his makeup. When he was done, he looked at the mirror and saw his pale and weary reflection staring back at him. It drains my spirituality quite a bit. I even painted two artworks earlier, Lumian thought to himself, regaining his composure before leaving the washroom. Lewis glanced around and stood up in surprise. Boss! When did you return? Just now, Lumian replied, pointing towards the corridor. I'm going to get some rest. Understood, boss, Lewis and Sarkota responded obediently, refraining from questioning further. Lumian entered his room, compelled himself to freshen up, and settled down on the bed, drifting into sleep. In his dream, he experienced the unbearable sensation of free falling from midair towards the ground. As he plummeted, the earth beneath him unexpectedly cracked open, revealing a sea of raging flames. Lumian felt a searing and piercing pain in his mind. He snapped his eyes open, sitting up and gasping for breath. In that moment, the room was enveloped in darkness and silence. Only a faint glow of crimson moonlight filtered through the curtains, casting a dim light upon the desk beside the window. Chapter 185 Missing Goods Why did I have such a dream? It felt eerily real. Lumian collected himself and assessed his condition, but found nothing amiss. Yet, in his dream, he felt as though he was once again wearing the mystery prying glasses, and they revealed even more. After pondering for a while, Lumian suspected that the negative effects of wearing the mystery prying glasses three times in a row still lingered. They seemed to have seeped into his subconscious, manifesting in his dream within the confines of Sal de Ball Breeze, an ancient burial ground. It appears that something is truly amiss beneath the surface here. Lumian sighed inwardly. He rose from his bed, donned his coat, and resolved to spend the night elsewhere to test his hypothesis. Under the cover of darkness, with Sal de Ball breeze devoid of any illumination, Lumian followed the shadows along the roadside and returned to Aubert's Du Coq door, its main entrance locked. For Lumian, this posed no obstacle. He didn't try rousing the irritable Madame Fells by knocking on the door. Instead, he circled around to the side traced the pipe, and climbed onto the balcony on the second floor. In room 207, Lumian slept until six in the morning. He experienced only two sporadic, ordinary dreams. So, it was indeed the ancient bones buried deep beneath Sal de Ball Breeze that triggered the residual powers of the mystery prying glasses within me. Lumian sat up, a mixture of delight and disappointment washing over him. His original plan was to use the mystery prying glasses to create one or two supernatural paintings each day, accumulating them for future needs. 
However, it seemed that frequent use of the glasses was ill-advised. He would have to wait until the lingering negative effects dissipated before attempting further experiments. Otherwise, he risked something dreadful and bizarre happening over time, possibly leading to a strange demise akin to the lawyer who had left the glasses behind, leaving behind only an eerie oil painting with enduring abnormal effects. Tonight, I shall sleep within Sal de Ball Breeze and ascertain whether the negative effects have dissipated. In the future, I must refrain from wearing the glasses more than twice in a brief span of time. These are the details Mr. Kane neglected to mention. Yes, I must experience them firsthand. Only through firsthand experience can I truly comprehend. Lumian rose energetically and made his way to the washroom to freshen up. It being still early, many of the tenants were still abed, and the morning remained tranquil, devoid of the usual clamor over access to the washroom. From time to time, Madame Fells would ascend the stairs to inspect the water meters on each floor, ensuring no one wasted the precious resource. A contract had been inked between Aubert's Du Coke Door and the Imperial Water Supply Company, stipulating a daily allowance of no less than 250 liters and no more than 500 liters of water. The cost amounted to 100 Verl d'Or per year. Leisurely, Lumian strolled to the café en Rue de Blouse's Blanches. He indulged in delectable treats like sable cookies and brioche, a softer variation of croissants. Afterwards, he sought out a place for exercise. Upon returning to Aubert's Du Coke door, he spotted Charlie, sporting a linen shirt and black trousers, seated on the steps outside the entrance, relishing a mouthful of meatloaf accompanied by an apple whiskey sour. So early? Lumian inquired, a smile playing on his lips. Sal de Ball Breeze closed its doors at 2 a.m., and the morning had yet to reach 8.30 a.m. Uncertain whether to hastily rise and greet his employer or engage in the usual casual conversation, Charlie hesitated for a moment before standing up, a sheepish smile on his face. I think I'll catch a bit more sleep before heading back to the dance hall. I don't think I can keep doing this. I reckon there ought to be some time when we don't have to sleep or work. Otherwise, it feels, feels. Sal de Ball Breeze open at 10.30 a.m. Feels like we're mere machines built for work, devoid of a life to call our own. Lumian finished Charlie's sentence, lending him a helping hand. Exactly. That's spot on. Charlie agreed. You're quite the refined individual, you know? Sometimes, you don't seem like a mobster at all. I mean, not like the leader of the Savoy mob. You come across as more. Civilized. Had everything gone according to plan, I would have been studying at a university in Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative. I would be spending time chatting with my classmates and exploring the depths of underground trier. Lumian's heart sank as he focused his attention on Charlie. This was the method he used to observe whether Susanna Mattis' issue still lingered and when it would rear its head. Wah, what are you staring at? Charlie stammered nervously. Do you see something amiss? Lumian eased his worry. His luck appears to be relatively normal and stable. He smiled, raising his right hand and giving a wave behind Charlie's back. Good morning, Susanna. Charlie spun around, eyes wide open, scrutinizing every detail. A few seconds later, he exhaled and turned back, forcing a smile. He addressed Lumian, you're just messing with me again. That name remained a haunting nightmare he couldn't shake off anytime soon. I'm strengthening your mental endurance. This way, if something truly occurs, you won't panic and find yourself unable to devise a solution. Lumian earnestly patted Charlie's shoulder. Moments before 10.30 a.m., Lumian made his way back to Sal de Ball Breeze. Upon his arrival, Louis and Sarkota approached simultaneously, their voices merging into one as they spoke. Boss, something's up. What's the matter? Lumian inquired with a smile, seemingly oblivious to the anxiety and unease radiating from his two subordinates. Louis glanced towards the staircase, lowering his voice. Red boots, giant, and rat are all here. It must be something serious. Every leader present? Lumian pondered his recent actions and found it hard to believe that he hadn't offended all the leaders of the Savoy mob. 
I've been on my best behavior these past few days. Indeed, Lewis confirmed with a solemn nod. Lumian ascended the second floor stairs nonchalantly, where Franca and the others awaited. Franca had swapped her footwear for darker red boots. She sported light colored pants and a trendy dark skirt that had gained popularity in Trier recently. Completing her ensemble was a more masculine formal attire. With her right leg crossed over her left, Franca grinned at Lumian as he approached. To her right was Baron Brignais, donned in a formal suit and top hat. On her left was a slender faced man, barely reaching a height of 1.6 meters, boasting a pair of rat like whiskers. He wore a dark brown shirt that fell short, and his thick, grayish black hair framed his countenance. His dark blue eyes revealed a trace of anxiety. Rat Christo, Baron Brignais courteously introduced Lumian to the thin faced man. Baron Brignais then gestured towards the man seated opposite him. Blood Palm Black. Black possessed brown hair, blue eyes, and a round face. He appeared to be in his early thirties and had a warm smile that hardly resembled that of a mob leader. Clad in attire leaning more towards formality, his hands were large, with clearly defined bones beneath the surface. He held a slowly smoldering cigar. Good morning, everyone. Lumian dragged an armchair closer and settled in, positioning himself nearly a meter away from the table, assuming the air of someone in control. Giant Simon glanced at him, took a drag from his cigarette, and exhaled a cloud of grayish-blue smoke. Christo met with some trouble and requires our assistance. What sort of trouble? Lumian directed his gaze towards Rat Christo. Christo played a vital role in Sal de Balbreeze's lucrative business. Despite the premium he charged for the smuggled liquor he peddled, its lack of taxation made it significantly cheaper than the wholesale liquor stores in Trier. Moreover, a substantial portion of the alcohol Christo dealt with was moonshine, cleverly adorned with labels from relatively renowned brands and origins. Gritting his teeth, Christo, who bore a striking resemblance to a rat, spoke up. I've lost a shipment underground. The delivery men and escorts have vanished. Damn it, my younger brother was among them. His wife and child are in tears at my place. Something has transpired in underground trier? Smuggling operations are divided into carriers and armed protection? That's right. Asta Troll had mentioned helping others transport illicit books. Horse-drawn carriages are useless in underground trier, they rely solely on manual labor. Lumian nodded subtly and inquired, what kind of goods? A batch of red wine and brandy, along with some blackfish. Rat Christo couldn't help but slam the table. Damn it, we've taken that route countless times. Nothing ever happened, nor did we encounter those hyenas. The term hyenas referred to the quarry police, who specialized in cracking down on smuggling activities and maintained order in the underground. Observing Lumian's confusion, Baron Brignais casually explained, blackfish refers to firearms. Among the mob's top five lucrative ventures, the bootleg alcohol supply chain ranked second. Firearms, due to low demand, brought in the least profit. The casino business, which was the most lucrative, wasn't particularly favored in the market district, given the modest incomes of the local population. The money one could extract from the patrons was rather limited. Compared to gambling, which required wit, those who toiled all day preferred indulging in cheap liquor, gyrating their bodies, and seeking solace in the company of captivating dancers. Regarding the sale of psychotropic drugs, the police department and trier cracked down heavily on it. Following repeated warnings from the Market District's police headquarters, Sal de Balbreeze had put an end to such incidents. However, Rudu Rossignol, overseen by Giant Simon, occasionally experienced a few cases. Lumian turned to Rat Christo and spoke, Any suspects? None, Christo lamented. Damn it, that route is incredibly well concealed. Apart from me and my men, no one in the Market District is aware of it. He paused for a moment before sharing his intentions. I need your help to search for clues along that route, using your expertise. I've gone through it myself, but found nothing. Without waiting for Lumian's response, Franka nodded and suggested, let's form pairs to ensure safety during the investigation. Right, 
I'll team up with Seal. There's something I need to discuss with him. Giant Simon's gaze flickered between Franca and Seal a few times before he recalled that Seal was suspected of sleeping with Franca's mistress, thus cuckolding her. Seizing the opportunity to teach Seal a lesson, Giant Simon nodded imperceptibly and said to Blood Palm Black, You and I will be a team. Baron Brignes then turned to Rat Cristo. I'll accompany you for your second trip. After Baron Brignes and Giant Simon scoured the underground route to no avail, Lumian and Franca followed a smuggler into Underground Trier. Chapter 186 Strange Footprints Holding an iron black carbide lamp, Franca glanced at the path between stone pillars and asked the smuggler, Fernandez, who was leading the way, in a state of confusion, doesn't this lead to Cartier de l'Observatoire? Though Underground Trier was a complex maze, the tunnels on this level had street names corresponding to the surface. After pondering for a moment, Franca realized they were going in the wrong direction. Smuggling operations certainly entailed entering the city from its outskirts, and Cartier de l'Observatoire was positioned closer to the center of Trier compared to Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman. The district stood on the other side of the Srenzo River, effectively separating it from Avenue du Boulevard. Fernandez, a smuggler associated with Rat Cristo, turned around with a smile and explained, the hidden route we're taking leads to Cartier de l'Observatoire. We always deliver the goods to the warehouse there. Is that so? Franca slowed down and increased the distance between herself and Fernandez, who wore a brown felt hat. Since they hadn't entered the smuggling route yet, she lowered her voice and conversed with Lumian. I remember you traded your pugilist beyond her characteristic for 18,000 Vroldor with Gardner. You know it's a beyond her characteristic, right? Or rather, do you grasp a beyond her characteristic's true meaning? My sister mentioned it before. Lumian attributed his knowledge to Aurora. Franca was tall and had long legs, making it effortless for her to keep up with Lumian. Overwhelmed with emotion, she sighed and commented, it's fortunate to have someone to guide you. In the past, we were stumbling around like blind mice, relying on ourselves to figure things out. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made the choice. Her voice trailed off, ending with a long sigh. This reminded Lumian of a saying, either spoken by Aurora herself or relayed from Emperor Roselle's famous words, once you make a grave mistake, it will haunt you for a lifetime. Franca quickly regained her composure and whispered to Lumian, you've just entered the field of mysticism. Apart from knowledge, you're lacking much more. It's best not to be frugal with that sum of money. Use it to purchase a mystical item or a beyonder weapon to compensate for a hunter's limitations in mysticism. Otherwise, if Black Scorpion Roger truly seeks revenge against you, he won't need to go through much trouble. He can simply summon a few undead to hunt you down. If you have such intentions, I'll keep an eye out for you. Lumian chuckled. I've already made a purchase. So quickly. Franca nearly lost control of her voice, causing smuggler Fernandez to glance back. The carbide lamps cast intersecting shadows, obstructing Lumian's view of Fernandez's expression. He couldn't discern what thoughts they triggered. Lumian replied honestly, before joining the Savoy mob, I discovered a circle of beyonders through Psychic's gathering of mysticism enthusiasts. There, I exchanged the Vril door that the boss gave me for a mystical item. No wonder. Franca revealed a knowing expression and praised Lumian. Your mind is even sharper than I imagined. Hmm, is it an item that enhances your mysticism abilities? Lumian spoke frankly, a pair of lawyer glasses, but they seem to have been tainted by some strange power. Franca's brow furrowed ever so slightly as she interrupted Lumian. That's highly dangerous. I know, Lumian explained with a smile. But as long as I choose the right environment and take precautions, it won't be too risky. Besides, it offers excellent disguises and mysticism techniques. Lumian briefly recounted his urge to paint after donning the mystery prying glasses. Franca's ponytail bobbed behind her head. It's certainly useful. If I were in your shoes, I'd make the same choice. Only the leaders and thugs of the Poison Spur mob haven't really interacted with you. They only know you by your peculiar hair color. 
otherwise, they would have recognized your true identity by now. They wouldn't have needed to act themselves. They could have sought revenge by sharing your information and wanted posters with the police headquarters in the two cathedrals. Lumian chuckled. That's right. I can already set up a coffee meeting with Officer Everett. Franca's vibrant lake-like eyes sparkled as she said, You've shared so much with me about the mysticism gathering and your trump cards. Jenna even kept telling me how cunning and deceptive you are. Yet, you're truly sincere and straightforward. Of course, our relationship is different from others. I knew it. Muggle's brother isn't that kind of person. For a moment, Lumian felt a twinge of guilt. He spoke sincerely, yes, she completely misunderstood me. After chatting for a while, they finally reached the outskirts of Cartier de l'Observatoire's underground area and turned into a southward tunnel. Soon, Fernandez halted in front of a secondary well belonging to an abandoned quarry. He positioned the carbide lamp at the mouth of the well and gestured downward. Let's go in. With the aid of the blue light, Lumian peered down into the depths of the well. It had been neglected for a long time and appeared to be completely blocked by gravel. Using the recess in the well wall, ropes concealed in the shadows, and a basic iron ladder fastened to the moss, the three of them descended and swiftly reached the well's bottom. Fernandez moved a few seemingly heavy rocks, revealing a narrow tunnel at the well's edge, wide enough for one person. As they traversed the tunnel, which emitted a foul stench, the passageway ahead widened, as if they had entered another section of the quarry cave. The air grew eerily still and darkness enveloped them. The cave ceiling was damp, with scarce traces of moss. Lumian and Franca, each holding a carbide lamp, slowed their pace and meticulously examined the various signs along the smuggling route. After an indeterminate amount of time, Fernandez pointed to a nearby tunnel. Our boss and Baron Brignes weren't entirely fruitless. They discovered that the caravan's tracks vanished into thin air over there. It was a tunnel connecting two sections of the quarry cave. The path was strewn with rubble and potholes. In the distance, darkness prevailed, devoid of any light. Lumian and Franca swiftly located the relatively fresh footprints that had abruptly vanished. They squatted down, closely examining them. Only footprints going in. The ones coming back end right here. Most people returning carry heavy loads. Their footprints are deeper, distinctly different from when they came. We can rule out the possibility of them turning around and retracing their steps. Lumian swiftly made a series of deductions. Franca averted her gaze from her surroundings and stood up. No signs of a struggle. It's incredibly peculiar. She then motioned for Fernandez to move further away and wait in the quarry cave. As Fernandez's carbide lamp glow faded into the distance, Franca produced a small makeup box and a white handkerchief with a blue checkered pattern. The handkerchief belonged to Rat Christo's brother, Erkin, who had also gone missing during the smuggling operation. Franca placed the carbide lamp down, opened the light gold box, and ran her fingers over the mirror inside. Meanwhile, holding the handkerchief, she repeated in a whisper, Erkin's current whereabouts, Erkin's current whereabouts. The already dim tunnel grew even more stifling. The light from the two carbide lamps was pushed back by an invisible force, and the palm-sized mirror emitted a watery glow, as though revealing the depths of a dark river. Before Lumian could count to three, a scene materialized on the mirror's surface. Laborers lugging wooden crates and smugglers armed with revolvers and rifles trudged through the tunnel. As they progressed, the darkness behind them engulfed the space where the light had receded. Eventually, the carbide lamp's glow vanished from view, and the mirror's surface turned pitch black. They did vanish in this area. Franca ended her divination, her thin red lips pressed together. But I can't discern anything further. Lumian didn't suggest trying the mystery prying glasses. From his perspective, Trier's underground was a treacherous place, concealing all manner of secrets. There were ruins from the fourth epic, foul-smelling old bones catacombs with specific rules to follow, and the lingering Montsouris ghost that had defied eradication for years. They were all elements that instilled fear in those seeking the truth. 
If he were to use the mystery prying glasses to survey the surroundings, there was a high chance he would explode on the spot. In due time, Trier's underground would boast another legend entwined with the power of an evil god. Therefore, Lumian would lend a hand out of consideration for the Savoy mob's boss, but he wouldn't go all out and take unnecessary risks. After all, it was Rat Cristo who suffered the loss. What did it have to do with him, Lion Seal? Sal de Ball Breeze still had an abundant supply of alcohol. Franca glanced at him, not intending to make things difficult. Red Boots stowed away the makeup box and Erkin's handkerchief, picked up the carbide lamp, and said to Lumian, Let's return and find Fernandez. Let him guide us forward. Perhaps there are other clues left behind. All right. Lumian felt that Franca was merely fulfilling her duty as a member of the Savoy mob. The two turned around, carrying their carbide lamps, and ventured back toward the original quarry cave, plunging into the ever-deepening darkness. After taking a dozen steps, Lumian abruptly halted, his expression growing grave. What's the matter? Franca asked, perplexed. Lumian's voice resonated with gravity as he directed her attention to the scattered rubble and pockmarked ground. No more footprints. The smugglers' tracks from their departure and our own as we crossed have vanished. But there's a trail of footprints carrying a heavy load leading forward. Franca's heart skipped a beat. She peered ahead, coming to the realization that the ground lay in disarray. The footprints left by her, Lumian, and Fernandez in the tunnel had vanished, replaced by the sudden reappearance of the missing caravan's tracks out of thin air. Chapter 187 Shadow Damn it! Franca exclaimed with frustration, her voice filled with intensity. She scanned her surroundings, her mind racing as she pondered and speculated. Did we stumble upon the same thing that the missing caravan encountered? Entering that tunnel transported us to another world, erasing the original footprints? Did we vanish into thin air in Fernandez's eyes? Lumian had never faced such a situation before, nor had his sister Aurora written about anything similar in her novels. He couldn't make sense of what was happening. Lost in thought, his brows furrowed, Lumian suddenly heard Franca's conjecture. How imaginative. Lumian's initial reaction was a deep sigh before he contemplated the possibilities. The more he considered it, the more he realized that Franca's words were eerily similar to their current predicament. He knelt down and examined the footprints once again. Indeed, the footprints suddenly appear with the weight of something heavy, Lumian said, gesturing to a dozen steps behind him. That was the same spot they had previously traversed, yet there were no traces of their passage. Franca clenched her teeth and spoke up. It seems we truly have entered another world. Or rather, an underground realm. Damn it it. Why did this happen to us? Christo, Brignes, Simon, and Black encountered nothing and safely returned to the surface. Ah. Uh. Lumian suddenly felt a twinge of guilt at Red Boots' questioning of destiny. Crouched on the ground, he instinctively raised his hand and touched his left chest. Was this somehow inevitable? Yes, I can't dismiss the possibility that it's Franca's doing. Her sequence is higher than mine, and she carries a mystical item that may hold some secrets. Lumian quickly gathered himself. Franca looked down at her companion and muttered to herself, could it be linked to one of our sequences? Alternatively, it might be the adverse effect of your glasses. Lumian replied thoughtfully, Hunter and Demonis are neighboring pathways. In other words, if this problem stemmed from the convergence of Beyonder attributes, the two of them couldn't escape responsibility. Of course, at Lumian and Franca's level, the convergence of Beyonder attributes wouldn't have such obvious effects. However, Lumian recalled encountering two demonesses less than two weeks after arriving in Trier, and he was only a sequence eight. He suspected that the power of inevitability had transformed convergence into something fated to occur. Franca fell into deep thought. After a few seconds, she clenched her teeth and spoke. Perhaps this encounter is truly a problem with our pathway, but why did Christo's smuggling caravan enter this space and mysteriously vanish in reality? They've traversed this route countless times without any issues. Why is it different now? 
Damn it. That blasted rat must not have spilled all the beans. He wasn't just smuggling alcohol and firearms this time. There's something else, something linked to mysticism? Franco was reluctantly swayed. She exhaled and said, Now is not the time to dissect the cause. What matters is finding a way out. Sigh, why is underground trier intertwined with the abnormalities of the hunter and demonist pathways? Ah. Uh. Franca fell silent abruptly, as if recalling something. Have you figured something out? Lumian stood up. Franca pondered before responding. I don't know if your sister ever mentioned anything about the fourth epic. Ah, she might not even be aware. In short, Trier during the fourth epic served as the capital of the Tudor dynasty, and the Blood Emperor who ruled the empire was likely a high sequence beyonder of the Hunter Pathway. Furthermore, the Demonis family of that era shared a certain connection with one or several prominent nobles of the Tudor dynasty. It's reasonable for them to have left something behind in Trier. Demonis family? Lumian was taken aback by the term. Franca pursed her lips. In the fourth epic, the Demonis pathway was under the control of a specific family. Sigh, since I chose the assassin pathway, I could only do my best to gather relevant information, but I still lack substantial knowledge. Lumian steered the conversation back on track. Do you suspect that this space is linked to the sunken fourth epic trier? Yes, Franca replied vaguely, not ruling out the possibility. She contemplated for a moment before adding, the two churches must have dealt with the ruins to some extent. If we can find the corresponding node, we should be able to escape. Carrying the carbide lamp, Lumian once again examined the ground. Should we press on or turn back? Christo's smuggling caravan doesn't seem to have noticed anything amiss. They're still moving forward. Franca pondered for a few seconds and said, Let's go back to the spot where we entered this space and investigate. It's just a few steps away. We won't waste much time. All right. Lumian walked toward the center of the tunnel. Soon, he and Franca stood at the place where the smuggling caravan's tracks had materialized out of thin air, attempting to take a step forward. There was no trace of footprints ahead. After walking another dozen steps, the darkness deepened. Only Lumian's and Franca's footprints remained on the path. They had not returned to reality. Wait. Franca raised her right hand, signaling to halt. Let's turn back and head to the quarry cave we came from. We need to see if Fernandez has entered this space. Lumian didn't object. It could help them further determine the nature of the problem. Guided by the bluish glow of their carbide lamps, Lumian and Franca followed the tracks left by the smuggling caravan. Before long, they reached the quarry cave. A figure stood at the boundary of light and darkness, with its back turned towards them. Franca exclaimed with delight, Fernandez. It seemed that the smuggler had also entered this space. Perhaps the problem didn't lie with her or seal. However, Franca's expression tightened as soon as she finished speaking. Simultaneously, Lumian spoke in a deep voice, something's off. Fernandez, the smuggler, had been carrying a carbide lamp. There was no way he would just stand there in the darkness. In the next moment, the figure turned around. Under the illumination of Lumian and Franca's carbide lamps, a bloodied face came into view. The man had short flaxen hair, thick brown eyebrows, and lake blue eyes. His lips were thin, and his appearance was unremarkable. Yet, his eyes radiated indescribable malice and hatred. At that moment, sticky blood stained the man's face, as if it might drip at any moment. It's not Fernandez. Why does he look familiar? Lumian assessed the situation as he reached for the black revolver concealed under his arm. With a clang, Franca's carbide lamp fell to the ground. Startled by the noise and the flickering light, the figure darted into the darkness and disappeared into a tunnel connecting to the cavern. What's wrong? Lumian turned to Franca. As a Sequence 7 Beyonder, a member of a secret organization and an experienced combatant, she shouldn't be displaying such abnormal behavior and exaggerated reactions. Franca gazed into the darkness for a few seconds before speaking, that. That was my past self. Your past self, when you were still a man. 
Lumian was alarmed. An unsettling feeling crept over him as he asked in a low voice, You mean, before you drank the witch potion? Yes. Franca bent down and retrieved her carbide lamp, confusion and fear etched on her face. I thought no one in this world would remember that face except for me. Why? Why am I seeing it here? Is it generated from my memories? Can't our memories be kept secret in this space? Wouldn't that be a good thing? Lumian's initial reaction was one of excitement. If this space could reveal the hidden memories of his subconscious, he could begin piecing together the truth of the Kordu disaster. As for whether this space might intrude on something it shouldn't and risk severe corruption and damage, he paid it no mind. With his carbide lamp and revolver in hand, Lumian cautiously circled the empty quarry. He found no other figures or anything related to his past. Disheartened, he expressed his disappointment to Franca, I couldn't find my past self. Could it be that it's not a memory from the past, but rather something from the future? Franca suggested returning to the secondary well that had brought them to this level. By searching for more anomalies along the way, they might be able to infer the nature of this space and find a way to leave. Side by side, they traversed the quarry cave, following the footprints left by the smuggling caravan, heading towards the edge of Cartier de l'Observatoire. As time went on, Lumian and Franca noticed something on the ground almost simultaneously. They were scattered droplets of blood, mingled with the disordered footprints of the smuggling caravan. Are the abnormalities starting to manifest? Franca whispered. Lumian nodded. If we proceed further, we might encounter those people. He glanced at Franca and added, although they may no longer be human. Franca scoffed. Are you trying to frighten me? Do you think that will scare me? Whether they're corpses or monsters, it's within my expectations. Remember, the most terrifying thing in this world is the unknown. Just as Franca finished speaking, Lumian's expression froze, illuminated by the glow of the carbide lamp. You're still trying to frighten me. Before Franca could finish her sentence, she felt something warm sliding from her nose and falling to the ground. It was a drop of bright red blood. Chapter 188 Confidence Damn it! Franca couldn't help but blurt out her usual modal particle. With a quick swipe of her index finger across her nose, her hand revealed a bright red stain. The sight alone sent a shiver down her spine. Franca snorted. In an instant, black flames flickered in her nostrils, fingers, and the blood on the ground, swiftly vanishing into thin air. Catching Lumian's gaze, Franca, slightly contorted from the pain, forced herself to enlighten him. We can't leave our blood in this unknown place. Otherwise, unimaginable horrors may unfold. Hey, why are you unharmed? From Franca's perspective, she surpassed Seal in terms of sequence and experience. There was no reason for him to emerge unscathed while she suffered. Perhaps I'm fine for now, Lumian patronizingly responded, pondering thoughtfully. Maybe the shadow we encountered represented the old you, not the old me. So why did we come across the old me and not the old you? Franca eyed Lumian suspiciously. Could this bloke be hiding another secret? Lumian pondered for a moment before answering. Perhaps this space is more intertwined with demonesses. Could be. Franca fell into deep contemplation. After a few seconds, she pointed towards the footprints and blood droplets on the ground and suggested, let's catch up and investigate. The current condition of those people could reveal our future and help us prepare in advance. Lumian responded with action, walking into the darkness that swallowed the footprints and blood droplets. The yellowish-blue light of the carbide lamp quietly resisted the encroaching darkness. As they tracked further, the abnormalities on their bodies became increasingly apparent. Warm blood began to trickle from Lumian's nose, while crimson liquid seeped from Franca's eyes, gums, skin, and ears. With her black flames, not a drop of blood remained. Finally, they returned to the secondary well, where the tracks of the smuggling caravan and the slowly congealing blood abruptly vanished. Whether it was the tunnel leading to the secondary well or the path to other areas, there were no traces left. They vanished again? 
Franca, her face enveloped in black flames, frowned. Lumian, his nose sealed by the black flames, took a deep breath and smiled. This might be our end. When the blood reaches a certain point, our bodies will gradually fade away. Lumian chuckled. So what if I do? Too many negative emotions will only cloud my thinking. Sometimes, I reckon you're more mature than me. Frank aside. Did you just figure that out? Lumian naturally wouldn't mention that he was both sincerely pondering the issue and confident. Compared to Kordu, trapped in an endless loop, at least there was no sign of terrifying power in this place. Moreover, Lumian didn't need to rack his brain to come up with several escape strategies. The first option was to take a risky move by using the mystery prying glasses to explore the surroundings from different angles and locate an exit. Secondly, he could try throwing out Mr. K's finger to establish a connection, hoping it would create a passageway. Thirdly, summoning Madame Hila or the messenger of Madame Magician was another possibility. If it succeeded, it would mean that this place wasn't entirely cut off from the spirit world. The two ladies might have a way to forcefully extract Lumian and Franca. Fourthly, if all else failed, he could set up an altar and offer prayers to the mysterious ruler beyond the Grey Fog. Such a bizarre space couldn't restrict a great entity. Even the cycle of fate orchestrated by the evil god couldn't shield them from his watchful eye, let alone this place. Lastly, if the great entity remained unresponsive, Lumian could perform a ritual and beseech for a boon. He could activate the black thorn symbol on his chest, allowing the sealed evil god's corruption to amplify. This disruption might create a vulnerability in the workings of this space. You can be as calm and composed as me when you have numerous untried methods and believe there's a high chance of escaping this place. Lumian criticized inwardly, feeling somewhat perplexed. It felt like he had forgotten something important, but it eluded his memory momentarily. Franca retrieved a light gold makeup box, opened it, and placed it on the ground. Her form swiftly faded away, leaving no trace behind. The aqueous light within the palm-sized mirror flickered, illuminating Franca's figure. How magical! Lumian sighed, marveling at the sight. Franca glanced around within the mirror for a few seconds before vanishing. She reappeared across from Lumian, shaking her head, and uttered, I can't find a way out by relying on the mirror. Without awaiting Lumian's response, the witch attempted several more methods, but all proved futile. Finally, she caressed the mirror inside the makeup box, seeking guidance from her spirituality. In such a place, she hesitated to perform magic mirror divination, fearing a perilous and dreadful connection. The way out. The way out. Franca repeated the divination phrase in Hermes several times, and the mirror darkened, resembling a moonlit lake. The shimmering aqueous light reflected a figure. It was Lumian, wearing a wide-brimmed round hat, a white shirt, a brown jacket, and dark pants. Black flames flickered subtly at his nose. Ah. Uh. Franca turned around, looking at her companion by her side. She furrowed her brow slightly and stated, Finding the exit with your glasses? Isn't that too dangerous? Congratulations on finally uncovering the simplest among my five solutions. Lumian pondered and remarked, this is no longer the true underground trier, nor does it seem to be directly linked to the ruins of the fourth epic. As long as we protect ourselves, we should be able to endure any peril. Protect. Franca repeated the word with a smile. I happen to excel at that. With a swift motion of her right hand, she extinguished the black flames on Lumian's nose. After a few seconds, a drop of bright red liquid trickled down, caught by Franca's open palm. Then, she conjured fresh black flames, sealing Lumian's nostrils once again. The mild burning sensation was tolerable for Am's monk Lumian. He asked cautiously, What are you doing with my blood, a curse? Franca chuckled. Do I need to go through all this trouble just to kill you? I'll perform a mirror substitution to shield you from the danger of using those glasses. As she spoke, she retrieved a palm-sized mirror and smeared Lumian's blood upon it. She has so many mirrors. Are they the essence of a witch's spells? Lumian observed Franca's busy movements, enlightened and slightly envious. 
Franca turned her head and addressed him, Give me two strands of your hair. Without hesitation, Lumian plucked two strands and handed them over. A black flame appeared in Franca's hand, incinerating the golden strands. She sprinkled the ashes onto the mirror's surface and stroked it with her black-flamed palm while murmuring an inaudible incantation. When the black flames suddenly receded into the mirror, the traces of blood and hair vanished. Do not stray more than thirty meters away from me, Franca cautioned, holding the seemingly ordinary mirror. Lumian nodded and retrieved the mystery prying glasses from his pocket. He placed the brown gold-rimmed glasses on the bridge of his nose, but his right hand remained gripping the mirror holder, ready to remove the glasses at a moment's notice. Almost simultaneously, Lumian beheld a multitude of scenes, faces concealed in darkness, pallid and ferocious, drenched in blood. A mass of dark hair floated amidst the shadows, comprised of hundreds or perhaps thousands of strands, extending in various directions. Lingering figures, rock walls shimmering with aqueous light, and an impenetrable darkness. In the pond-like puddle, a colossal, swollen, and pallid face lurked beneath the lightless surface, peering outward. There was a glistening cave. Light. Cave. Lumian's intuition instantaneously struck, compelling his dizzy mind to focus on the edge of the scene. The luminous-filled cave rapidly enlarged, revealing a dimly lit passage beyond. As the cave drew nearer, Lumian realized it was merely a reflection in a mirror. Its surface was solid and inaccessible. The mirror sank to the depths of the lightless pool. Suddenly, the colossal, swollen, and pallid face swiftly expanded before Lumian's eyes, consuming his field of vision. Lumian's sight darkened, and he nearly lost consciousness. Vaguely, he saw his flesh attempting to depart from his skeleton. Whack! Lumian heard a crisp shattering sound, and his mind cleared. He swiftly removed the mystery prying glasses and retched. After he regained his composure, Franca inquired with concern, Are you all right? At some point, the mirror in her hand had shattered into countless fragments, scattered across the ground. Lumian took a deep breath and replied, I'm fine now. He extended his finger, indicating a specific direction. Over a hundred meters from the tunnel, there lies a massive puddle. And at the puddle's depths, you'll find a mirror. That mirror reflects a cave, which leads to a path of light. However, be warned, for within that puddle lurks a perilous monster. I nearly died when I beheld its visage. Franca listened in silence, her mutterings a mixture of confusion and frustration. God damn it, could this place truly be connected to a demoness? Chapter 189 Cooperation Observing Lumian's perplexed gaze, Franca provided a succinct explanation, one of the core abilities of the Demonus pathway revolves around mirrors and manipulating the world within them. When I suspected that this place might be connected to the Demonus or Hunter pathway, I pondered whether we inadvertently stepped into a certain location within the mirror world. Thus, I attempted to use the makeup mirror to see if I could escape through it. As you witnessed, it proved fruitless. Because of this, I have tentatively dismissed the notion of being in a mirror world or encountering a relic belonging to a demoness. However, now we have stumbled upon a submerged mirror that likely conceals an exit. So, you suspect that this is a specific place within the mirror world, restricted to certain mirrors? Lumian attempted to grasp Franca's line of thinking. Exactly, Franca replied with a gentle nod. But what perplexes me is how we found ourselves here without encountering anything resembling a mirror. Perhaps my conjecture is incorrect, or only partially true. Lumian pondered for a moment, hoping to glean some knowledge. He posed a sincere question, what exactly is a mirror world? Franca grabbed the ponytail at the back of her head. Explaining it to you is a challenge since I am not entirely certain myself. Allow me to elucidate based on my understanding. In mysticism, mirrors possess distinct symbolic meanings, such as one's reflection or an entrance to another realm. The former suggests that we can use mirrors to create substitutes, while the latter alludes to a mirror world. It is often associated with terror, mystery, horror, and the bizarre. 
I cannot ascertain whether there are hidden elements or if it truly represents an alternate dimension. However, I do know that the mirror world connects to various mirror-like entities. It could potentially point to spaces that are typically inaccessible. As my sequence progresses, I should be capable of utilizing the mirror world to swiftly traverse different locations. Lumian recalled the recent events and allowed his imagination to run wild. Could the version of you we saw be a reflection left behind in the mirror world from a previous encounter, before you became a witch? That would explain why I have never encountered my past self. That is a plausible explanation, but I haven't come across anything peculiar. Franca deliberated for a moment. If that is the case, we must hurry to the puddle immediately. The exit is most likely there. We can no longer afford to proceed cautiously or wait any longer. As I mentioned earlier, the mirror world harbors eerie and terrifying phenomena. If we linger here any further, I dread to imagine what might befall us. Very well. Lumian maintained his composure. Franca turned and sprinted, with Lumian closely following her. As the witch ran, it appeared as though she employed some form of ability. Small patches of frost materialized beneath her feet, causing a sharp reduction in friction. Her body seemed weightless as she gracefully glided through the dim quarry cave and into the depths of the underground tunnel. Utilizing all his strength as a hunter and dancer, Lumian struggled to keep pace with Franca and avoid being left behind. In the wintry chill, a thin layer of ice gradually formed on the walls of the surrounding rocks. Upon the icy surface, visages stained with blood emerged. Their countenances contorted, eyes brimming with hatred, resembling vengeful specters emerging from the depths of hell. Among them was the previous incarnation of Franca, when she still appeared as a man. After sprinting for a while, Lumian and Franca caught sight of the puddle. As the light from the carbide lamp cast its glow, the puddle's surface shimmered with a tinge of yellowish blue. Is this it? Franca halted abruptly. In that moment, every fiber of his being throbbed with pain, as if his body was on the brink of bursting, save for the fiery sensation in his nasal cavity. Holding the carbide lamp tightly, Franca cautiously approached the puddle. The challenge now is how to elude the monster you encountered and locate the mirror. Regrettably, I cannot yet traverse between mirrors. I can only remain inside for a few fleeting seconds. I will divert its attention and keep it occupied for a while. Why don't you dive underwater and retrieve the mirror? Lumian spoke plainly, I don't believe you stand a chance against it. It nearly overwhelmed me when I caught a glimpse of it, dot. Though Franca felt a twinge of annoyance and frustration, she had to acknowledge that Lumian spoke the truth. With her sequence and mystical item, she could still hold her ground even against a beyond or one rank higher. However, judging by the monster's display, it far surpassed her by more than a single rank. After a brief pause, Franca clenched her teeth and uttered, Even if I am outmatched, my skills in escape and self-preservation are formidable. I should be able to hold out against it for more than ten seconds. If you can retrieve the mirror within that time frame, we can make our escape. Lumian let out a chuckle. We shouldn't risk our lives just yet. I have a plan to stall that monster for 10 to 20 seconds without taking excessive risks. And I trust you can locate that mirror, correct? I'm capable. I have a unique method of detecting mirrors, Franca eyed Lumian skeptically. Are you truly up to the task? Is there genuinely no danger involved? In theory, the risks are minimal, Lumian replied calmly. Simultaneously, he silently added, if the risks prove too great, I'll find an alternative. Mr. K, Madam Gila, Madam Magician, the Great Being, and the Power of Inevitability are all viable options. Franca wasted no time and pursed her lips as she spoke, all right, just to be safe, I'll create a mirror substitute for you. Naturally, Lumian had no objections to something that could effectively reduce the risk. After Franca produced a small mirror and crafted the corresponding substitute, Lumian gripped the ritual silver dagger and encircled the pond-like puddle, creating a spiritual barrier. Throughout the process, he maintained a distance of four to five meters from the water's edge, fearing the monster would drag him under. Putting away the ritual silver dagger, Lumian turned to Franca with a genuine smile. 
What comes next involves one of my secrets. Could you turn around? Very well. Franco was content with his straightforwardness. She inwardly sighed once more. Does Jenna misunderstand Seal? As Franca turned around, Lumian placed the carbide lamp aside and began the summoning dance. He intended to summon the monster, but he wouldn't allow it to possess him. Lumian believed that the higher the level of a peculiar creature, the more aware it would be of the corruption within his body. This made it less inclined to attach itself to him. In other words, as long as he refrained from issuing commands that would influence the monster, it was likely to observe the summoning dance eagerly, waiting for an opportunity to attack. However, it was intimidated by the seal and the corruption and dared not act upon its thoughts. It would only truly engage him once the dance concluded. The summoning dance lasted for 20 to 30 seconds, ample time for Franca to submerge herself and locate the mirror. As long as Lumian could escape this world before the monster attacked, there would be no further issues. Of course, if he couldn't harness the corresponding powers of nature in this place and allow the summoning dance to take effect, he could always employ an alternative method. Amidst the contorted and frenzied dance, Lumian's spirituality stirred the forces of nature, forming a connection that dissipated into the surroundings, only to be obstructed by the spiritual barrier. After a few seconds, ripples appeared on the surface of the puddle, and a pallid figure emerged, floating above the water. It bore a resemblance to a human, with an inflated body and a gargantuan face occupying half its form. The monster floated toward Lumian and came to a stop in close proximity. Lumian dared not gaze directly at it. With his eyes half shut, he called out, Hurry! Without hesitation, Franca discarded the carbide lamp, took two steps, and leaped into the water. With a splash, water splattered around. A cold, damp sensation penetrated Franca's skin as near darkness enveloped her vision. Guided by the faint glow of the carbide lamp seeping through the water, Franca swiftly descended to the depths. Suddenly, dark creatures resembling seaweed extended their hair-like tendrils, slithering around Franca as if alive. Franca paid them no mind and continued her descent. Just as the seaweed was about to touch her, it unexpectedly burst into black flames. The black flames burned silently underwater, showing no signs of extinguishing. The seaweed didn't turn to ash, but their consciousness was snuffed out. They floated in the water, swaying with the currents. Farther away, a multitude of seaweed continued to surge forward, obstructed by layers of condensed frost. Beside the puddle, Lumian, engrossed in the summoning dance, did not look at the monster. However, he heard a sound akin to a bubble popping. A putrid odor wafted towards him, accompanied by an enveloping chill. An image flashed across Lumian's mind, the bloated monster with its enormous face was less than a step away from him, almost clinging to his back. He could even perceive its breath. Hiss. Lumian instinctively gasped, refusing to interrupt the summoning dance. In the water, Franca, having dived deeper, finally sensed the presence of the mirror. Her form suddenly faded, vanishing from her original position. Franca's figure swiftly materialized on the ancient silver mirror resting silently on the seabed. She retrieved the artifact and swam towards the surface, a look of joy adorning her face. She had just confirmed that this mirror truly led to the underground tunnel in the outside world. Beside the puddle, Lumian was filled with anxiety as he kept his gaze fixed on the water's surface. The summoning dance was nearing its end and the bloated monster drew closer, its flesh almost brushing against his skin. If Franca did not emerge soon, he would resort to using Mr. K's finger. Just then, Franca reached the shore, holding the mirror, and leapt up amidst the splashing water. Avoiding eye contact with the monster, she lowered her head and hurried to Lumian's side, gripping his wrist. Simultaneously, both of them turned ethereal, while the ancient mirror clattered to the ground. A scene unfolded upon the mirror's surface, Franca grasping Lumian's hand and leading him through a short, dark tunnel to an illuminated cave before leaping out. Amidst flickering lights and shadows, Lumian realized he stood upon a dim path, with distant light seeping in. Franca retrieved the mirror that had served as his substitute and noticed countless cracks marring its surface, on the verge of shattering. That was a close call. 
she sighed sincerely. Chapter 190 Unexpected Development Lumian glanced at the shattered mirror in Franca's hand, relief and confusion evident on his face. But I don't feel like I was being attacked. His summoning dance still had five to six seconds left before Franca grabbed his wrist. Franca cleared her throat and assumed the stance of a teacher. Some mysticism techniques are undetectable. The moment you feel attacked is the moment of your death. Could it be that the monster secretly influenced me when I paused the summoning dance to enter the mirror for those brief seconds? Lumian nodded thoughtfully. Yes, the bleeding in that space caught us by surprise. We had no idea how to prevent it. As he spoke, he looked at Franca's face and noticed her smooth skin, devoid of any scars. It was impossible to tell that blood had seeped out from multiple places. Franca touched her face and pondered before saying, It's indeed very bizarre. But we did lose some blood. As a witch, I have a mystical perception of the amount of my blood. In other words, the damage we suffered in the special mirror world isn't fake. It's just that we didn't leave any wounds. Damn it, I didn't bring the carbide lamp. As she spoke, she turned around and searched through a pile of gravel on the side of the dim tunnel. Lumian didn't have time to retrieve his carbide lamp either. He could only observe Franca's every move with the help of the distant light. In less than ten seconds, Franca pulled out a mirror from the rubble. The mirror appeared to be made of pure silver. The patterns on both sides were mysterious and sinister, and its surface was dark and lifeless, as if time had eroded it. As expected, there's a corresponding mirror in reality. Franca did her best to avoid being reflected in the silver mirror with its classic design. She also instructed Lumian, in unsafe places or when encountering strange occurrences, try not to look into the mirror if you can. Otherwise, something terrifying might happen. We mustn't touch such mysterious and evil objects of unknown origin. Lumian, who hadn't mentioned to Franca that he couldn't look in the mirror after using the mystery prying glasses to disguise himself, nodded. I understand that the exit is a mirror. What I can't figure out is how we entered that space without noticing. We didn't come across anything along the way. That baffles me too. Franca covered the surface of the classic styled silver mirror with a handkerchief and other items. She stood up and said, This thing seems to be closely related to the Demonis pathway. How about you give it to me? I'll find something valuable to compensate you later. No problem, Lumian chuckled. You don't have to ask. I can't beat you. Franca clicked her tongue and said, No, the spoils of war must be distributed fairly. Otherwise, there will surely be conflicts within the team. I used to be taken advantage of like this in the past. If it weren't for my good nature and not holding grudges, I would have sought revenge long ago. Why does it sound like you're cussing me, madam? Lumian silently muttered. If someone took his spoils and exploited him for no reason, and his strength was inferior to the other party, although he wouldn't say anything on the spot, he would definitely find a way to seek revenge later. He wouldn't simply forgive the other party so easily. Stowing away the classic-styled silver mirror, Franca gestured toward the source of light. Let's go and have a look over there. We might come across the quarry police or other smugglers. We can ask for directions. That's right. Lumian agreed wholeheartedly. If it weren't for that, the Montsouris ghost would have been eradicated long ago by the official Beyonders. The two of them proceeded through the tunnel, guided by the faint glow, staying alert for any potential attacks. Before long, they reached a quarry cave. In the center of the cave stood a figure wearing a felt hat. The light emanated from the carbide lamp he held in his hand. Ah. Uh. Franca recognized him and called out, Fernandez. She realized that the figure was Fernandez, the smuggler who had been leading the way for them. This appeared to be the quarry cave where they had arranged to meet him. Fernandez turned around, surprised, and asked, How did you come from there? I've been waiting for nearly half an hour, but you didn't show up. I even went to the spot where the footprints vanished to search for you, but you were nowhere to be found. Lumian and Franca exchanged glances and nodded. Indeed, 
they had spent nearly half an hour in the special mirror world. Franca approached Fernandez and casually explained, we stumbled upon some clues and pursued them. However, we ended up circling back here and encountered an ambush on the way. We lost our carbide lamps. What clues? Fernandez asked, pleasantly surprised. Franca smiled. We'll discuss it with Cristo directly. Fernandez knew his place well and didn't pry any further. He led the two of them back along the same path they had taken before. They ascended the secondary well and entered the underground section corresponding to Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman, finally arriving at the exit en rue Anarchy. Only when Lumian and Franca laid eyes on street peddlers, children picking up fruit peels, homeless people huddling in corners, and the bustling crowd, did they truly feel as though they had escaped from that strange realm and returned to the real world. After boarding the carriage that Rat Cristo had sent for them, Lumian glanced at Franca and asked in a low voice, What should we say later? Fernandez knew the carriage driver and had taken a seat beside him, so he wasn't in the carriage. Franca chuckled. We'll simply say that we entered an unknown space, discovered some traces, and managed to escape using my mirror magic. The rest has nothing to do with Cristo. Lumian didn't say another word. He closed his eyes and recalled his encounters in the special mirror world. The four-wheeled carriage swiftly turned onto Avenue du Marque, hurtling towards Suet's steam locomotive. It veered into the alley that led to the depot. Rat Cristo awaited them in the nearby warehouse. Before long, Lumian and Franca caught sight of the rat-like smuggler. Cristo approached them with a grin and exclaimed, Thank you, by steam. Erkin and the others are back. Erkin. Franca's eyes narrowed as she blurted out, The missing caravan has returned? Erkin, Cristo's younger brother responsible for the smuggling caravan, had vanished previously, and Franca still had his divination handkerchief. And now he's back. What the fuck was going on? Cristo nodded, still smiling. Indeed, the goods have returned as well. They arrived over an hour ago. Over an hour ago? Wasn't that the same time when we discovered the spot where the footprints vanished and entered that peculiar mirror world? Lumian frowned, a hint of confusion stirring within him. It was only because he had already experienced unbelievable phenomena like the time loop and the vivid dream that Lumian managed to keep his composure, unlike Franca. Observing the surprised and perplexed expressions of Franca and Seal, Christo smiled and stated, I'll let Erkin explain it himself. He turned and headed a few steps toward the entrance of the warehouse, calling out, Erkin, come out for a moment. Seizing the opportunity, Franca tilted her head slightly and whispered to Lumian, this is highly unusual. Lumian's lips curled into a smile as he lowered his voice and replied, I even suspect that Rat and the others conspired to set a trap for us. They used the disappearance of the goods as bait to lure us underground into that perilous realm. Franca studied him, amusement in her eyes, and remarked, You don't have much trust in others, do you? Lumian spoke candidly, The dancer's salaries make giant and Baron Brignes resentful, and I possess the coveted Sal de Ball breeze. Only Rat has no conflict of interest with us, so he was made to intervene. Franca fell into deep thought, seriously considering the possibility of being deceived. In that moment, Lumian grinned. This is merely a conjecture. It doesn't account for the footprints and other traces in the mirror world. As soon as he finished speaking, a man who appeared to be under thirty years old emerged from the warehouse. He was not particularly tall, standing at about 1.6 meters. Apart from the absence of rat-like whiskers, he bore a striking resemblance to Cristo. It is indeed Erkin, Franca whispered to Lumian. Then, she turned her gaze to Cristo and Erkin, who were approaching together, and inquired, Erkin, what happened? Erkin's dark blue eyes revealed a blend of fear and joy. We entered a peculiar world within a section of the tunnel and couldn't find a way out. In the afternoon, while we were searching in all directions, we suddenly found ourselves back on our original path. Did our entry provide them an opportunity to escape? Franca had a suspicion. Lumian stared at Erkin, his expression devoid of any emotion, as if assessing an adversary who might bring him calamity. In his mind, 
he recalled the droplets of blood left behind on the ground of the mirror world. Gradually, they coalesced, staining a whole area crimson. Could someone who had lost so much blood truly return alive? Franca had evidently pondered this as well. She regarded Erkin and asked, What happened to you there? Erkin couldn't help but tremble. We started bleeding inexplicably. Towards the end, many were on the verge of death. By steam, we managed to find the exit in time. As soon as we emerged, we recovered. Is that so? Franca felt that Erkin, adorned with the sacred emblem, was relaying his account in line with her own experience and could be explained. Thus, she could only temporarily set aside her doubts. Beside them, Rat Christo cast a glance their way and invited them with a smile, regardless of the circumstances, I must express my gratitude. Would you like to sample the most authentic Savoy roast chicken? All right, Lumian responded on Franca's behalf. Christo produced a set of keys and tossed them to his brother, Erkin. Go to my office and bring all the spices to the kitchen. All right. Erkin received the key and ascended the iron stairs embedded in the outer wall of the warehouse. With his left hand, he inserted one of the keys into the door of Christo's office and turned it to unlock it. Franca was momentarily taken aback before muttering to herself, I recall that Erkin habitually uses his right hand. Why would he awkwardly open the door with his left hand when he wasn't holding anything? Hearing Franca's remark, Christo nodded and replied, Indeed, he is right-handed. Chapter 191 Suspicions Right hand Franca's body jolted with a sudden shudder. As a witch, she was well acquainted with the intricacies of mirrors, attuned to their peculiarities. And one thing she knew for certain was this, when a person gazed into a mirror, their reflection would be inverted from left to right. The situation at hand was baffling. After Erkin, who habitually favored his right hand, had ventured into the enigmatic mirror world and returned, he had inexplicably switched to using his left hand. Franca and Lumian, however, had not experienced such a change. What could this mean? Franca trembled with unease. Just then, Christo reappeared at the warehouse's bottom floor, bellowing instructions to Erkin on the upper level. He demanded that Erkin retrieve his prized white elixir wine. Seizing the opportunity, Lumian leaned in close to Franca and whispered into her ear, Have you noticed any connections? You thought of it too? Franca replied, taken aback. It was a challenge to detect Erkin's abnormality and grasp the underlying possibilities without extensive knowledge of mysticism and encounters with the beyonder world. Lumian continued in a hushed tone, judging by the amount of blood present in that space, I find it hard to believe that a regular person could have survived. From the start, I suspected something was amiss with Erkin and the other members of the caravan. Furthermore, you mentioned that the peculiar mirror world contains your past self, the reflection of who you once were. A mirrored image is left-right reversed in reality. Do you think the Erkin in the mirror has replaced the original Erkin? Franca fell into silence, pondering the implications. I dread to consider such a horrifying possibility, but the circumstances align more and more with your theory. I need to be certain. As they conversed, Erkin descended from the warehouse's upper level, clutching a sack filled with various spices and two bottles of white elixir wine. He made his way towards a nearby grayish-white, two-story building. The structure served as a dining room and kitchen for Rat Christo's subordinates. On the surface, Christo presented himself as a merchant. He owned multiple companies specializing in trade and providing storage facilities. Franca approached Christo with a solemn expression and asked, Are you absolutely sure that is truly Erkin? Christo blurted out in surprise, Why are you asking such a peculiar question? Of course, it's Erkin. By steam, how could I not recognize my own brother? My kids are also quite fond of him. They find nothing unfamiliar about him. Franca pondered for a moment before smiling faintly. I can't help but feel that something might go awry after venturing into that bizarre realm. Franca chuckled. You're not a beyonder yet. Before you took over the smuggling business, didn't you anticipate that those above you would follow certain customs and pay extra for particular matters? 
Christo fell silent, uncertain of how to respond. Franca then said, I'll help you confirm whether anything is amiss with those individuals. Franca retrieved her makeup box and Erkin's handkerchief, preparing to perform a divination in front of Rat Christo. Erkin's whereabouts. Erkin's whereabouts. As Franca chanted in Hermes, her eyes darkened, and she gently caressed the surface of the makeup mirror. Lumian observed as the mirror shimmered with watery ripples of light. Soon, a scene materialized within its depths. Erkin, dressed in a blue shirt, stood near the kitchen, engaged in conversation with the chef. I knew everything would go smoothly. Rat Christo chuckled. He then gestured towards the warehouse. I have some matters to attend to. You can explore the area on your own or wait for me in the dining room. Once the short-statured leader of the smugglers had entered the warehouse, Lumian turned to Franca. It appears that the real Erkin might be dead. Thus, the divination results indicated the person who originally belonged to the mirror world. Do you still think something is amiss with Erkin and the others? Franca furrowed her brow. And if not? Lumian laughed. Should we cover our eyes and ears and pretend we didn't see, hear, or discover anything? Franca pondered for a moment before responding, perhaps, because I'm using mirror divination, it will be easier to pinpoint the individual within the mirror. I shall attempt another method. Surveying the warehouse area, she picked up a short wooden stick and held it before her, pressing down from the top. After uttering a similar divination statement, the wooden stick snapped, pointing directly at the grayish-white, two-story building that housed the kitchen and dining room. Erkin was there. Franca fell silent momentarily before declaring, let me see if that mirror can be of any assistance. She referred to the classic styled silver mirror that served as a gateway to the peculiar realm, hoping to employ it in banishing all the monsters that had emerged from within. Lumian eagerly trailed behind Franca as they entered the dining room. Their eyes were immediately drawn to a woman wearing a grayish-green dress. She appeared to be in her late twenties, holding the hands of a boy and a girl. Tears of joy streamed down her face as she embraced Erkin, who had just emerged from the kitchen. You're finally back. Pepe. Pepe, play with me. Amidst the clamor of excited voices, Erkin's face radiated sheer happiness. His brows and eyes reflected pure joy. Dot. Franca paused in her steps, silently observing the heartwarming family reunion for a long while. Eventually, she let out a sigh and remarked, let's give it a little more time. Lumian maintained his smile. Are you finding it hard to bear? Frank aside. The real Erkin might already be dead. After all, this is his reflection. If I were to expose his true nature now, kill him, or force him back into the mirror, not only would his wife and children fail to show gratitude, but they would also despise me. You're right. Lumian chuckled. In any case, if anything untoward happens in the future, whether someone lives or dies is not our concern. We simply need to exercise caution. Why should we appear as the villains? No one will thank you for it. Yes, let's avoid Rat Christo and the others for the time being. If we don't encounter them, it's as if nothing has occurred. Franca's inner conflict grew. She didn't know what the mirror's reflection would do after replacing the person in reality. What if his kindness morphed into cruelty, and his affection transformed into hatred? Franca, unable to reach a decision, could only gaze at Lumian and sigh. Your words are rather cold-hearted. She began to think that Jenna's assessment of Seal held some truth. Madam, am I not merely following your inclinations to help you convince yourself? Lumian responded, a mix of annoyance and amusement evident in his tone. Franca offered a sheepish smile. How do you propose we handle this situation? Lumian glanced at Erkin, who was recounting his strange encounter to his wife and children as if it were someone else's story. We should have someone write a letter and report this matter to the police headquarters or a cathedral. The letter should merely state that Rat Christo's brother, Erkin, ventured into an underground realm with a group of individuals and remained absent for the majority of the day. Upon resurfacing, their dominant hand had changed. Official Beyonders have encountered numerous anomalies, so they should be familiar with the underground. 
they will likely deduce what has befallen Erkin and his companions. As for how they handle it, that's their responsibility. We need not worry. If they refrain from harming Erkin and the others, the mirror person poses no threat. They can serve as replacements for the deceased originals. And if those monsters are eliminated, we won't have to confront pain and animosity, let alone compensate anyone. In short, we must trust the officials and the church. Emperor Roselle once mentioned that a gentleman wouldn't feel inclined to dine on an animal they were familiar with after it had been slaughtered. However, if they remained unaware, it wouldn't be an issue. They could enjoy their meal blissfully. The same principle applies in this case. Lumian couldn't recall the exact words, so he did his best to convey the sentiment in his own words. Franca pondered deeply for a few moments before being convinced. You're right. She glanced at Lumian. You don't sound like a mob leader at all. A true mob leader knows how to manipulate the authorities. Lumian grinned. Franca chuckled and remarked, Do I have to address you as godfather from now on? Without giving Lumian a chance to inquire further, she swiftly added, A mob's godfather. Yes, for now, you don't have the means. I'll take responsibility for leaking the information to the officials. Mob's godfather. Lumian had heard his sister mention this as the subject of her next book. He grasped the general idea, but couldn't help feeling a tad disheartened. In the ensuing hours, he and Franca joyously attended a banquet hosted by Rat Cristo, engaging in lively conversations with Erkin and the other smugglers. Lumian couldn't stop raving about the delectable Savoy roasted chicken. It was seasoned with an array of spices, its surface glistening with a similar concoction. The golden skin boasted juiciness, tenderness, and an aromatic essence. He sliced a piece of the crispy skin-covered meat and let it soak in the succulent juices for a moment before savoring it. The experience was pure bliss, rendering it impossible for him to cease indulging. As the banquet drew to a close, Franca noticed only a handful of people remained at the dining table. She turned to Rat Cristo, a smile playing on her lips. Come closer. I have something to ask you. Cristo, momentarily taken aback, shifted his chair nearer to Franca and responded with a smile, and what's the matter? Franca smiled and whispered, in truth, Seal and I also ventured into that peculiar world. Fortunately, we managed to escape. With that, she swiftly produced the roast chicken's knife and drove it into the table in front of Rat Cristo. Her voice turned icy as she interrogated him, what's concealed within that shipment? You nearly got us killed. I, I don't know. Cristo glanced around, beads of cold sweat forming on his forehead. Realizing that only he, Franca, and Sealed remained at the table, he hastily explained, I genuinely don't know. The boss instructed me to bring it to Trier. Chapter 192 Verification Boss? Lumian was alarmed. He hadn't anticipated the connection to Gardner Martin, but now things were starting to make sense. Why did the smuggling caravan vanish on a known route that had been used before? And why was Rat Cristo so eager to seek their help? If he had only lost a shipment, he would have made more confirmations. It would have taken time for him to reveal his vulnerabilities and mistakes to his peers, who might be eyeing his position. Lumian's mind raced with thoughts. Gardner Martin might be a sequence 6 or 5 on the hunter pathway. Both Franca and I enter the special mirror world, and we're a hunter and a demoness, respectively, on similar and neighboring paths. Mr. K instructed me to approach Gardner Martin and gain his trust. Franca, as a member of the secret organization Curly Haired Baboons Research Society, has quite a high sequence. It's surprising that she's willing to be the mistress of a mob boss like Gardner Martin. The boss of the Savoy mob must be hiding a major secret or involved in something significant. Why does he want Cristo to smuggle an item related to the hunter or demoness pathway into Trier? And why go through the risks of underground smuggling? Is he afraid of the tax collectors? Instead, why doesn't the boss retrieve the item himself outside the city and have Cristo get a smuggler lead the way? It would be safer and more discreet. 
Could it be that he knows the item might cause trouble and wants to avoid the risk? Lumian shifted his gaze from Rat Cristo to Franca's face. To Lumian's surprise, the witch seemed unprepared for such an answer. Her initial shock was swiftly followed by a hint of excitement and joy. She stared intently at Rat Cristo and sneered, Are you trying to fucking deceive me? How come I haven't heard about Gardner asking you to bring something into Trier? Where is that thing? Excitement. Joy. Lumian grew increasingly certain that Franca had ulterior motives for joining the Savoy mob and approaching Gardner Martin. Christo forced a smile and responded, It's in an iron box. I've already sent it to Rue de Fontaine's. Perhaps the boss hasn't informed you yet. As a seasoned member of the Savoy mob, he knew the power Franca possessed. She could easily dispatch him, especially since he wasn't prepared and hadn't brought any assistance. Moreover, she excelled in divination and could detect falsehoods. You better not be lying to me. Franca recoiled, produced her makeup mirror, and began performing a divination in front of Rat Christo. Lumian cooperatively stood up and walked to Christo's side. He reached out and firmly grasped Christo's shoulder. Once Franca confirmed the truth through her divination, Lumian patted the rat on the back with a smile. If anything similar happens in the future, make sure to remind me of any potential issues with the merchandise. I must be prepared for any unexpected incidents. Otherwise, I might just chop you into pieces and feed you to your beloved kids. He had heard from Lewis that Rat Christo had numerous pets and had a special fondness for dogs. Fueled by the threat, Christo grew angry. Franca may be the boss's mistress, and she's stronger than me. I can tolerate her treatment, but what right does a new bee like you have? The boss asked me to keep it a secret this time. Franca stowed away her makeup box and cursed, you son of a bitch. You could have at least given us a clue. Christo sheepishly smiled and replied, all right, all right. Surprisingly, he wasn't at all offended by the insults. To him, dogs were cherished family members, so how could their mention be taken as an offense? He often warned his lecherous subordinates that laying a hand on his wife was akin to touching his dog. Observing Franca and Seal's softened attitudes, Christo curiously asked, Is that strange world really as Erkin described? Before Franca could respond, Lumian patted Christo's shoulder with a smile. Haven't you figured it out yet? Has a dog eaten your brain? We were just bluffing you. We didn't enter any strange world at all. We simply suspected something was amiss with your goods, considering the previous smooth smuggling operations and the sudden involvement of a Beyonder incident. So, we decided to deceive you, Dot. Rat Christo couldn't help but feel vexed. Indeed, if Franca and Seal had truly entered a strange world, they wouldn't have returned so swiftly. Erkin and the others had been missing for hours. How could he have been so foolish? Why did he fall for their ruse? Suppressing his emotions, Christo looked at Franca with a fawning smile. Please don't tell the boss that I revealed the existence of that item. He will not be pleased with me. Franca cast a strange glance at Lumian and said to Rat Christo, Fine. From now on, you owe me a favor. All right. Christo hastily agreed. After bidding farewell to the leader of the smuggling operation, Lumian and Franca exited the warehouse and turned onto the narrow street of Avenue du Marquet. I realize today that Christo is a complete fool. He's incredibly gullible, Franca remarked, breaking the silence as she glanced at Lumian beside her. There was a hint of a smile on her face, but it didn't quite reach her eyes. You're quite skilled at deceiving others. Lumian assumed a composed demeanor. In Cordu, you must have heard about Cordu, right? They call me the Prankster King. Franca, familiar with Corda due to the wanted poster, smiled at Lumian and responded, Did you lie to me earlier then? Heh, <laughs> Jenna's assessment of you wasn't entirely off. You possess cunning and trickery. You're my sister's companion. I've been telling you the truth, Lumian said sincerely, maintaining an honest expression. However, he didn't divulge the complete truth. Even if Franca were to confirm it through divination, she wouldn't detect any signs of deception. Franca observed his expression and nodded in satisfaction. 
I am willing to trust Muggle's brother. Hmm. Let's pretend you don't know about Gardner's item. There are certain things that can be harmful if you were to uncover the truth. I won't inquire about it either. All right, Lumian acquiesced, obediently playing the role he had assumed in front of Aurora. The two then went their separate ways on Avenue du Marque. One headed towards Sal de Ball Breeze, while the other turned on to Rue de Blouse's Blanches. It was already past 8 p.m., and the sky had darkened. Gas wall lamps embedded in the walls illuminated the dance hall, casting a yellowish glow on the entire first floor. As they approached the dance floor, the ambience grew dimmer. Amidst greetings, Lumian took a seat at the bar counter and ordered a glass of fennel and mint absinthe, known as Parrot. The drink was rather invigorating, and with just one sip, it cleared his mind as if he had been slapped awake. Lumian sat for a while, enjoying Jenna's risque songs. Eventually, he noticed Charlie approaching the bar counter with a tray in hand. Seal. Boss. Charlie swiftly altered the way he addressed Lumian upon realizing it was the bartender looking at him. Lumian took a sip of the psychedelic green liquid and asked with a smile, Do you prefer the dance hall or the underground bar in the motel? Charlie glanced at the bartender and the other waiters before lowering his voice. I still prefer the motel bar. Over there, I'm the center of attention. I can tell. Lumian chuckled and nodded towards the young female singer who had taken over from Jenna. Is she your friend's daughter? Charlie had previously mentioned a friend who had fallen victim to a lone shark. Pressured by Baron Brignais, the friend tragically committed suicide by jumping off a building, and now his daughter was forced to sing at Sal de Ball Breeze. Yes, Charlie replied with a sorrowful expression. The female singer, dressed glamorously in a revealing blouse and skirt, was around Jenna's age but lacked the same allure. Upon closer observation, Lumian noticed the key distinction between the two, Jenna's eyes radiated a certain spark, whereas despite her fake smile, the light in the other singer's eyes was absent. Charlie opened his mouth, seemingly hesitant to ask for something, but in the end, he decided against it and remained silent. Lumian took another sip of the parrot and immersed himself in deep thought, the song playing in the background. Approaching 10.30 p.m., he stood up and made his way back upstairs. He changed into a worn linen shirt, an old jacket, brown pants, and topped it off with a dark blue cap. With this appearance, he resembled a vagabond. Without hesitation, Lumian pushed open the window and leaped into the alley behind the dance hall. His intention was to pay a visit to Theodore Delancey and Cage A Pigeons. His prophecy spell had revealed that Monsieur Ive, the landlord of Aubert's Du Coke Door, would be present at Theodore Delancey and Cage A Pigeons between 11 p.m. and 12 p.m. this Friday, i.e., tonight. Lumian wasn't expecting to confront the matter involving the evil god, the mother tree of desire, single handedly. He had no intention of facing them head on. Instead, he aimed to gather valuable information and uncover more problems through observation. To him, the most crucial objective was to utilize Monsieur Ive and the others to locate the place where Susanna Mattis had resided during her lifetime and obtain an item she had carried for a significant period. This would lay the groundwork for the exorcism spell when she eventually launched an attack. Although completing the ritualistic magic in time might prove challenging, being prepared was preferable to being caught off guard. After taking a few detours, Lumian arrived outside Theodore Delancey and Cage A Pigeons. Since it was not yet 11 p.m., he saw no need to rush inside. Instead, he found a corner and settled down, observing Monsieur Ives' beige six-story apartment with the demeanor of a genuine tramp. Before long, Lumian spotted the landlord. Monsieur Ive returned from Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman, holding a black cane. He wore a faded dark suit chestnut pants, and an aged half-top hat. A few minutes later, a dim light emanated from one of the windows of his apartment. Lumian patiently waited. As he waited, his brow gradually furrowed. Why hasn't Monsieur Ive made his way to Theodore Delancey and Cage A Pigeons? It's already past 11 p.m. The window continued to emit a yellowish glow, and occasional figures passed by. Fifteen minutes elapsed, yet Monsieur Ive had not left his apartment, crossed Avenue du Marquet, 
and entered Theodore Delancey in Cage a Pigeons. Lumian couldn't help but mutter to himself, could there be an error in my prophecy spell? Chapter 193, Luck Enhancement Lumian waited patiently until midnight drew near. As the clock struck 11.30 p.m., the light in Ives' room went out, yet no one emerged from the apartment. It seemed the miser had decided to save on gas bills and retired for the night. The final act of the play at Theodore Delancey and Cage a Pigeons concluded as midnight approached. The audience trickled out one by one, but no one entered the theater. Lumian muttered to himself, his thoughts racing, could it be that the prophecy spell's answer isn't precise enough? After all, the ritualistic magic was cast by me. It's understandable that its effect isn't perfect. Yes, that's a possibility. But what if the prophecy spell is accurate? Alarmed amidst his thoughts, Lumian's head snapped in the direction of the door adorned with theater posters. If the prophecy spell was correct, it meant that Monsieur Ive had indeed been at Theodore Delancey and Cage a Pigeons between 11 p.m. and midnight. And if Monsieur Ive truly had been there, who was the identical figure who had entered the apartment and never left? There was a strong chance it was a decoy. A decoy. No way. Lumian couldn't fathom his own suspicion. How could he be deceived by such a trick, especially after meeting and conversing with Monsieur Ive before? He was more inclined to believe that the prophecy spell was flawed. Perhaps there's a tunnel beneath the apartment leading to Theodore Delancey and Cage a Pigeons? Lumian pondered, searching for a plausible explanation. Trier was a city where establishing a tunnel was easier than in other places. It only required a short excavation to connect to underground passageways and sewers. However, such tunnels were also prone to discovery. The underground trier teemed with people, quarry police patrolled the area, smugglers traveled through, and planters passed by. Unless the tunnel went deeper or had a cleverly hidden entrance, it wouldn't take long for it to be found. If Monsieur Ives' apartment did have a similar tunnel, he wouldn't have needed to venture out to the nearby underground trier entrance at night. In the midst of these thoughts, Lumian recalled two important details. Firstly, he had witnessed a change in Monsieur Ives' luck when they first met. The next day, he realized that luck had inexplicably altered. Secondly, Monsieur Ive possessed beyonder powers and had a high likelihood of being a believer in the evil god, the mother tree of desire. Despite having a low sequence, when the official Beyonders brought him in for questioning, they found nothing amiss. Combining these perplexing facts with the disparity between the prophecy spell and reality, Lumian's pupils contracted as he muttered to himself, a decoy, could it be real? Was the person residing in the opposite apartment all this time after the robbery a mere decoy? Is that why his luck changed and the official Beyonders failed to detect anything wrong? How is it possible for him to resemble Monsieur Ives so perfectly? Did he employ a mystical item akin to the mystery prying glasses or some other method? And where is the real Monsieur Ives hiding in Theodore Delancey and Cage a Pigeons? The more Lumian pondered, the more unnerved he became. No one had discovered the substitution that took place. At the very least, Christo's men showed signs of mirror-like reversal. From the assortment of the pervert's abilities, Lumian had already deduced that Monsieur Ive had sensed something awry after being robbed. After all, even a single Verl d'Or held value as money. No robber would willingly discard it. And if it had truly been discarded, it meant that the robbery was not the true objective. It was understandable, then, that Monsieur Ive had prepared himself to conceal his secrets from the official beyonders. Lumian simply hadn't anticipated such a bizarre method. He had actually fashioned a doppelganger identical to Monsieur Ive. For a moment, Lumian couldn't ascertain whether the decoy in the apartment was an ordinary person adorned with beyonder cosmetics or a devotee of the evil god with extraordinary powers. If it was the former, Lumian desired to seize the opportunity in the dead of night, apprehend the decoy, administer a thorough thrashing, and extract the truth. Then, he would deliver the decoy to the police headquarters or a cathedral, leaving the official beyonders to conclude matters. If it was the latter, he dared not act impulsively. No one knew the decoy's sequence level or the breadth of its abilities. Lumian turned his head once more, 
casting a glance at the brick red, three story building housing theater Delancey and Cage a Pigeons. He noted that no more patrons emerged from its entrance, dispelling his idea of venturing inside for another look. The final performance of the day had concluded. After contemplating for a while, Lumian resolved to make some preparations. He rose slowly to his feet and proceeded toward Le Marquet du Cartier du Gentleman, skulking in the shadows untouched by the glow of the gas street lamps. Along the way, he scrutinized the vagabonds slumbering in the corners of the roadside, his gaze deep and earnest. Finally, he found a suitable target. Huddled beneath a makeshift barricade in the alley, the vagabond's clothing was tattered and stained with mud. His legs bore the marks of dog bites, festering wounds oozing yellow pus. In Lumian's eyes, this individual was plagued by misfortune. He would face a series of calamities in the next two or three days, with his very life potentially at stake. This made him the ideal material for the luck enhancement spell. Yes, Lumian intended to employ the ritualistic magic of the Alms Monk, the luck enhancement spell, to fashion an item capable of transmitting ill fortune. If the fake Monsieur Ive were to be plagued by misfortune, continually beset by various predicaments, there was a high likelihood that he would reveal his predicament to the official beyonders. With this in mind, Lumian had been on the lookout for the most hapless vagabonds. This particular group belonged to the realm of ill-fated individuals. With his cap pulled low, Lumian approached the vagabond, positioning himself so the gas lamps on the street cast his face in shadows. He crouched down, black-gloved hands ready, and gently prodded the tramp. You! The tramp stirred, his voice filled with pain and confusion. I need your assistance with something. Willing to lend a hand? Lumian produced a silver coin, worth one verl d'or, adorned with cherubs and intricate lines. The tramp's eyes were immediately drawn to the gleaming coin. Without hesitation, he nodded and replied, No problem. As he spoke, he extended his hand, already imagining the aroma of apple whiskey sour and hearty meatloaf. Once the silver coin was in his palm, the tramp's eyes widened suddenly, fixated on something behind Lumian. He blurted out in shock, that's. Seizing the moment Lumian turned his head, the tramp swiftly pushed himself up, attempting to vault over the barricade and sprint down the alley. It was evident that giving money to a vagabond and enlisting his cooperation in something posed a clear danger. For an ordinary tramp, the logical choice was to accept the money and make a run for it. Whack! Lumian swiftly withdrew his right hand, calmly observing as the tramp slumped against the barricade, unconscious. From the start, Lumian had no intention of allowing the tramp to witness everything while awake. Even if he were blindfolded and his ears blocked, there was still a risk of danger. Moreover, there was the potential for revealing Lumian's identity and the sinister ritualistic magic known as the Luck Enhancement Spell. Hence, his plan had been to seek the tramp's consent and then render him unconscious. Lumian assisted the tramp to his feet, as if supporting a drunken companion, and guided him to the nearest entrance to Underground Trier. Finding a concealed spot nearby, he secured the tramp, binding his hands and feet, blindfolding him, and muffling his ears. Once everything was in place, he stealthily returned to Sal de Ball Breeze, retrieving a carbide lamp and the necessary tools. Without delay, he went back to the entrance, carefully lifting the unconscious tramp and making his way to the quarry cave where he had previously performed the prophecy spell. This time, however, the ritual had undergone a change. While it remained a dualistic ceremony, the orange candle representing a deity and other supplicants had been replaced with one of a grayish-white hue. It still contained Lumian's blood. To enhance his chances of success, Lumian intended to utilize the ritualistic magic to pray to the corruption sealed within his chest, mobilizing a fragment of its power. After constructing the altar and erecting a wall of spirituality, he plunged Hedzi's tainted dagger into the tramp, allowing his blood to flow into a metal vial. The tramp stirred, only to be swiftly rendered unconscious once again. Lumian disinfected and bandaged the wound, blending the blood with ash from his own hair to create an ink-like substance. Using the thinnest paintbrush at his disposal, he meticulously outlined a series of intricate and enigmatic symbols on faux goatskin parchment. 
The design consisted of interwoven black thorns forming a ring, snakes with entwined heads and tails, a river composed of these serpentine figures, distorted lines, a peculiar eye, and more. By the time he completed a fraction of the intricate work, Lumian's forehead was drenched in a sheen of cold sweat. He positioned the tramp and the faux goatskin adorned with symbols upon the boulder that served as the altar. Dripping perfume into the flames and sprinkling powder, Lumian took two steps back, fixing his gaze upon the gently flickering yellow candle flame, and uttered ancient Hermes' words, Power of inevitability. You are the past, the present, and the future, you are the cause, the effect, and the process. As before, the flame of the deity's candle compressed to its utmost limits before expanding, swelling to the size of a clenched fist. Its hue transformed to a silvery black shade, distorting everything in its vicinity. Gray mist filled the air, and a tempest of darkness whirled about. Lumian, his ears assailed by frenzied murmurs, endured the vertigo and switched to the Hermes tongue. I implore you, I implore you to alter this destitute man's fate. I pray that you will take away his misfortune. At this juncture, Lumian took a step forward and ignited the faux goatskin adorned with mysterious symbols using the silver black candle flame. Placing it within a natural crevice on the altar's surface, he observed as the parchment began to smolder. In the next instant, he produced a gold coin worth five verl d'or, engraved with the sunbird, and positioned it near the tramp's outstretched hand. To those gripped by greed, money was an irresistible lure. It served as the optimal conduit. Lumian, burdened by a sensation akin to carrying a weight of over 500 kilograms, retreated a step, awaiting the consumption of the smoldering faux goatskin before commencing the final incantation. Grey Amber, a herb that belongs to inevitability, please pass your powers to my incantation. The entire altar abruptly ignited, assuming an ethereal semblance. Before Lumian, an illusory, intricate, and chilling river of mercury silently coursed its way. It enshrouded the tramp and the gold coin, amplifying the murmurs in Lumian's ears and causing the cyan veins upon his face to bulge. Instinctively, Lumian recoiled from the agony of supplicating for a boon. Suddenly, the illusory image shrank, descending upon the surface of the gold coin resting upon the altar. Everything returned to its former state, except for the gold coin, which now appeared dimmer under the silver-black illumination. Chapter 194 Triggered At the sight of this, Lumian hastily concluded the ritual and extinguished the candles in the proper sequence. The frenzied ravings that had filled his ears vanished, and the searing pain abruptly ceased before it could overwhelm him. Once he tidied up the altar in a rough manner, Lumian shifted his gaze to the five Verldor coin. It no longer appeared peculiar. Bathed in the glow of the carbide lamp, it shimmered with a captivating golden sheen, indistinguishable from any other coin. Lumian's eyes darkened suddenly, as if you were observing a living being, examining its fortune. Normally, he couldn't see an object's fate, but this time was different. After focusing, he realized that the gold coin was enveloped in black vapor tinged with a hint of blood-red glow. The former symbolized ill fortune, while the latter indicated a degree of impending catastrophe. Phew. Lumian let out a sigh of relief. This meant that the luck enhancement spell had succeeded. The tramp's streak of misfortune for the next few days had been transferred to the gold coin. However, if Lumian didn't find another person to bear this fate within three days, it would revert to the tramp, permanently untransferable. Lumian continued to gaze at the tramp for a few more seconds, confirming that his luck had temporarily returned to normal, neither good nor bad. Satisfied, Lumian, already positioned at the edge of the altar, reached out and picked up the five verl door, which served as the medium for luck transference. He wasn't concerned that this act would transfer the misfortune attached to the item onto himself. That's because activating the luck enhancement spell required specific conditions. Firstly, the recipient had to willingly accept the gold coin and subjectively desire to possess it. Secondly, throughout the entire process, the recipient had to exploit a situation they shouldn't have. In other words, if Lumian used the gold coin to make a purchase, the shopkeeper wouldn't suffer any ill luck merely because they accepted the item, 
unless they sold Lumion something counterfeit or dishonestly manipulated the transaction for illicit gain. Likewise, if Lumion discreetly slipped the gold coin into Charlie's pocket without his immediate awareness, Charlie wouldn't encounter misfortune when he eventually used it. As the original owner of the coin, Lumion naturally remained unaffected by the luck enhancement spell when he retrieved it. The two straightforward methods to trigger the luck enhancement spell were to keep the coin in his pocket and allow the target to steal it. He could also feign leaving it behind so the target could pick it up. Lumian believed that unless individuals like Monsieur Ive, who had acquired a miserly habit, underwent a significant transformation, they would still harbor an enduring fondness for money. Falling into such a trap would be easy for them. After erasing various traces on the altar, he hoisted the tramp onto his back and ascended to the surface. He dumped him back into the alley where he had been found, removing the ropes binding his hands and feet, along with the cloth covering his eyes and ears. The tramp stirred slowly, uttering pleas of desperate fear, Please, let me go. He blinked his eyes open, instinctively scanning his surroundings. To his realization, there was no one in sight, and he found himself still slumbering in his usual spot. Dot. The tramp fell silent. As his senses gradually returned, his initial reaction was to delve into his pocket. A chill seeped into his mind, and with a gleeful expression, he retrieved a silver coin worth one verl door. It's still here. It's really still there. It wasn't a dream. Under the faint crimson moonlight casting its glow from above and the street lamps illuminating the vicinity, the tramp fiddled with the silver coin repeatedly, assuring himself that it wasn't a counterfeit. Only then did he recall to examine his body. Soon, he noticed that his arm was bandaged, and a sharp ache assaulted his mind. Apart from that, there was nothing out of the ordinary. The tramp stumbled to his feet, rubbing his backside as he muttered to himself, it's not that kind of pervert. Having witnessed the world prior to his bankruptcy, he was aware that Trier housed its fair share of peculiar individuals. Consequently, various private organizations had sprung up. Some advocated that men and women existed solely for reproduction, while others believed that true love only blossomed between men. Gatherings even catered to those who believed that women alone held the secret to loving their own kind. The tramp had initially suspected he had fallen victim to men with a peculiar fixation on foul, unwashed men. However, it seemed that wasn't the case. After pondering for a moment, he conjectured that someone had taken an interest in his blood and extracted some. The one verl door was his reward. He had heard tales before of influential figures relying on continual blood transfusions to sustain their lives. At least there's one verl door. The tramp instantly rejoiced, no longer dwelling on the loss of blood. He even entertained the hope that the other party would seek him out once more. When the time came, he would willingly inquire about their desired price. Lumian relied on a copper coin toss to decide that he would spend the night at Aubert's du Coq door. Consequently, he returned to room 207 and slept until 6 a.m. After having breakfast and engaging in some outdoor exercises, then returning to the motel, changing his attire, and disguising himself, Lumian prepared to set off for Avenue du Marquet to find the two cleaning ladies already hard at work. Lumian caught sight of a cleaning lady in her fifties, sporting a vibrant golden wig and makeup, as she diligently cleared the trash in the lobby. Lumian halted his steps and asked contemplatively, You're Elodie, aren't you? He recalled Charlie mentioning her name. Yes, Monsieur Seal. Elodie straightened her posture. She wore an old yet clean grayish-white dress and stood at an average height of 1.65 meters. From her facial features, it was evident that she had been quite attractive in her youth. You know me? Lumian inquired nonchalantly. Elodie answered truthfully, Monsieur Charlie Collant spoke of you before. He mentioned that you're the hotel's guardian. Eh, just as expected of Charlie. That's the right attitude. No trace of inferiority or fear. Lumian started to feel that Elodie, the cleaning lady, wasn't a former street girl as Charlie had speculated. He casually asked, I heard from Charlie that you used to be a theater actress. Yes. A smile graced Elodie's face. 
I performed in two theaters, taking on supporting roles. However, one of them went bankrupt, and the other stopped hiring me for some reason. I was already quite old by then. As she reminisced about the past, a hint of melancholy appeared in her demeanor. Lumian nodded and glanced towards the motel door. Have you heard of Theodore Delancey and Cage a Pigeons? This was the question he was truly interested in. This cleaning lady named Elodie was originally a theater actress, but she had been hired by Monsieur Ive, the motel landlord who had a close relationship with Theodore Delancey and Cage a Pigeons. It was a little suspicious. Elodie's expression became animated. I know that their plays are splendid. The actors possess remarkable acting skills. It's worth saving up for a month just to purchase tickets to their shows. When I attended a performance at Theater Delancey and Kajaw Pigeons, I discovered that they were in need of a cleaning lady for half a day. That's why I ended up here. I see. It seems unrelated to Theater Delancey and Kajaw Pigeons or Monsieur Ive. Lumian refrained from further probing to avoid raising any suspicions. He smiled and remarked, Seems like you have other jobs? Elodie believed that Monsieur Seal sought to ascertain the cleaning lady's background to protect the motel's interests, so she responded honestly, Every day from 2 p.m. to 10 p.m., I work at a factory south of the Market District. It's called the Goodville Chemical Factory, situated on Rue St. Hilaire. Rue St. Hilaire ran alongside Trier's city walls and neighbored the factories in Cartier du Jardin Botanique. Trier's factories had preserved a practice from the era of Roselle. If production continued around the clock, the workers were divided into three shifts, one for the morning to noon, another for the afternoon to evening, and the final one for the night. That sounds demanding. Lumian sighed. Elodie smiled and spoke gently. I have two children who are nearly grown. Once they secure their own jobs, I won't have to toil so relentlessly. What about your husband? Lumian casually inquired. Elodie's expression darkened. He died in a factory accident a few years ago. Lumian didn't pry further. Instead, he engaged in conversation with another cleaning lady, faithfully fulfilling his duties as the protector of Aubert's du Coke door. Exiting Rue Anarchy, Lumian stepped onto Avenue du Marquet, making his way towards Theodore Delancey and Cage a Pigeons. He wasn't intentionally waiting for Monsieur Ive, who was suspected of being a decoy. His intention was simply to observe. His primary objective was to keep a close watch on the individuals heading to 126, Avenue du Marquet. The prophecy spell had revealed to him that he would cross paths with Louis Lund on Avenue du Marquet. Hammer 8 had mentioned that Louis Lund would once again seek out the boss of the Poison Spur mob, Black Scorpion Roger, this Saturday or Sunday, and Black Scorpion Roger resided at 126, Avenue du Marquet. With this combination of information, Lumian had decided to become a permanent resident on Avenue du Marquet on Monday and wander about in hopes of encountering his target. As Lumian neared Theodore Delancey and Cage a Pigeons in Monsieur Ives' apartment, he slowed his pace. Sometimes, he sat among the tramps, while other times, he visited a nearby café for a drink. Since he was already there, it was only natural for him to keep an eye out for Monsieur Ive. After all, this was Avenue du Marquet as well. After nearly 45 minutes, Lumian finally spotted the landlord of the motel. Clad in a faded formal suit, a worn-out top hat, and a black cane that was on the verge of losing its paint, Monsieur Ive emerged from the apartment and made his way towards the Suet Steam Locomotive Station. Lumian gradually stood up and glanced behind him. He feigned terror and jogged, as if he were being pursued by an enemy. In his attempt to overtake Monsieur Ive from behind, he accidentally collided with him. A clatter ensued as a golden coin fell to the ground, yet Lumian seemed oblivious to it. He lowered his head and fled in a panic. Monsieur Ive grumbled, his gaze suddenly drawn to the golden coin on the pavement. Subconsciously, he wanted to call out to the impolite individual, but as he extended his hand, no words escaped his lips. Swiftly scanning his surroundings, he swiftly squatted down and retrieved the five Verldor coin. Nonchalantly, he slipped it into his pocket, as if nothing out of the ordinary had transpired. Chapter 195 
candidate. Hidden behind the shadow of an ebony street lamp, a mere twenty meters away from Monsieur Ive, Lumian leaned discreetly, tugging his cap lower amidst the bustling crowd. He watched intently as his mark retrieved the glistening gold coin, secretively stashing it away. Only then did Lumian release a sigh of relief. With one hand nonchalantly tucked inside his pocket, he strolled towards 126, Avenue du Marquet, paying no further heed to the dubious decoy, for the luck enhancement spell had been officially set in motion, impervious to interruption. However, the spell required time to manifest its effects. Within half a day or, at most, a full day, misfortune would incessantly plague the false Monsieur Ive. Lumian need only orchestrate a small incident when the opportune moment arrived, and the chances were high that Monsieur Ive would inadvertently unveil his peculiar nature to the legitimate beyonders. As Lumian ventured forth, he soon realized that 126, Avenue du Marquet was none other than the abode of Black Scorpion Roger, the very nerve center of the poison spur mob. Consequently, he dared not approach too closely, wary of exposing himself. Settling himself near a café window, diagonally positioned at a distance of over ten meters, he ordered a fermo coffee and a dariole. While awaiting his refreshments, Lumian attentively scanned the passers-by on Avenue du Marquet, his gaze lingering upon the promotional posters adorning the café's walls. A prevalent theme among them was the impending national convention elections scheduled to commence on Sunday. There were three contenders vying for the position, Matthew Boulanger, representing the National Party, Hugues Artois, championing the Enlightenment Party, and Jacques Anson, hailing from the Revolutionary Party. As Lumian observed the fervor surrounding the approach to 126, Avenue du Marquet, he found himself engrossed in the manifestos of the candidates. Matthew Boulanger, the incumbent parliament member for the Le Marquet du Quartier du Gentleman District, advocated for the restoration of Intis's former glory. His rallying cry was make Intis glorious again. Boulanger attributed the nation's current predicaments to its defeat in the recent war against the Lowen Kingdom. His proposed solution entailed reorganizing the Intis army with a renewed focus on prioritizing Intis's interests. He sought to regain the advantages relinquished in the southern continent, bolster the economy, and transform the marketplace district. Boulanger believed that the process of making Intis glorious again would bestow upon the denizens of the marketplace district an abundance of employment opportunities, enabling them to amass wealth, whether through venturing into the southern continent, enlisting in the army, or capitalizing on foreign trade. Hugues Artois, a candidate gaining considerable popularity of late, advocated for more jobs, for a fairer society. His pledge was to invigorate the economy, constructing additional factories in the southern region of the marketplace district, while simultaneously dismantling the shackles that bound factory owners, bankers, financiers, and merchants. However, his intentions also encompassed challenging the privileges enjoyed by the church and the affluent, imposing heavier taxes upon them. Jacques Anson, a member of the Revolutionary Party, shared Hugues Artois' conviction that societal privileges had no place in the modern world. Regardless of one's affiliation with the church or financial benefits, Sanson believed that everyone should pay equal taxes. He boldly asserted that the current tariff policies hindered Entis's progress, particularly the city walls and the 54 checkpoints surrounding Trier. Sanson advocated for the free circulation of goods and the establishment of a liberated market, which would lead to the proliferation of factories and a significant increase in tax revenue. By taxing the privileged class alongside these reforms, the national treasury would swiftly recover from any initial setbacks. When the time came, Sanson planned to explore the implementation of Emperor Roselle's envisioned annuity guarantee system, providing essential protection to the workers in the marketplace district. His slogan resounded, Take down those damn walls. Having finished reading the candidates' platforms, Lumian couldn't help but feel inclined to vote for Jacques Sanson. While it remained uncertain whether Sanson possessed the capability to realize his ideas, cheaper alcohol and goods would bring tangible benefits and security to the people in the marketplace district. As for taxing the privileged, they weren't overly concerned, as long as the burden didn't exceed a coppet. Yet, it was evident that Jacques Sanson faced discrimination. His campaign posters were relegated to the farthest corners, barely visible. 
this treatment stemmed from the Revolutionary Party's perennial status as a minority within the National Convention. As the Poison Spur mob rallied behind Hugues Artois of the Enlightenment Party, Lumian directed his utmost attention towards this candidate. He not only perused Artois' election platform but also scrutinized his color photographs. Artois, a man in his thirties, possessed a luxuriant head of black, fluffy hair with hints of gray at his temples. His nose stood tall and proud, complemented by deep blue eyes. His height commanded attention, and he exuded an air of refinement when dressed formally. I can't allow this man to be elected. Unless I dismantle the poison spur mob before that happens. However, the mob still enjoys the mysterious support of Madame Moon. Even if one black scorpion falls, another red scorpion will emerge. Yes, the elections are set to commence this Sunday. The police headquarters, military police, and official beyonders will be mobilized to vigilantly monitor each constituency. Causing trouble won't be easy. Should I involve the laborers, porters, and waiters of the Savoy mob? Lumian contemplated how to secure the National Convention seat for both Matthew Boulanger and Jacques Sanson. Lost in thought, he maintained a watchful eye on the window, hoping to catch sight of Louis Lond. After a considerable time had passed, the golden sun ascended into the sky. Lumian realized that waiting was not a viable option. Firstly, his identity posed a problem. He remained under the intense scrutiny of the poison spur mob preventing him from waiting in a building opposite Black Scorpion Rogers' residence. Such a vantage point would limit his view and increase the risk of overlooking crucial details. Secondly, as the leader of the Savoy mob, he had numerous responsibilities to fulfill and required moments of respite. Waiting 24 hours a day for two straight days was simply unfeasible. As these thoughts raced through his mind, Lumian was struck by an idea. Why should I do it myself when I have so many subordinates and even hired Anthony Reed with my own money? With that thought, Lumian rose from his seat and left the café, making his way towards Salle de Ball Breeze. As he reached the middle of Avenue du Marquet, Lumian's attention was drawn to a gathering by the roadside. At the outskirts of the crowd stood a circle of black-uniformed police officers, while two rows of mounted officers observed the passers-by. Amidst the 200 to 300 people, there stood a makeshift wooden platform. A man in a black suit, sans bow tie, commanded the stage. A massive poster displaying his photo adorned the outer wall of the house behind him. His resounding voice resonated through the streets. We need jobs. We need better income. I will construct more factories on Rue Saint-Hilaire. I pledge tax concessions for these factories. Ah. Isn't that Monsieur Hugues Artois? Lumian, utilizing his above average intus height, could clearly see the speaker on the wooden stage. It was the elegant, black haired, blue eyed Hugues Artois, a candidate supported by the poison spur mob. Lumian listened for several seconds, his gaze instinctively scanning the upper levels of the building opposite Hugues Artois, examining the windows and roof. As expected, he detected signs of police officers or individuals who clearly did not belong to the household. He's well protected indeed. I cannot shoot Hugues Artois in the head or chest from those positions using a rifle. Lumian averted his gaze, a tinge of regret washing over him. There was another way to ensure Hugues Artois' defeat in the election, and that was to prevent him from participating altogether. Those who perished would automatically forfeit their right to run. Lumian had seriously contemplated the feasibility of this plan while at the cafe, but he concluded that it would stir up too much chaos. The market district mobs would likely be mobilized and used as scapegoats. He himself would fall into that category. If that happened, his true identity would likely be exposed, compelling him to flee the market district, if not try her altogether he would lose the opportunity to track down Madame Poilis and the Padre. Assassinating the candidate appeared to be quite a challenge. Even if he were fortunate enough to succeed, escape might not be guaranteed. Lumian shifted his gaze to the people standing behind the wooden platform. They were most likely members of Hugues Artois' campaign, a trio of men and two women. Among them, there was a woman with fiery red hair, rumored to possess noble lineage. 
Her features were striking, with chiseled lines on her face, yet there was an overall air of neutrality to her beauty. Tall and attired in a white and brown hunting suit, she was accompanied by four other individuals. Fearful of missing Louis Lund, Lumian paid no heed to Hugh's Artois oration. He withdrew from the throng and made his way back to Sal de Ball Breeze. Noontime brought few patrons to the establishment. Some waiters and bartenders took a break, while others busied themselves with tidying up. Addressing Louis and Sarkota, Lumian spoke up. Dispatch four men to keep watch at 126, Avenue du Marquet. 126, Louis repeated, his voice filled with astonishment. Isn't that Black Scorpion Rogers' residence? Is the boss planning to stir up trouble for the poison spur mob once again? Lumian nodded, his expression candid. You've got it. Don't get too close and ensure you remain undetected. Stand guard from different vantage points and observe whether he appears among the passers-by. Lumian gestured toward the wanted posters adorning the wall, as well as Louis Lund, who stood nearby. Since joining the Savoy mob, Louis's own wanted poster had been discreetly moved to an even more inconspicuous spot. Louis and Sarkota turned their attention to the wanted poster, carefully examining its contents. Words like Corda Village caught their eye. They grasped the general idea and readily agreed. Yes, boss. Once the four mobsters departed Sal de Ball Breeze with the wanted poster in tow, Lumian turned to Louis and Sarkota. For the next few days, your task will be to maintain order on the first floor dance hall. Having issued his instructions, Lumian added nonchalantly, I just caught snippets of Hugues Artois' speech. Not bad. Hm whom does our Savoy mob support as the market district's member of parliament? Louis cast a quick glance around and lowered his voice. The Baron mentioned that he intends to vote for Monsieur Artois. Chapter 196 Elimination Hugues Artois Lumian never anticipated such a response. Did the competing Savoy mob and the Poison Spur mob really endorse the same candidate? If Hugues Artois succeeded, would he assist the Poison Spur mob in dealing with the Savoy mob? Or would he aid the Savoy mob in completely overthrowing the Poison Spur mob? Or would he demand peace between the two factions? The more Lumian pondered it, the more he sensed that something was amiss. If the influential figure behind both the Savoy mob and the Poison Spur mob was none other than Hugues Artois, then the two sides wouldn't have become bitter enemies to this extent. Though Lumian played his part, wasn't he acting under the blessings of the boss and Baron Brignais? Furthermore, Hugues Artois wasn't an elected member of Parliament. What authority did he have to protect both the Savoy mob and the Poison Spur mob? The only plausible explanation was the machinations of the Enlightenment party, but it made no sense for them to incite two rival mobs to fight each other to the death. Lumian, lacking experience in this area, failed to find an answer even after considerable thought. All he could do was sigh with regret. I can't employ the Savoy mob's men to secretly intimidate voters into not supporting Hugues Artois. He glanced at Louis, his confusion evident as he asked, why was I unaware that our Savoy mob is backing Hugues Artois? Louis immediately grew tense. I assumed the Baron had apprised you, boss. Wasn't that the purpose of the handover? Baron Brignais was in a foul mood after losing the Sal de Ball breeze, so he couldn't be bothered to inform me about many things. In any case, I'll find out when I need to know. Lumian mumbled inwardly as he departed from Sal de Ball breeze and returned to Aubert's du Coke door. He proceeded directly to the third floor and made his way to room 5, the dwelling of Anthony Reed, the information broker. Extending his hand, Lumian knocked on the wooden door. Knocks reverberated, yet no response came. He must not be present. That makes sense. How can an information broker stay holed up at home all the time? Lumian retrieved a note and fountain pen he carried with him and wrote on the note, using Anthony Reed's door as a surface. I've received intel that Louis Lund will be seen on Avenue du Marquet from Saturday to Sunday. Keep a close watch on him. As soon as you spot him, notify me without delay. You can find me either in room 207 at the motel or at Sal de Ball Breeze. The agreed payment will be made promptly when the time comes. 
Seal. After sliding the note through the crevice of room 305's door, Lumian returned to Sal de Ball Breeze and settled in the cafe, patiently awaiting feedback. Has Louis Lund been discovered? Lumian rose from his seat, eyeing his subordinate. The mobster appeared inexplicably anxious, as if a famished lion had set its sights on him. Without waiting for Lumian to inquire, he stammered in haste, Boss, the, this is bad. I saw, I saw a group of police officers heading toward the depot. The depot? Isn't that under the boss's ownership? Ah, near the depot lies the warehouse belonging to Rat Cristo. Could Franca's report have taken effect? Lumian swiftly contemplated a possibility. This left him disheartened. In his eyes, the mirror people and any potential harm they might bring couldn't hold a candle to a single strand of Louis Lund's hair. Suppressing his emotions and residual excitement, Lumian spoke to his subordinate, understood. I'll handle it. Return to your original post and remain vigilant for the person depicted in the wanted poster. In half an hour, I'll send four others to relieve you. Yes, boss. The gangster heaved a sigh of relief and made his way downstairs. As Lumian watched him disappear, he gazed down at his trembling hands. They still quivered slightly. It was a result of the sudden surge of exhilaration he experienced when he thought his subordinate had brought news of Louis Lund. At times, my emotional stability wavers. Fortunately, I have another psychiatric session scheduled for this Sunday. Lumian sighed inwardly, taking a seat and savoring his coffee. In order to welcome Louis Lund in his finest state, he had refrained from ordering alcohol. Outside the warehouses belonging to Rat Cristo, he, along with his subordinates and the porters, had gathered together, encircled by twenty to thirty armed police officers donning black uniforms. Cristo forced a fawning smile and addressed Superintendent Travis Everett, saying, Monsieur Superintendent, why have you suddenly surrounded the warehouses? I'm a legitimate businessman. Everett, a man in his thirties with black-framed glasses and a broad chin, regarded Christo and spoke in a deep voice, Do not assume that we are unaware of your usual dealings. We are not dealing with you because you abide by the rules and know what is permissible. Your only choice now is to cooperate with us and aid us in unraveling this as swiftly as possible. Christo detected a glimmer of hope in Superintendent Everett's words and nodded. All right, all right, no problem. He had already distributed the batch of goods from yesterday. As long as the genuine account books were not discovered, there was no concrete evidence to accuse him. With his short black hair, Everett turned to the man standing beside him and said, Monsieur Deputy Assistant Commissioner, you may proceed. The man had a rugged appearance, sporting fluffy blonde hair golden eyebrows, and a beard. He wore a slightly smaller black police uniform, but his buttons were crafted from gold. Adorning his epaulette was a silver-white seven-petal scented iris, accompanied by an off-white diamond square. This emblem indicated the rank of deputy assistant commissioner. The police department and trier had four ranks, in ascending order, chief superintendent, deputy assistant commissioner, assistant commissioner, and deputy commissioner. Of these, there was only one deputy commissioner, the head of Trier's police department. Across the entire Antis Republic, the minister of the National Police Department, a commissioner, held a higher rank. The assistant commissioner and deputy assistant commissioner served as Trier's police department's deputy minister and police committee members. Their epaulets displayed off-white diamond squares beside the seven petaled irises. There were four commissioners, three deputy commissioners, two assistant commissioners, and one deputy assistant commissioner, with no chief superintendents. In other words, this uncouth man with blonde hair and a golden beard held an equal rank to Amerk, the police committee member in charge of the entire Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman. However, Christo was entirely unfamiliar with him. Just call me Angoulême, the rugged deputy assistant commissioner replied succinctly. His gaze swept across Christo, Erkin, and the others, inexplicably making them feel as if they were staring at the blinding sun, forcing them to lower their heads. Angulim averted his gaze and instructed the plainclothes team behind him, you may bring that object forward now. 
two team members approached the nearby four-wheeled carriage and unveiled a wide, flat, and sizable object covered in a black velvet curtain. They positioned the object beside Angulim. Angulim locked eyes with Rat Christo and the others, subtly raising his chin, and uttered, Line up in front of me, one by one. Christo sensed the kid in his pocket trembling visibly. He surmised that Angulim was an official beyonder, someone of considerable power. After a few moments of contemplation, he approached Angulim fearfully, not daring to resist. Suddenly, Angulim pulled open the black velvet curtain, revealing the complete appearance of the object beside him. It was a full-body mirror, simple and unadorned, mounted on a stand of rusted iron black. Christo's reflection appeared instantly in the mirror, capturing every detail. Christo remained unaware of anything amiss, but Erkin's expression underwent a drastic change behind him. Erkin abruptly turned to the left, attempting to escape. Almost twenty others followed suit, including laborers and porters. Bang! 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 Angulim's team had already prepared, raising their arms and squeezing the triggers. Bullets struck those fleeing, but it was as if they struck an illusion, passing through them and landing in the distance. Angulim calmly extended his left hand and adjusted the position of the full-body mirror beside him. The mirror reflected Erkin's figure against a dark background. Erkin froze in place, maintaining his running posture. In an instant, he was drawn towards the full-body mirror, a look of horror etched on his face. As soon as the two collided, Erkin's body vanished. In the blink of an eye, he reappeared in the mirror, his face stained with blood. His expression turned sinister, consumed by hatred and resentment. He opened his mouth as if to scream, but an invisible force pulled him into the unnaturally dark backdrop of the mirror, and he vanished. Witnessing this, Christo stood dumbfounded, forgetting to aid his brother. One thought echoed in his mind, there's something terribly wrong with them. Meanwhile, Angulim's subordinates worked to control the fleeing individuals. The ordinary people caught in the midst of the chaos cowered on the ground, heads lowered, trembling with fear. In Sal de Ball Breeze, Lumian sat at the bar counter, listening to Jenna's captivating singing. Two hours ago, he had received news that Rat Christo was unharmed, but a group of his subordinates had perished. Quite efficient. Lumian inwardly commended the official beyonders in the market district. As the risque song came to an end, a woman who had been waiting on the sidelines took the stage and hurriedly approached a young band member. She sobbed and cried out twice. It seemed she was delivering news of someone's death. The band member stood frozen, shocked by the news, unable to react for a moment. After a few seconds, he flung aside the six-string zither strapped to him and dashed off the stage. However, he only managed a few steps before he stumbled and fell heavily to the ground. He struggled to rise but failed. In the next moment, tears streamed down his face. Jenna, adorned in a shimmering red dress, observed him for a few seconds before pressing her lips together. Eventually, she didn't offer consolation, allowing the band member and the grieving woman to weep. She quietly stepped down from the stage and crossed paths with Lumian, who had left the bar counter. What happened? Lumian inquired. Jenna let out a soft sigh and replied, his father passed away in an accident a few hours ago. I know him. Learning to play a musical instrument hasn't been easy for him. His father works as a porter, and his mother is a dishwasher. Without their unwavering support, he would be limited to manual labor. An accident a few hours ago. A porter. Lumian roughly pieced together the cause. He gazed silently at the stage. Chapter 197 Helper After the band member and his mother got time off from Rene, Sal de Ball Breeze's manager, the drumbeats reverberated through the air, signaling the start of a new round of dancing. Lumian turned his gaze to Jenna, who stood by his side, and spoke in a casual tone. I thought you would offer him some comfort. After all, you know him well and often collaborate with their band. Jenna, dressed in a stunning red sequin dress that revealed a generous amount of her chest, pressed her lips together and responded calmly. 
In that moment just now, what he needed wasn't comforting words, but a release. Offering condolences would only worsen his pain. Lumian scrutinized Jenna for a few moments. You seem to understand it quite well. Why do I have a feeling that you've experienced something similar yourself? Jenna lowered her gaze to her toes and smiled softly. A few years ago, I went through the same thing when my father passed away. One day, before dawn, my mother took me to the rooftop of our apartment and stayed with me until the sunrise. I witnessed the gradual brightening of the sky, from pitch black to a deep blue. It grew lighter and lighter, and I saw the clouds adorned with shades of bright gold and other colors. In that moment, she told me that darkness would eventually pass, and the sun would rise. Light would always find its way to illuminate the land. When he returns to the band, I'll find an opportunity to share something similar with him. Lumian listened in silence, letting out a sigh. You have a wonderful mother. Yes. Jenna accepted the compliment with pride. Lumian chuckled and remarked, You managed to say so much without resorting to curses. That's unlike you. Moreover, she appeared rather refined. Damn it. Do you think I'm the type of person who curses incessantly? Jenna cursed indignantly and made her way to the break room to prepare for the next song. Lumian settled back at the bar counter, his mind preoccupied with another matter. He had therapy scheduled for tomorrow afternoon, and there was a possibility of Louis Lund showing up on Sunday. What if he missed it? Lumian's initial impulse was to write a letter to Madame Magician and request her to check with his psychiatrist, Madame Susie, about the possibility of rescheduling the treatment by a day. However, he couldn't shake off the feeling of his condition being unstable for the past two days. If he didn't act promptly, he might face severe consequences when tracking down Louis Lund. Even though Madame Puales wasn't exactly Madame Knight, Lumian couldn't confront her directly. His primary objective was to locate the survivor from Cordu and engage in a friendly conversation with her. Lumian didn't hold much animosity towards Madame Puales. While she believed in an evil god and had involvement in Cordu, it appeared that she wasn't responsible for the disaster. She had departed before the ritual took place under some compulsion. Hence, if he allowed himself to become unstable and reacted impulsively, escalating the conflict with Madame Puales and making her his enemy, matters would become exceedingly troublesome, and he might even lose his life. As for the dispute with the poison sperm mob, a problem with Madame Moon didn't equate to matters involving Madame Knight. After careful consideration, Lumian devised a plan to find someone who could track Louis Lund on his behalf and follow him to his residence in Trier. There's no need to consider individuals without beyond their powers. They simply wouldn't be able to keep up with him. There are two viable options. The first is Anthony Reed, an information broker suspected of being a beyonder from the psychiatrist pathway. He possesses excellent tracking abilities and has already accepted my commission, receiving a deposit. Since the task involves locating Louis Lund, it naturally falls within the scope of the mission. If Anthony proves difficult, I'm prepared to offer more money. The second option is Franca. She, along with Aurora, belongs to the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society. Franca knows my true identity and displays a certain level of concern for me. She is trustworthy to some extent, not to mention that she still owes me a favor. Franca possesses enough power to tail Louis Lund and even intercept him if necessary. As these thoughts raced through Lumian's mind, he rose from his seat, making his way to the bedroom on the second floor and leaving Sal de Ball breeze through the window. Aubert's Du Coke Door, Room 305. Lumian knocked on the wooden door. Please come in, Anthony Reed responded in a West Mid Seashore Coast accent. The door slowly swung open. The information broker stood before Lumian once more. His plump face, once slick with oiliness, appeared freshly scrubbed, enhancing his air of honesty. Wearing a grayish blue worker's uniform, he seemed to have spent the entire day in the southern part of the market district and Cartier du Jardin Botanique. I've read your note, Anthony Reed said, running a hand through his receding white yellow hairline. I've been keeping an eye on Avenue du Marquet. Lumian felt a slight unease, but he surveyed the room and spoke directly. 
I have other matters to attend to between 2.30 p.m. and 5 p.m. tomorrow. If you happen to spot the target during that time, don't inform me. Simply follow him and ascertain his place of residence. Anthony Reed locked his dark brown eyes onto Lumian's for a few seconds. Very well. He made no mention of an additional fee, and Lumian was content not to broach the subject either. Three Rue de Blouse's Blanches housed a relatively new apartment building. Its beige facade boasted a charming curvature, featuring numerous irregular walls adorned with a variety of statues. Angels, animals, celebrities, and legendary objects found their place amidst the architecture. The building boasted an abundance of large windows, wall pillars, and scroll art, creating an atmosphere of grandeur. Lumian stood before room 601 and pressed the doorbell. With a jingling sound, Franca swung open the dark red door. Her flaxen hair cascaded naturally and voluminously, while she wore a loose white silk nightgown that gracefully reached her knees. The wide-open collar revealed a fair expanse of skin. Observing that the other party showed no signs of weariness and wasn't even wearing a bra, Lumian made a conscious effort to keep his gaze focused. Before opening the door, Franca seemed to already know the identity of the visitor. She greeted him with a smile. Coming to seek knowledge and mysticism? After all our discussions, you finally arrived. No, it's something else, Lumian responded, gesturing towards the room, indicating that they should speak inside. Franca turned and walked towards the sofa, Lumian following closely behind. As he entered, he instinctively scanned his surroundings. This apartment consisted of two bedrooms, a bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen. The furnishings in the living room, such as the sofa, coffee table, dining table, chairs, and cupboards, were predominantly beige, iron black, silver white, or light gray. The colors were muted and lacked vibrancy. The overall aesthetic was one of simplicity and cleanliness, but it also exuded a touch of coldness. It stood in stark contrast to the living room styles found in most households. Lumian took a seat on the edge of the divan while Franca curled her legs and reclined on the adjacent armchair, revealing her alluring curves. What brings you here? Franca inquired. Lumian pointed towards her. Aren't you considering changing your clothes? Franca glanced down at her nightgown and came to a realization. Perhaps it's because you know my original gender. When I'm around you, I always have this illusion that I'm still a man and forget to pay attention to such details. A smile played on her lips. Rather than changing her attire, she shifted her sitting posture, accentuating her allure even further. After a few moments, she even left her recliner and settled beside Lumian. Sensing Lumian's perplexed gaze, she chuckled and remarked, Since you won't peek, why should I bother changing? She made a playful gesture, unreservedly teasing him. Madam, you have a wicked sense of humor. Lumian sighed. Franca grinned and replied, Life is already tough. I need to seek some amusement for myself. But I'm considered fine. There's a group of individuals in the research society who harbor a little hope for the future and have made it their life goal to pursue enjoyment. They've formed a group called April Fool's Day. Your sister must have mentioned it, right? She did, Lumian confirmed, recalling reading about it in Aurora's grimoires. Franca refrained from elaborating and fixed her gaze upon Lumian, her eyes resembling calm lakes, awaiting an explanation for his visit. Lumian spoke directly, his words carrying a certain bluntness. I require a favor. Oh? Franca responded cooperatively, her tone laced with curiosity. Lumian took a moment to contemplate before continuing. Considering you've seen my wanted poster, you must possess some knowledge regarding it. I've received information that one of the individuals depicted, a man by the name of Louis Lund, will make an appearance on Avenue du Marquet tomorrow. He maintains close ties with the masterminds behind the poison spur mob. My intention is to apprehend him and unveil the truth behind the catastrophe in Cordu. However, I'll be preoccupied with crucial matters tomorrow afternoon, so I can't personally await his arrival. I hope you could lend me your assistance. Should he show, tail him and ascertain his whereabouts. If you feel confident, aid me in capturing him. 
He once possessed Beyonder powers equivalent to a Sequence 8 and is likely a gardener, though I cannot say for certain at present. After acquiring the mirror, you did promise to compensate me. This would be it. Franca retorted angrily, this concerns Muggle's death. I will most certainly help. Compensation is not an appropriate term in this context. Tailing him doesn't count. But attacking him counts? Lumian proposed. Discerning the underlying polite and detached nature of his request, Franca did not insist and simply nodded. That works too. Curiosity danced across her countenance as she posed another query. What could be more pressing than apprehending this individual named Louis Lund? I expected you to be more concerned about uncovering the truth behind Cordu. Lumian pondered briefly before speaking candidly, the Cordu disaster has left me grappling with certain psychological issues. I am presently undergoing regular treatment. I fear that without timely follow-up, I will lose control of my emotions, thus jeopardizing my quest for the truth. Franca nodded sympathetically, displaying her understanding. Taking the initiative, she offered a suggestion. Would you like me to find a genuine psychiatrist, one with beyonder powers, for you? My psychiatrist already possesses them, Lumian revealed, withholding nothing. Franca refrained from prying further, recalling that Muggle's brother participated in other mystical gatherings. Lumian mentioned the attributes of a villain and a gardener, as well as the existence of Anthony Reed. He provided a detailed description of Reed's appearance to ensure Franca wouldn't mistake him for a companion of Louis Lund, potentially leading to unnecessary conflict. With that, Lumian rose from his seat, signaling his intention to depart. Franca stood up, amused. You've come all this way. Aren't you interested in delving into the mysteries of mysticism? Louise Lund may make an appearance tonight as well, Lumian remarked, eager to return to Sal de Ball Breeze as swiftly as possible. At that precise moment, both he and Franca directed their attention toward the door. Light footfalls resonated from the stairs before halting nearby. Franca glanced at the peephole from a distance, her expression suddenly morphing into one of peculiarity. In hushed tones, she addressed Lumian, Jenna. Chapter 198, Conciliation Beneath the open window of room 601, Lumian scaled the wall with his bare hands, aided by the protrusions, statues, and pipes. His descent was swift and steady, story after story, until he made a final leap and landed gracefully on the edge of Rue de Blouse's blanches. He grumbled under his breath, Why am I forced to climb down from the sixth floor? I haven't done anything. Lumian slipped into the shadows and made his way towards Avenue du Marquet. In room 601, Franca cast a fleeting glance at the swaying window, adjusting her silk nightgown before approaching the slowly opening door, wearing a smile. Dressed in a sequin red dress, Jenna stored away the spare key Franca had entrusted to her and entered the apartment. Why are you here so early today? Franca inquired, blocking Jenna's path to the window her brow furrowed in confusion. Jenna let out a sigh and replied, something happened to the band's six-string zither player. While it didn't affect my singing, it put everyone in a foul mood. The dance hall manager, Renee, asked me to end the performance early and switch tonight's theme to cheek-to-cheek -cheek dancing. The cheek-to-cheek -cheek dance in the market district differed from the usual version. It involved intimate embraces and provocative movements between men and women on the dance floor. It was an exhilarating experience, but dance halls needed enough female dancers to organize it. Attempting to find a topic of conversation, Franca asked, what happened exactly? She discreetly calculated the time it would take for Lumian to descend to the first floor, all the while grumbling internally, why is Muggle's brother a hunter instead of an assassin? Assassins can effortlessly leap from the sixth floor and land as light as a feather. Jenna recounted the band member's unfortunate incident and concluded, Damn it, why do unlucky people always attract more misfortune? Yes, even though the performance ended earlier than usual, it's still late. Going home would be quite troublesome. I'll sleep at your place. Given that Jenna lived far away from Avenue du Marquet, she often sought refuge at Franca's whenever she performed late into the night at the dance hall. She even had a spare key. 
warehouse, porter. Recalling the information provided by her subordinate, Franca surmised that it must be related to the matter involving Rat Cristo. As she let out a sigh, contemplating how the innocent had lost their kin, Franca inwardly expressed her sorrow. Brother 007 is incredibly efficient. I only informed him about the mirror people late last night, and the official beyonders have already dealt with the anomaly before this evening. Brother 007 was the code name of a man from the Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society, a member of an official organization in Trier. His rank seemed quite high, and Franca had secret connections with many fellow researchers in Trier, often organizing private gatherings with them. However, Franca knew that the matters involving the Mirror People wouldn't end there. The special Mirror World still existed, the mystery artifact that Gardner Martin smuggled into Trier remained, and the classic silver mirror in her possession persisted. If these elements weren't eliminated entirely, it would only solve the problem temporarily. Franca couldn't predict when similar anomalies would arise in the future. Franca approached the classic-styled silver mirror, which allowed entry into the special mirror world, with caution and seriousness. She believed it held a secret related to the Demona's pathway. Why are you so quiet? Jenna asked, extending her right hand and waving it in front of Franca. Franca snapped back to reality and let out a sigh. I feel a bit sad upon hearing about their misfortune. It was precisely because she didn't want to face the pain of countless innocence that she followed Lumian's suggestion and handed over the matter to the officials. Jenna bypassed Franca and made her way to the guest room, intending to change into more comfortable attire. It was a bit stuffy, Franca quickly explained. Jenna regarded her with suspicion. Why did you feel the need to explain? Ahem. Franca nearly choked on her own saliva. Thankfully, Jenna didn't dwell on it too much. She entered the guest room and headed towards the washroom, carrying her nightgown and pajamas. Once Lumian returned to Avenue du Marquet, he began his rounds, starting with Unit 126, where Black Scorpion Roger resided. He approached the four mobsters disguised as beggars stationed at different entrances, far from their intended target. Lumian made a promise to each of them, guaranteeing 100 Verl d'Or by Monday. That night, he struggled to find rest in Sal de Ball Breeze. Occasionally, he would wake up, straining his ears for any signs of movement outside the window, hoping to catch the sound of hurried footsteps. At dawn, while enjoying breakfast at the cafe and skimming through a newspaper, Lewis ascended from the first floor and whispered in Lumian's ear, Boss, Superintendent Everett requests your presence at the Valiant Cafe, opposite the police headquarters, for a cup of coffee precisely at 10 a.m. Superintendent Everett wants to meet me, the newly appointed leader of the Savoy mob? Lumian remained relatively composed with the mystery prying glasses in his possession. He asked Lewis, who else will be there? Many, Lewis responded in a hushed tone. They say all the mob leaders from the market district will gather. The official voting begins today. The voting would extend over three days. Is that so? So they won't let us disrupt the national convention election, it seems. I wonder if the Poison Spur mob will attend. Lumian nodded and left Sal de Ball Breeze at 9.15 a.m., making his way back to Aubert's du Coq door. In room 207, he put on the mystery prying glasses, experiencing the disorienting sensation of descending from great heights and burrowing into the ground. Suppressing the urge to retch, Lumian retrieved a mirror and all his cosmetics, busying himself with preparations. He opted for subtle alterations, focusing on thickening his eyebrows, accentuating his cheekbones, and enhancing shadowy areas. The adjustments created an impression that it was indeed Seal and not someone else. As soon as he finished his makeup, Lumian hastily set the mirror aside, unwilling to catch a glimpse of his reflection. Shortly before 10 a.m., he arrived at the Valiant Café and was promptly escorted to a private room by a waiter. Upon entering, he immediately recognized several familiar faces, Baron Brignes, adorned in formal attire with a top hat and pipe, Franca, sporting trousers, red boots, and a blouse, the towering giant Simon, and the merchant-like figure of Blood Palm Black. Seated in an armchair at the head of the table, Travis Everett, 
donning a black uniform, rose with a smile upon seeing Lumian enter. You must be Seal, am I right? Yes, Superintendent Everett, Lumian responded respectfully. Franca, Baron Brignais, and the others, who had risen alongside Travis Everett, exchanged puzzled glances as they observed Lumian. Franca's gaze averted in enlightenment as she recognized the golden black hair. Baron Brignais, Giant Simon, and the rest gradually realized that it was Seal. Adjusting his black-framed glasses, Superintendent Everett's blue eyes gleamed as he half-praised Lumian and patted the recliner beside him. You've only been in the market district for less than three weeks, but you've already taken over Sal de Ball Breeze. And you're so young. You're really outstanding. Sigh, the market district hasn't been peaceful for the past month. He half-praised Lumian and patted a recliner beside him. Come, have a seat here. Let me introduce you to the others. When Lumian stood by Everett's side, the superintendent gestured toward a middle-aged man seated across the coffee table and spoke, Roger, you're acquainted with him, aren't you? Black Scorpion Roger? Lumian directed his gaze at the middle-aged man. Roger, dressed in formal attire with neatly combed black hair, had a slightly chubby face, and his deep blue eyes resembled the vast sea. We're meeting for the first time, Lumian replied with a smile. He noticed a chilling gaze emanating from Black Scorpion. Everett proceeded to introduce the individuals sitting beside Roger. Harmon, Castina. Upon entering the private room, Lumian had noticed only Harmon among the few members of the Savoy mob. The bald man's shining head was so eye-drawing that Lumian almost looked away, fearing that it might reflect his disguised appearance. Upon closer inspection, Lumian recognized Harmon's unique features, a prominent brow, a high-nosed bridge, and deep-set lips. He possessed the allure of a ruggedly handsome individual. Even in a seated position, his imposing height was evident, complementing his dark breeches shirt splendidly. Castina, petite and likely under 1.55 meters tall, appeared to be around 30 years old. She possessed curly auburn hair, brown eyes, a curvaceous figure that turned heads, and full lips. You should be familiar with Seal from the Savoy mob, right? Everett introduced Seal to Roger and the others. Roger flashed a cold smile. Indeed, Superintendent. The impression he made on me will never fade. Baldy Harmon's eyes brimmed with hatred and cruelty. Everett sighed and said, We all reside in the market district. Only by coexisting peacefully can we secure a better future and greater wealth. If any conflicts arise, come to me. I'll mediate and arbitrate. Seal, take this cup of coffee to Roger and hand over Sal de Ball Breeze's profits for the next six months. The issue between Margot and Eight ends here. If anyone troubles you regarding these matters again, feel free to inform me directly. Lumian observed Roger, Harmon, and Castina with a sense of amusement, realizing that their eyes held no mercy, only restrained coldness and malevolence. Baron Brignais and the others remained silent, watching the scene unfold as though it were a spectacle. Franca shook her head at Lumian, signaling him not to act recklessly. Lumian bent down and picked up the cup of coffee from the table. Suddenly, he raised his hands and flung the contents of the cup at Black Scorpion Roger. Reacting swiftly, Roger evaded the liquid, colliding with the coffee table. Harmon and Castina sprang to their feet. Simultaneously, Lumian pointed at Black Scorpion Roger and cursed, Fuck you. Are you disregarding the superintendent's words? Playing dumb, are we? If you don't desire peace, speak up. I, Seal, shall await you at Sal de Ball Breeze. The look in your eyes tells me vengeance is on your mind. How brazen. Franca had not anticipated Lumian's audacity. Chapter 199 Unruly Travis Everett concealed his emotions behind the black-framed glasses, rendering them inscrutable. Nevertheless, he made no attempt to halt Lumian's actions. It was as though he had transformed into a mere observer. Baron Brignais, Blood Palm Black, and the rest were taken aback by Lumian's reaction. 
They couldn't fathom his audacity to splash coffee at Black Scorpion Roger in front of the superintendent and sabotage the mediation. In particular, Baron Brignes felt as though he was encountering his former subordinate, now colleague, for the very first time. Is he far more unruly and reckless than I had anticipated? Does he refuse to accept any grievances and is unwilling to pay any price? Although he attempted to shift the blame onto Black Scorpion Roger and the others, it was evident to anyone with a modicum of sense and perception that Lumian was the instigator of the conflict, driven by a strong will of his own. Clearly, he had no intention of reconciliation. He sought only an excuse to undermine Superintendent Everett's proposal. Is this not a blatant slap in Superintendent Everett's face? The superintendent wielded considerable influence in the market district. A slight embellishment in reporting to higher authorities, or rather, stating the unvarnished truth, would draw the attention of official beyonders and dismantle all our enterprises, including the leaders of the Savoy mob. Incensed, Baldy Harmon denied Lumian the opportunity to shatter the coffee cup on his boss. He lunged forward, stooped down, grasped the coffee table's edge, hoisted it, and flung it at the detestable individual. Cups clattered to the ground, splintering into shards. Lumian deftly evaded the projectiles, swiftly drawing his black revolver from beneath his arm. He trained it on Harmon amid the cacophonous crash of objects and the ensuing chaos. Baldy Harmon chuckled, a product of his extreme rage. You country hog, do you spurn Superintendent Everett's gracious offer of mediation? Very well then, our poison spur mob shall entertain you until one of us is vanquished from this game. Go ahead, fire away. Your audacity and lack of respect towards Superintendent Everett know no bounds. If you possess such ability, then pull the trigger. Were it not for the impending election and the stringent surveillance imposed by officials, the poison spur mob would have long seized an opportunity to assassinate Seal. In that instant, Black Scorpion Roger rose once more. Black flames materialized within his clenched fists, only to dissipate swiftly. He was reluctant to unveil his beyonder powers in the presence of Superintendent Everett. Short-legged candlestick Castina also fixed her gaze on Lumian, poised to strike if he refused to relent. Upon hearing Baldy Harmon's retort and provocation, Lumian chuckled. Bang! Lumian squeezed the trigger, unleashing a yellow bullet hurtling directly towards Baldy Harmon's skull. His reflexes barely saved him. Harmon crouched down just in time, his eyes widening in alarm. The bullet grazed his glistening scalp and careened off, ricocheting into the adjacent washroom with a metallic clang. In an instant, all the mob leaders sprang to their feet. Black Scorpion Roger and short-legged candlestick Castina fixated on Lumian, preparing to retaliate. Undeterred, Lumian remained resolute. He lowered his gun and aimed it once more at Baldy Harmon, his gaze devoid of any emotion. Enough! At that very moment, Superintendent Everett, who had been calmly seated, spoke up. The indescribable authority emanating from him, combined with his esteemed position, compelled Lumian to instinctively halt his finger from pulling the trigger. Seizing the opportunity, Baldy Harmon shifted his position and rose to his feet. Though the others maintained their combative stance, the palpable tension that had lingered dissipated. Lamenting his missed chance, Lumian reluctantly holstered his revolver and turned to face Everett. Superintendent, I am willing to comply with your request, but they don't seem inclined to do so. Everett's eyes flickered behind his black-framed spectacles. Standing up, he surveyed the room. We will address your conflict after the election. For the next three days, I expect all of you to conduct yourselves properly. Fail to do so, and you shall make an enemy out of me. Trust me, that's a predicament you won't be able to handle. Although Everett's voice carried depth, his tone remained calm, devoid of anger or arrogance. Instead, a hint of sincerity permeated his words. Yet, those who had resided in the market district for more than two years recalled a term, the valiant mob. Two years prior, the valiant mob held a similar status to the Savoy mob in the market district. However, due to their repeated defiance and disrespect towards Superintendent Everett, they were ruthlessly eradicated in a joint operation conducted by the authorities. 
the subsequent rise of the Poison Spur mob was partly due to the power vacuum left behind in the district's underworld. Now, only the Valiant Café stood as a testament to the existence of such a mob. The leaders of the Savoy mob, the Poison Spur mob, and the other two medium-sized gangs fell into silence for a few seconds before responding to Superintendent Everett's words. They expressed their commitment to restrain their subordinates and ensure that the election proceeded without disruption. Superintendent Everett's gaze swept across their faces. Without uttering another word, he strode towards the exit of the private room. As he disappeared beyond the door, Black Scorpion Roger, Baldy Harmon, and short-legged candlestick Castina cast Lumian cold glances before departing from the café. The remaining gang leaders didn't linger, leaving only the Savoy mob in the confines of the private room. Baron Brignais took a leisurely puff from his pipe and addressed Lumian, you acted too impulsively back there. Lumian offered a faint smile in response and replied, I have been awaiting an opportunity like that. Unfortunately, I couldn't seize it to incite the conflict. Observing the puzzled expressions on the faces of Giant Simon, Blood Palm Black, and the others, Lumian calmly elaborated, We have already made two attempts, and the Poison Spur mob chose to endure. Baron, as you have rightly pointed out, they harbor a significant problem, and they await their chance. I believe that opportunity will present itself soon. If we fail to incapacitate the Poison Spur mob before then, we shall face their unhinged retaliation. And when that moment arrives, none of you will be able to escape. Just a moment ago, there were only three members of the Poison Spur mob present, while we numbered five. Red Boots, your strength is comparable to that of Black Scorpion. With my assistance, you can surely overpower him. Baron, Simon, Black, is it conceivable that you cannot handle Baldy and Short-Legged Candlestick? One of you might even be able to impede Superintendent Everett. As long as the Poison Spur mob dares to strike back, we shall eliminate them all right here. Rat Cristo had received instructions from Superintendent Everett the previous night that he was not to be invited today. Baron Brignais, Blood Palm Black, and their comrades found Seal's words reasonable, yet a deep-seated fear for this individual arose within their hearts. He wasn't bluffing. He genuinely desired to eliminate Baldy Harmon and the others. He was too crazy and extreme. He possessed the audacity to commit any act without hesitation. But this is tantamount to slapping Superintendent Everett in the face. The repercussions will be exceedingly troublesome. Blood Palm Black shook his head. Franca shared the same concern. She wished to caution Lumian that such a course of action would render him unwelcome in the market district. He might even end up with another wanted poster. However, recognizing that the other leaders were present and unable to reveal her true friendship with Lumian, Franca sealed her lips. A quizzical smile played on Lumian's lips as he inquired, wasn't Superintendent Everett killed by the Poison Spur mob? Lunatic. This notion raced through everyone's minds. Baron Brignais, gently stroking his mahogany-colored pipe, chimed in, it's nearly impossible to conceal that from official beyonders. It's merely an excuse. In that case, let it go. Blame everything on a lunatic like me. At worst, I'll depart from the market district. I trust the boss will arrange another task for me once this storm blows over, Lumian calmly remarked, a serene smile gracing his face. This was indeed a fragment of his genuine thoughts. Mr. K's mission revolved around earning Gardner Martin's trust not running Sal de Ball Breeze or establishing a foothold in the market district. If his provocation had genuinely enraged Black Scorpion Roger and his accomplices, Lumian believed that Franca would surely come to his aid. With one of the Savoy mob's leaders on his side, the others wouldn't hesitate to act. When the time came, united in strength, they stood a high chance of eliminating the remaining three leaders of the Poison Spur mob. Once he unraveled the Poison Spur mob's scheme, Gardner Martin would undoubtedly appreciate Lumian's daring and unorthodox approach in eradicating hidden threats. Even if he lost Sal de Ball Breeze and was compelled to escape once more, he would merely find sanctuary elsewhere in Trier and continue serving Gardner Martin until he gained his complete approval. Furthermore, it was advantageous for Lumian. If the Poison Spur mob finalized their preparations, 
he would be their primary target for revenge. Failing to address the issue beforehand would only heighten the danger he faced. In the future, even if Madame Moon birthed another group, Lumian wouldn't fret. Today, Louis Lund would likely be present in the market district. By temporarily suppressing the deaths of Black Scorpion Roger and his cronies, creating a facade of tranquility, Lumian could patiently await his target at 126, Avenue du Marquet. These individuals weren't parliamentary candidates whose demise would incite an uproar. After a few moments of silence, Baron Brignes approached the door and issued a reminder, Superintendent Everett has probably marked you. There will be considerable trouble after the election. Lumian responded with a smile, perhaps he will mysteriously vanish one day. Having said that, Lumian calmly endured the mildly apprehensive gazes of Giant Simon and his comrades. You see, having laid the groundwork, anything I utter now will convince them all. At 3.15 p.m., Lumian arrived at Cartier du Jardin Botanique in a public carriage. Once again, he beheld Mason Café, housed in a beige four-story building adorned with lush green plants entwined on its outer walls. Passing through a sheltered walkway upheld by pillars, he entered the interior, enveloped by dark green walls and expansive windows. Settling into the familiar booth D, he removed his wide-brimmed brown hat. A cup of Entis coffee, he instructed the waitress and patiently waited. Chapter 200, Spectator The titular coffee was rich and aromatic, a perfect match for the creamy cupcake. Though Lumian's focus was elsewhere, he still appreciated their beauty. The moment the clock struck 3.30 p.m., a familiar soft female voice reached him from the booth behind. Good afternoon, Mr. Lumian Lee. Good afternoon, Madam Susie, Lumian responded, concealing his surprise. While Lumian didn't intentionally observe the customers entering Mason Café, his hunter instincts allowed him to maintain awareness of his surroundings. When he had arrived at the café at 3.18 p.m., Cabin D had been deserted. No one entered from 3.15 to 3.30 p.m. And yet, here was Madame Susie, appearing silently behind him, in the very spot behind Booth D. How mystical and bizarre was this? Susie's voice gently inquired once more, how did you feel after your last treatment? Lumian didn't hold back and responded simply, I felt much better than before. At least I could release my emotions. That's a good thing. Suppressing your feelings and bottling up your emotions will only exacerbate your mental problems and lead you down a self-destructive path until your innate will to live is completely overwhelmed, Susie commented in a calm and soothing tone, confirming Lumian's transformation. A hint of a smile laced her words. Let's have a conversation first. We'll discuss all the things you've encountered in the past two weeks. Feel free to choose what you believe you can and are willing to share. Lumian knew he needed to calm himself and undergo further psychiatric treatment as a foundation for unlocking more memories later. Hence, he offered no resistance. He chuckled wryly and said, There's nothing I can't tell you. I've even shared that dream with you. Everything else can only be classified as minor secrets. He paused for a moment and began with Charlie. There's an unlucky and dim-witted fellow at the motel I'm staying at. Lumian casually recounted the events of the past two weeks. Gradually, his mind relaxed, as if he had returned to a time before Cordu's destruction. Aurora, who rarely ventured outside, would hear about everything that transpired in Cordu from him. He delighted in sharing it with his sister, even boasting about the successful pranks he had orchestrated. As time trickled away, Lumian's rigid posture softened as he sank into the plush sofa. He refrained from delving into further details. Time was limited, and he couldn't afford to waste it. He didn't touch upon the curly-haired baboon's research society, Franca's true gender, or his suspicions regarding her motives for joining the Savoy mob. He merely mentioned his encounter with a pen pal of Aurora's, a sequence seven witch of the Demonis pathway, who happened to be in the same mob. Likewise, he provided only a brief mention of performing a ritual and receiving an additional boon, without going into the specifics. After recounting his experiences from the past two weeks, Lumian spoke in a self-deprecating tone, 
I can't help but wonder if it's my own fault for stumbling upon so many Beyonder events in such a short span of time. Sometimes, I question why every human and dog in Trier seems to possess Beyonder powers. For once, Susie didn't respond immediately. After a few moments, she smiled and replied, I can perceive that your mental state has indeed improved compared to before. How can you tell? Lumian didn't mention the details of his tearful carriage ride upon seeing Aurora's obituary. He didn't believe that describing all of that was an accurate reflection of his mental state. Susie spoke in a gentle tone, I can sense that you're reconstructing your social connections and beginning to form friendships. Friends? Lumian asked, slightly amused. Charlie, Jenna, Franca? Can they truly be called friends? They are mere acquaintances. Susie responded with a smile, friendship comes in various forms. Not all require deep connections. You simply need to ask yourself, when they face challenges that lie within your capabilities to solve, would you be willing to offer assistance? That will reveal if they can be considered your friends. It depends on the specific circumstances and the price I must pay. I'm not the type to go out of my way to help just anyone, Lumian muttered. Susie didn't press further and explained, for someone prone to self-destruction, a sign of their emergence from the quagmire is their willingness to forge new social bonds. Emperor Roselle, assuming he truly said it, once remarked that humans are the sum of their social relationships. When you no longer resist forming new connections, it signifies that you're no longer opposed to your own future. Of course, this is just one aspect. It's not everything. Lumian fell silent for a moment before speaking again, Madam Susie, there's something I'd like to ask you. I mentioned a series of coincidences that have befallen me. Are they truly as Madam Magician suggested? Could they be partially influenced by mid-sequence beyonders of the spectator pathway? In contrast to the previous session, Susie appeared more at ease. She chuckled and remarked, are you attempting to divert the topic? Are you still resistant to such matters? Actually, one can discern it from certain details. You took the initiative to request the Red Boots Lady to enlighten you on mystical matters whenever she was available, but you never followed through. The sole visit you made was on the pretext of her repaying a favor. It suggests that you remain unwilling to establish a closer bond with her. That's natural. How can a patient recover after just one treatment? You need not burden yourself. Susie tirelessly voiced her observations, gently pinpointing some of Lumian's current psychological issues. If it were the last time, I wouldn't have been so forthright. It would have only bred resistance, causing you to close yourself off further. However, now you exhibit certain inclinations toward forging new social connections. This will allow you to gain clearer insights into your true self and facilitate your progress. Having his underlying thoughts laid bare by Susie, Lumian's initial reaction was wariness, vigilance, and denial. Yet, Susie's composed demeanor, non-aggressive analysis, and accurate understanding of the situation gradually eased his tension, enabling him to confront his deep-seated problems. His body and mind gradually settled. Susie refrained from prying further and addressed Lumian's inquiry. Madam Magician's explanation is not entirely incorrect but it lacks specificity. For a mid-sequence beyonder of the spectator pathway to engineer a coincidence, they must employ face-to-face -face psychological cues or hypnosis. In other words, they need to be present around you, Baron Brignes, and his associates. The reason you didn't notice it and Baron Brignes remained oblivious is that mid-sequence beyonders of the spectator pathway possess an additional beyonder power, psychological invisibility. Psychological invisibility? How does it differ from regular invisibility? Lumian inquired, perplexed. Susie calmly elucidated, psychological invisibility is not true invisibility. It merely prevents you from perceiving me, even when I am standing right before you and numerous others have already witnessed my presence. Sounds very magical. Lumian sighed with a sense of wonder. For some inexplicable reason, he felt as though psychiatrists were all around him, yet he remained oblivious to their presence. This won't change even if you employ spirit vision. 
Your intuition for danger will not react until I am prepared to strike, Susie continued. By comparison, a shadow ascetic's concealment within shadows occasionally evokes the sensation of being watched by the darkness. Lumi impressed, which pathway does shadow ascetic belong to? Secret suppliant, Susie replied simply. Secret suppliant pathway? Above listener and below shepherd, there's a sequence known as shadow ascetic? This belongs to Mr. K's pathway. Occasionally, I sense someone observing me in the surrounding darkness because of him or his subordinates. Combining this with Aurora's grimoires and Madame Magician's clues, Lumian felt a wave of enlightenment. For the secret suppliant pathway, Aurora had only noted down sequence 9 secret suppliant and sequence 8 listener. Madame Magician appears to write a substantial amount, but it's actually just an outline without much detail. It's not as comprehensive as Madame Susie's explanation. Lumian mumbled curiously and asked, Aren't you concerned that revealing your pathways beyond her powers to me might harm you? Susie brushed off the question and continued, If you're a high sequence beyonder of the spectator pathway, there's no need for such elaborate measures. Even if they're far away from you, they can subtly influence you, causing you to unknowingly follow their arrangements and create various coincidences. Though I too am a spectator, I must still caution you, beware of the spectator. High sequence beyonder. Lumian was alarmed. So, you arranged for the paperboy to deliver an outdated newspaper to me? Madame Susie is a high sequence beyonder, a true demigod? It wasn't me, Susie said, feeling a tad embarrassed. It was my companion. Companion? Lumian recalled Madame Magician's initial suggestion and guessed, the other psychiatrist? He was here last time too. Yes, Susie candidly admitted. Your condition is more serious, and I wasn't too confident, so I invited her along to assist me. Yes, as a precautionary measure. In fact, she's here today as well. She's sitting across from you. Across from me? Lumian glanced in surprise at the empty seat across the coffee table. Not only was there no one present, but there wasn't even an indentation from someone sitting there. In the next instant, he heard a gentle female voice with a hint of a smile and a slightly brisk tone. Hello, 